defied any other possible explanation except that a black hole must be somehow involved. How do you see a black hole? You don't. How do you see the existence of a black hole? You see material around the outside responding to that intense gravitational field in the proximity of a black hole. And that stuff, by the way, is doomed. It's, it's on infall. It's falling into the black hole. So you don't see the black hole itself. You see the results of the black hole. That so when it when it when it falls into the black hole, then really essentially what's happening is all its particles are crushed as well yeah. into that mass. Is that yes. correct? Yes. A black hole is effectively a one-way cul-de-sac. You drive in, you can't get out. <laughs> <laughs> and the gravitational field in the immediate vicinity of the edge of the black hole, which is known as an event horizon, that gravitational field is so strong that even light can't escape it. If light's sitting right on the edge, it'll simply go around in circles around that black hole forever. If light gets any closer to the black hole, it falls in past the event horizon. And quite frankly, nobody has a flaming idea what happens to it then. Not the energy, not the mass, not anything, because quite simply our physics breaks down and we can't get any information to come out of that event horizon. So there's no possibility of making a measurement. So. In some ways, as opposed to a spectator of a horror film, you may find yourself in the middle of it, even after you leave the theater. And, you know, there's yeah, lots of talk in um, this notion of um, locus of control. Right. And um, individuals who, who have uh, externalized their locus of control, they're often in a horror movie. There are right. all these ways in which we are, um, we, um, we are, that if, when people enter therapy, what often happens is they begin to... Uh, modulate the things they feel, they begin to uh, experience a, an extended uh, locus of control, that euthymic window broadens. These are all things that can happen that you right. can work towards. Right? But, but yeah, and I was thinking, you know, we mentioned the family members and somebody who would, would never see these horror movies. Uh, they're restricting themselves in a certain way mm -hmm. uh, because of that. But also, it, it, on a conscious level, it's like... Um, I don't want to be exposed to that. It's too real. Mm -hmm. In other words, they sort of label it as mm -hmm. this movie. And I've said that to uh, my wife on a number of occasions. These actors are getting paid a lot of money to have mm -hmm. their hands cut off or mm -hmm. whatever that might be. Well, what uh, do we think special about this effects, song? it's not real. And I'm not sure that everybody, I think people are kind of like at the surface level of thinking that. It, it hits them in that way, so even though they well, know Well, why different. do you think that would be then? So because, for instance, in your case, <clears throat> you can navigate these sort of um, stage traumas in a horror film by saying, well, this is good special effects. You can, you mm -hmm. can allow yourself a, a capacity to be both participant and observer in, in the film, and you can generate enough observer self-reflective status to be able to say, okay, right now, let me remind myself, this is just, you know, and the special effects are great. Some people can't. Getting better. What now? They're getting better. They're getting better, better yeah. I mean, it looks like, that's yeah, right. it would convince some people that it's real. Come out of a long context, way since know, Plan bit, 9 yeah. from Outer Space. But, uh, <laughs> so, um, but others don't seem to have that capacity. Well, what do you think right. about that? Why, why, why would... Uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm almost thinking that it's some defense mechanism where um, we are resistant to exposing ourselves to it, mm -hmm. that, that at some level we're telling ourselves we can't quite manage that or we don't want to manage it, uh, and therefore it's a protective mechanism mm -hmm. that we kind of keep ourselves away from that because of what uh, what it might turn up in us mm -hmm. and maybe a little afraid of, of, of that. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But, yeah, I think you're right about the exposure of it. Mm -hmm. The more you're kind of exposed and you see it, the, the greater... Uh, capacity you have to manage it. Well, I wonder where that capacity, and, and there, there probably is some research on this in terms of um, <clears throat> is there a certain character structure that respond to um, horror movies a certain way? Uh, maybe even right. attachment styles. Right. Are there, right. um, is there something about um, the ways in which we organize our, our inner selves or the maps we have for the world right. that may, that may, uh, that, um, may s tell us something about how we're able to watch or not watch a horror movie, right? Right. Like I wonder. I mean, on a, just on a simple level, it's it's um, 
you know, this is going to connect with some trauma that the person has, and they mm-hmm. are trying it by all means to avoid going back mm-hmm. and looking at that. When we know in therapy, that's exactly where we need to go mm-hmm. to sort of work through that mm-hmm. issue, whatever that trauma might be, and and come the, out on the other that side. That idea of, it, yeah. of, of the edge, uh, that growth edge. Yes. To be able to come to a place where someone is, is just at a spot where they're experiencing just enough anxiety to help them to be able to regulate that, to modulate it, or to, to modulate it, hopefully, and to be able to get them through modulation, to be able to move a little further through it. Right, right. Um, you know, I don't think too many people, I've had people come into therapy and say, you know, they're, they're afraid of flying, or right. they have some specific phobias. I haven't had anyone come in and say they have a fear of, they want to be able to overcome their horror movie fear, but, um, you know, I, uh, well, it, you know, it might be diagnostic to just ask them about uh, horror movies. How, how many horror movies have you seen? I never go to horror movies or whatever. Yeah, they might, yeah, might respond to that. A, it, might, yeah. it might be kind of fun as a research project, perhaps. But, but what about, that. The, you could have the opposite problem. Like, um, what about someone who is, um, who is drawn to horror movies, you know, like um, um, individuals who, who, who are within the psychopathic realm, they often have to um, chase uh, louder and more intense experiences because that's what they need to feel some sense of life. Right. Um, there right. are individuals whose relationship to the abject may be such that as opposed to some sort of healthy disownership, they are somehow immersed in it. That um, The serial killer that may um, want to um, find themselves awash in their victim's viscera right? This is the opposite of the sort of disowning and dance with the abject that we might expect in a, quote, healthy person. Right. So we could say that, you know, maybe uh, maybe there's a connection between too much consumption or that uh, of, a horror mo- of horror movies that may say something, too. Right, you know? right. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. It <clears throat> may be almost like a tolerance level that you have to get another fix from mm-hmm. the substance abuse literature that the tolerance level is sort mm-hmm. of continues to bump up and you have to have more and more mm-hmm. uh, to satiate that, that kind of thing. Well, that's interesting. So I, 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 my, my question back to you about this, and I appreciate all the, uh, that was very insightful uh, discussion, but, but uh, you, um, I, I'm guessing that you have a hard time enjoying this horror movie that you're going to see uh, because you're, well, uh, you're running it through that psychoanalytic filter and you're watching out for these kind of things that we just <laughs> talked about. And I'm a little concerned that, wait, what about the entertainment value for you? Can you just say, wow. Well, you, really here's the thing, this is why I think that there is the, you want to be able to balance the um, participer, participant observer element. So, um, and what that means is you are both present but also have the capacity for self-reflection and experiences. And your capacity for flexibility with that is important. If, if um, like we mentioned the Tarantino last week, sure. it's usually only afterwards that I begin to think about it. If right. it's a really good film, it creates a holding space yes, where I become it draws you in. right. Yeah, yeah. And so yeah. one of the benefits of that film we talked about it last time is you felt sort of sad because you were leaving. Like, right. It created enough of an atmosphere, like you were there, and it was a place you wanted to be. And, you know, so in a way, if the movie's effective, uh, and that's, that's that old aesthetic notion of form versus content, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The, if somebody creates the right sort of form, then I think your, your ego can be suspended and you can have a regression. You can find yourself, a, a, it's sometimes talked about in the psychological literature as a temporary form of psychosis that you allow your right. boundaries to be diffuse and move into it. So... Yeah. Part of the reason why I was excited about the movie, and the movie I'm going to see is Midsummer, right? Midsummer, something like that. Yes. Okay. There you go. Part of what what drew me to it is is it it's this is a director who's known for being quite good. Okay. This is I think his second film. I think Heredity is his first, which I didn't see. I um, really like to. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut in, but I just I, the, the idea of being a good director and what does that mean? Mm-hmm. I'd love to explore that yeah, some more. Yeah. We get to talk about that maybe at another point. But yeah. uh, what what goes into making that? Is yeah. it the editing? Is it the way I, the shot was was done? Yeah. I, I think. And think uh, about that's how important idea. some of that might be taught, sort of a little like becoming a good therapist. But other has other, but a chunk of it also has to be earned, maybe you're even born with. Because, you know, if this guy, and I may be, this guy may be a lousy director, it's going to be a 
eight hour movie, so it better be good. <laughs> but, no, but but I think it is about three hours, so get yeah, ready it for is. that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my god. And, and my, my wife, who is a rule, tends to avoid horror movies just like yours. Right. She decided she wanted to see this, so we're gonna I may only get to see thirty minutes of it. Okay. But, she <laughs> bolt out uh I may, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna be checking on her. So uh, but <laughs> if if they can part of what drew me to this is this is an individual who has a reputation for creating that space and Probably what needs to happen in a good horror movie, maybe we could talk about this uh, at another time too, is mm -hmm. is that if you think about like the movie Aliens, for instance, it wasn't right. just constant things busting out of someone's chest. Oh, no, no. They created an atmosphere. It was the lead up to it. Right. And, and uh, that, you know, down that hallway yeah. and the sounds and what's going to happen next. It's like almost uh, a scene in all of those, uh, some of the horror movies, quite a few, is that long shot down the hallway mm -hmm. where there's a door at the end. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're getting closer and closer mm -hmm. to finding out what's behind that door. And there's, so. you see, there's, there's music, there's sound. Yes. You really create a space that you are you that you can exist in. So I think that in some ways it's certainly up to me to be able to approach it with the possibility of that ego diffusion. But right. I'm also gonna require a really good horror film, you know, creates a, a space. And you know, e even a really a cheesy horror film creates a space because it sure. gives you that feeling of, you know, staying up late at night watching horror movies when you were a kid or it, it offers yeah. a different sort of regression, and maybe right, right. another thing to talk about sometimes is the different forms of horror. Because you know, there's 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 body horror films. There's they're all different kinds, and they all scratch different itch itches. And um, this, I think, and again, I, I've avoided too much information on it because I wanted to be able to approach it with a sure. But I think it is sort of a slow burner, and it's um, you know, it's um. Right. It's supposed to create sort of this paranoid you. atmosphere. And, right. Uh, if you think about like Rosemary's Baby or um, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, you know the different horror films that right. that part of the form that you uh, you are uh, walking around in is one of, you know, one of paranoia, one of uh, right. you know, a little bit little edge of fear <laughs> there that you're moving to something and not really sure. of ideas that lead into the weird world of quantum computing okay. which by the way is a pioneer field we're not there yet yeah. right we, we don't have effective quantum computers but the imagination can become i can store data i can access it instantly and i can store infinite quantities of that data and that may be the next big technological revolution right that generates all the new jobs and and things we can't even imagine correct yet. Correct. Now, I don't want to shortchange quantum mechanical research that's going on in a variety of other fields, like just, just uh, material science. We, we, we understand materials that we can build all kinds of new custom uh, ceramics or, or you know, paints or you know, maybe uh, a film that is uh, photovoltaic in nature where you could actually paint your house and your whole house becomes a solar collector. All of those things boil down to what's happening at the subatomic level which we understand by quantum mechanics. So those are everyday applications of quantum mechanics that take place all the time. We just don't really think of those. But, but what seems more, I don't know, glamorous, sexy, it's at least filling up the internet right now, is this whole notion of quantum computing, which it, it's because of the, the astounding, almost infinite capability of data storage and rapid transfer of information that, w that we see that as, a, as a, a pioneering area, which is just a frontier that we really want to go explore more. And so that is something that's taking place at the, at the boundary of computer science and quantum physics. So so really when you're talking about actually applying quantum principles in in materials, mm -hmm. in material use, uh, not necessarily computing use, it still has some of those same communications ramifications. Yeah. So theoretically you could have smart paint, you could have Terminator style uh, bots, you, all kinds of things might could exist uh, that that is right now just the realm of science fiction, right? That's or am right. I am no. I too far off base? Well, I mean, look, I mean, any everything that we manufacture is built of materials, 
All materials at their atomic level behave according to the rules of quantum mechanics. So the more that we come up with designer materials that never existed on Earth before, somewhere there's, there's a quantum physicist figuring out the quantum mechanics that leads to the chemistry involved with developing those new custom materials. So, so the, the, the border of chemistry and physics is really material science. And so, so, so you, find, you find application at these crossover points, right? You have these physicists doing fundamental research on quantum mechanics. You have these chemists trying to invent new kinds of materials. They find their, themselves at a junction where they're trying to understand the same principles. They begin to collaborate, and that's what moves that forward. In another place, you have the junction between computer science and quantum physics where computer science is trying to solve these problems about data storage and data transfer and, and all these kinds of making things faster, more smaller, all those kinds of things. And you have uh, quantum physicists trying to understand the nature of matter at the smallest scale. And they find a junction point and suddenly quantum computing is born, right? So, so a lot of times when we come up with new, uh, new inventions, new ideas, new frontiers in what we think of as science and technology, you're seeing these intersections between multiple disciplines where you know, you know there's there's even intersections between you know, say education and physics or between you know a variety of other things I mean, you know psychology understanding the human mind and understanding how particles work that make up our brains right it's, so it's interesting you're going there because I, I as you're talking I was thinking back to the idea of human behavior mm -hmm. and human communication and how we evolve and and what ultimately might happen, how people might communicate. Some of the things that seem far out, new aging, may not be so far out, new aging, when we realize that really what, what's happening in the brain is, is uh, chemical interactions and electrical impulses and across synapses. kinds of ideas that lead into the weird world of quantum computing, okay. which by the way is a pioneer field. We're not there yet, yeah. right? We, we don't have effective quantum computers, but the imagination can become, I can store data, I can access it instantly, and I can store infinite quantities of that data. And that may be the next big technological revolution, right? That generates all the new jobs and, and things we can't even imagine. Correct. Yet. Correct. Now, I don't want to shortchange quantum mechanical research that's going on in a variety of other fields, like just, just uh, material science. We, we, we understand materials that we can build all kinds of new custom uh, ceramics or, or you know, paints or you know, maybe uh, a film that is uh, photovoltaic in nature where you could actually paint your house and your whole house becomes a solar collector. All of those things boil down to what's happening at the subatomic level which we understand by quantum mechanics. So those are everyday applications of quantum mechanics that take place all the time. We just don't really think of those. But but what seems more, I don't know, glamorous, sexy, it's at least filling up the internet right now, is this whole notion of quantum computing, which it, it's because of the, the astounding, almost infinite capability of data storage and rapid transfer of information that, that we see that as, a, as a, a pioneering area, which is just, a frontier that we really want to go explore more. And so that is something that's taking place at the, at the boundary of computer science and quantum physics. So so really when you're talking about actually applying quantum principles in in materials, mm -hmm. in material use, uh, not necessarily computing use, it still has some of those same communications ramifications. Yeah. So theoretically you could have smart paint, you could have Terminator style uh, bots, you, all kinds of things might could exist uh, that that is right now just the realm of science fiction, right? That's or am right. I am no. I too far off base? Well, I mean, look, I mean, any everything that we manufacture is built of materials. Mm -hmm. All materials at their atomic level behave according to the rules of quantum mechanics. So the more that we come up with designer materials that never existed on Earth before, somewhere. There's, there's a quantum physicist figuring out the quantum mechanics that leads to the chemistry involved with developing those new custom materials. 
So, so the, the, the border of chemistry and physics is really material science. And so, so, so you, find, you find application at these crossover points, right? You have these physicists doing fundamental research on quantum mechanics. You have these chemists trying to invent new kinds of materials. They find their, themselves at a junction where they're trying to understand the same principles. They begin to collaborate, and that's what moves that forward. In another place, you have the junction between computer science and quantum physics, where computer science is trying to solve these problems about data storage and data transfer and, and all these kinds of making things faster, more smaller, all those kinds of things. And you have uh, quantum physicists un trying to understand the nature of matter at the smallest scale. And they find a junction point and suddenly quantum computing is born, right? So, so a lot of times when we come up with new uh, new inventions, new ideas, new frontiers in what we think of as science and technology, you're seeing these intersections between multiple disciplines where you know, you know there's, there's even intersections between you know, say education and physics or between you know, a variety of other things. I mean, you know psychology, understanding the human mind and understanding how particles work that make up our brains, right? It's, so it's interesting you're going there because I, I, as you're talking, I was thinking back to the idea of human behavior mm -hmm. and human communication and how we evolve and and what ultimately might happen, how people might communicate. Some of the things that seem far out new agey may not be so far out new agey when we realize that really what what's happening in the brain is is uh, chemical interactions and electrical impulses and across synapses. happens when a black hole consumes a neutron star, which I thought a neutron star was sort of a black hole, you know? Yeah, they're, they're certainly in a related class of objects. And so, so probably the best thing to do, though, is talk about what a star actually is. And then we can talk about these exotic stars, because that's yeah. they're, they're really just exotic forms of a star. So if you think about a star, you think of the sun, it's like, well, I understand the sun. It's a big ball of fire. Well, actually, it's not, right? So the, sun, <laughs> the sun's not on fire. A lot of people have that misconception. Uh, it's not even, it doesn't even have very much oxygen in it at all, and you know that if your clothes catch on fire, you need to stop, drop, and roll, right? That's because you're cutting off the oxygen supply. Well, the sun's not on fire, it's not made out of oxygen. Primarily, the sun is made out of hydrogen and helium. Now, it does have con uh, other fractions of contents in it, like oxygen, but not enough to burn. So, the, the sun is a machine that generates a thermonuclear process in its core. That thermonuclear process, let's, let's divide that word out. Thermo means hot, and nuclear means it refers to nuclear reactions. So there are nuclear reactions taking place at the center of our star that turn hydrogen into helium by this process called nucleosynthesis. You're generating energy by taking two hydrogen atoms, shoving them together in a, in a manner where they stick together at a nuclear level and become a helium nucleus, you actually lose a little bit of mass in that process, which is really unusual. But where does that mass go? Well, it goes into Einstein's other equation called E equals MC squared, one of his favorite poems, of mine at least. That's my favorite Einstein sonnet. The sonnet or the haiku, I'm not really sure. Anyway, E equals MC squared. So, so E means energy, M is mass, and C is the speed of light, which we know is a big number. Then you square that really big number, right? So if there's a little tiny bit of mass that disappears, when you take two hydrogens, collapse them together into one helium nucleus, where does that energy go? I'm sorry, where does that mass go? It goes into that Einsteinian equation as the m. It gets multiplied by the speed of light squared, which is a truly large number. And then what do you get out the other side on the other side of the equal sign? Well, you get a little respectable burst of energy. A little puff of energy comes out the other side, right? So mass is actually lost as it's converted into energy. That's why it doesn't violate the conservation of principle of, uh, of conservation of mass or conservation of energy. It's just shifting from one form right. to the other. Right. Well, here's the thing: the sun, uh, it, the sun converts more than four million tons of mass to energy per second. Four million tons goes into the m side of that equation 
then gets multiplied by the speed of light squared, which the speed of light is a ridiculously large number, then you square it and you get an even bigger number. What comes out the other side of that equation? More energy than human beings have ever created in their entire existence, including all of the power plants, nuclear weapons, any kind of power source you can imagine ever generated by humanity. The sun generates far more than that in simply one second of that thermonuclear fusion process. So, okay, well, now you've generated all kinds of heat and energy. It sounds like an explosion. That should just rip this star apart. Well, it doesn't because the sun is also extraordinarily massive. And so the mass of the sun is trying to, it, through its gravitational force, trying to squeeze that gas down into, into a single point. But yet these explosions in the core are trying to blow the star apart. So you have this, so what, what, what a star is, you have this situation where it's a balance of pressure trying to rip the star apart from the inside out, gravity trying to crush the star down into a singularity, and neither force winning. It sits there as a balance, and it does it for billions of years. So a star itself is an amazing machine. It's just on this cusp of a balance between gravity trying to squish it out of existence, pressure trying to blow it apart. Okay, so if that's what a star is, what happens when the fuel's all gone in the middle? So if you converted all your hydrogen to helium, or at least most of it, well, a star can get by by converting heavier elements like helium into other things like carbon, and it can convert, you know, as long as the star's big enough, it can convert materials all the way up to iron. And so it can synthesize these new things that we find on the periodic table all the way up to iron. But then once you get to iron, uh, squeezing iron nuclei together into heavier elements does not produce energy. It actually begins to cost energy. And at that point, the star's a goner. So then what happens? Well, then gravity wins because the star can no longer produce heat that can cause the expanding out process. So the crushing in process is going to win. But it still has the mass. It still has the mass, exactly. So that's what causes so, the gravity to push in. So exactly. So all, all that mass is still there. Now, some of that mass has been lost to the universe in the form of radiation, energy streaming out, but mm -hmm. there's, still, there's still plenty of mass there, right? Now you have this star-sized object. And actually, the stars that can get this far are much more massive than the sun. They're, they're more massive than the sun to start with by a factor of eight or something like that. So, so those stars now have nothing restricting their gravity to collapse. And they crush down into smaller and smaller objects with all of that mass, which means the gravitational field around that object gets stronger and stronger and stronger. Because the closer you are to an object, the stronger the gravitational field is. And so, so as this tremendous mass gets into a smaller and smaller shape, or a smaller and smaller size, something has to stop that collapse, right? Well, there are various then laws that we find from the weird world of quantum mechanics that begin to stop this collapse. And the first of those is something called electron degenerate pressure, which from a layman standpoint means you can't, two, you can't take two electrons and shove them together into the same exact place at the same exact time. And so since electrons just won't have it, <laughs> then, that, then that resistive force begins to stop the collapse up to a certain mass level. And so there are many objects that are held in place in check from collapsing called white dwarfs that are stopped by electron degenerate pressure. Okay, that's what's gonna happen to our sun, by the way, someday. It'll, it'll form a white dwarf based on that process. If the star's more massive, though, even that electron degenerate pressure can be overcome. And so it actually will go past that level of quantum mechanics where you really can, you squeeze electrons out of existence entirely so that you can't have electron degenerate pressure anymore. There, in fact, the protons and electrons cease to exist, and the whole thing turns into a soup of neutrons, neutrally charged particles. And you can squeeze those down a lot farther. So now you've gone past this barrier where you even have electrons and protons that normal mass is made out of. You only have a big ball of neutrons, and that thing squeezes down ever smaller, ever smaller, until another force of quantum mechanics called neutron degenerate pressure stops the expansion. And that's basically almost the same thing. You can't take two neutrons that have the same state, same, same position, same time, and shove them into the same location. So it resists that force. 
And that, that object and stopped by neutron degenerate pressure is a neutron star. Now what you have right. is you have something with the mass of, say, four or five suns squished down into a volume about the size of our city, Columbus, Georgia. So you could end up with a white door, but then if it continues to collapse further, you end up with a neutron star. Correct. I see where you're going. I've been taking jazz, so I, you know I can relate to it. It's uh, really very unrewarding for weeks and weeks and weeks, and then suddenly you'll get like an epiphany, you know, and you'll go, "Oh, oh I, I'm hearing that harmony that I before." You, you're looking at the music and you're going, "What? What? What are they doing?" You know that kind yeah. of thing. You know. Well, I don't I don't read music and I can't appreciate it on that level, but I can like. Like what always struck me, and I, I started listening to jazz with free jazz because it it connected with the punk and the noise and the mm -hmm. death metal stuff that I was mm -hmm. listening to. And um, yeah, you were into some um, atonal like cage and, yeah, and like, some of those. I you know, like take a bunch stuff. of pots and pans and roll them down the stairs. I uh, I'm still I'm still a fan. <laughs> but, 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 but what struck Love me is is it's it is so completely imminent and immersive. Like you can drop into a good jazz tune. Anywhere you want, it's never the same song. Like I can't, like I can listen to one of those, particularly when he had his classic quartet, I can listen to that same song a hundred times. It's never the same song. Yeah. Because I'm listening to Garrison or I'm listening to Jones. Right. Right. And as I get older, it makes more sense to me. Right. Like suddenly I'm like, you know, I was I was too young, but now I'm getting it, you know. Now I got the, the feel. Wow, yeah. And it's interesting because part of the parallel with, not that I'm by any means, but... Coltrane was was obsessed with a character named Doc Savage, and Doc Savage was a pulp hero from the right. 30s and 40s, right. 50s, up until the late 50s, and then he stopped. And uh, I was a kid, I, I was obsessed with, with Doc Savage, and Doc Savage would get up every morning at four in the morning, oh. and he would uh, exercise, and he would read, and he would do two hours of body and mind training every morning. And Coltrane did the same thing. And I did the same thing, literally. Right. That's one of the. That's what started me this whole thing. I remember as a kid. Okay, I got to do. I got to whatever. And this obsessive in, um, focus on learning a skill and all that sort of stuff. Like you know, like you guys were talking about, like how you you know, just sort of wandered into college and mm -hmm. all that sort of stuff. True. And my experience from birth in the womb is being an obsessive neurotic bastard. There was always. I've got to get the best to be the best at this. I have to be able to learn this. I have to be, it's like not like you were talking about playing ping pong. You know, I think I may have played three ping pong games in my life. Right. <laughs> and if I played ping pong. But if it was on block, And if yes. I played ping there pong, I would play 750 hours a week of ping pong until I could be. Until you could be really great that, at it. That's all I could do. Like I, when I started playing disc golf, like literally there's a towel in my office and I practice every day for hours on my form. That's what I do. <laughs> that's what I so I can get, you know, okay, I got to be able to throw 400 feet. Got to be able, to, okay, I got 400 feet. I got to be able to do this. So literally, so when you talk about this stuff, I am crazy. Well, well you're just not uh, part right. of the slacker culture. Well, yeah, I think it's yeah, a form. Right. I think it's a form of slacker because it keeps me away from maybe some other things. You know? Yeah. There, there's, there's a, uh, there's a yeah. thing there you that got you the know, depth. It's <laughs> the breath. Of yeah, it's, no, yeah, it's like, right. you know, my wife will be like, what is it? Well, the first time we hung out, and my, my wife regrets saying this, she'll, she'll try to take it back. But when she meant she goes, you know, I wish you drank. Because, you know, we could just be sitting here enjoying this, but I can tell. Like, we were at, uh, we were at, uh, we go. we were at uh, Jarfly. She's sitting there, and she's got a drink, and she's just hanging out. And she goes, you look so intense. And I'm like, yeah, because I'm, you know, I'm, I've been reading up on this, some, some existential constructs, and I'm thinking about how to be able, you know, like she said, but she's having a drink. She's like, dial it back, bro. And yeah, I'm, yeah. Like, I'm like, yeah. The game's on, the music's playing, whatever <laughs> it is. It's like, I'm yeah. like, wow, yeah. like, Even like when somebody posted on, uh, I'm a huge fan of this band called Wire. They're one of the first art punk bands from the 70s, and I'm obsessed with them, like everything. So somebody posted online three weeks ago their favorite post-2000 Wire songs because they reformed and they've been... And so for the last three weeks, I've been rehearsing in my mind with those 10, and I keep going over, and I can't be that one. 
So I go home, and if I have any time like this more, when I go home at some point today, I'm going to okay. listen to a couple of hours of Wire. I'm going to go through there. You know, that's a good one, but I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but in a couple of weeks, I'm going to have my list. <laughs> All right, so one of the things I know about that type of issue mm -hmm. is uh, there's no end. <laughs> there, there's, there's actually yes. no goal that you reach and go, aha, whew, man, made it. No, it's the next thing that starts before the last one ends, so it's an ongoing <laughs> chain, and I'm just, you know, I'm just adding that thought to the conversation. Oh, I, I, I have a friend of mine. We went to school together, and she's a psychologist, too. And uh, she would say, I walk into a bookstore and I feel so overwhelmed that I'll never read those books. Right. And it, it really struck me because I walk into a bookstore and say, oh, thank God I'll never finish this. <laughs> <laughs> because what would I do if I did? You know? That's it. That, that's that's a, why, that's kind of you know, when I discovered Soul Seek and I could, um, I could steal any album, and you name the most obscure album ever made, and somebody on Soul Seek has it because they're all obsessive bastards. And it's like I, I found the ocean. I'm like, man, it is never. I will never drink this. It will always be present for me in some form or fashion. And so, it's well, about now, passion. are you? Are, okay, I, I'm. I'm fine with that because there's a lot of content. If we're making podcasts, I mean, we never run out. All right, so that's a good thing. And on the other hand. Okay, relaxing, being mm -hmm. comfortable, being in the moment, let it go. We talked yeah. about mindfulness. We talked about um, relaxation. You well, we just uh, got kind of let get off the grid, get to well, a place where you're comfortable, and this moment is great. Yeah, well, well th th that's there's a concept of a lived moment. And again, I'm gonna obsess over the live moment. I'm gonna I've think asked about you about this, by the way, off over a period of time, every yeah. the vertices of the live moment. And you know, like, um, like I think there is a way to to take the passion, to uh, there there is um, there is a teaching embedded in Coltrane's music about how to exist and how to be present for the breath that you have, how to be present for the moment that you have no choice to be, but to experience in some form or fashion, and you you can you can bring that to bear on things. I mean that that's not a I sure. mean it, it is when I say being driven that, that that's certainly a thing. Well, the problem I, I think I'm uh, is that you don't let yourself um, relax and be in that moment because something else kind of kicks back in that you've got to do. You're sort of searching, and and uh, there's always something more out there. But but, but here's the thing because I think that when you talk about the live moment, there's such a thing which which we, there's a, it's the imminent experience. And you, you guys may experience this with music, but um, I can have, uh, I, part of the reason I've never done drugs is because I don't have to. If I really listen, and I don't like, I have a music room at home. It's, it's a little bigger than this room. Uh, it's bigger than this room. Okay, and, we need to um, the studio then. Right there, there, is, there, there is a, and there's no, there's no there, it's just a stereo, and um, there are no chairs, because when I listen to music, I move. And so I literally can enter this sort of dervish space. And I, as I get older, it's a little harder because the next day I feel like I've been hit by a truck. But I can be in that space. If Julie goes off to visit the in-laws and takes the kid, I can be in that space for eight, nine hours, and my mind God. is blown. Like God. I am literally, I am, I am communing with God. I am, I am in that space. And so with music, with, with, the, with the reading, if um, I don't know if you've, you've probably had this experience where you've been literally floored by a sentence or a concept, sure. And when it hits you, you have this sort of this moment of expansion, and like you just sort of set the thing down and you go, "Holy cow!" And I assume that's what drugs are, because I've actually I've never drank or had a cup of coffee or done any any mind altering substance whatsoever. I'm basically Mormon, it's quite a without the underwear. I mean, literally without the underwear, not just the fancy underwear, but no underwear at all. But uh, okay, that's too much information. <laughs> and uh, but but I understand where you're going with that because but, I think uh, that's uh, that. Uh, all right, so. First of all, thank you for revealing uh, some of the things. That but I'm not wearing A underwear. lot of us have questions, <laughs> but it's not about the underwear. But a lot of, a lot of things about, um, okay, so yeah, 4 o'clock in the morning, you get time to yourself. You're exploring so many things. You're constantly reading and updating things. And, um, you know, the shark in the, uh, in the ocean that ne never stops moving. 
But are you okay with mm -hmm. with that? Because that example you just gave was you just found that moment and you could be there for eight hours. You mm -hmm. could just kind of immerse yourself in well, that. Well, our, our friends, I've been mentioned before, our, our Buddhist friends, they have that, that saying that if you only enjoy the meal but not the cooking of the meal or the washing of the dishes, you only have a third of a life. <clears throat> you know, you, you have these moments of eminence because they also, they carry over into other, even the moments of the mundane. And... Um, so there is a way to uh, to hear a little bit of whole train playing, even standing in line, you know, to get your um, your Slim Jim in the Seven Eleven. Okay, so you're I, bringing I, it way down now, but yeah. But, go I, ahead. but I, I, I think there is. I think there is a way to be to be present in those things. So it's not like um, like I think um, I may be wrong in this because I, I I certainly can't. I don't have a bird's eye view of my own life, but I don't live for Saturday for that eight hours, I think there is a way in which I can visit these spaces, but I carry them with me. They're not like, it's not like, um, um, like I don't, um, I think I'm pretty good at being alive. There's a famous uh, quote by, by Winnicott, uh, it's Winnicott's prayer. Dear Lord, let me be alive when I die. And I think, uh, even though there are, you know, I mean on an average week I put in a good 70 hours, there's still, I can stay alive and breathing during a good percentage of those. So, so maybe that's, uh, and that's, maybe that's uh, a thing. You know, when you work with someone in therapy, they often come to you. Um, they are condemned to the life that they have. They are stuck. They are at a, uh, a patient I hadn't seen in a long time. Suddenly came back into my office and I hadn't seen him about six years. And and they were just telling me stories of of being. Um, of uh, just series of god awful life choices, and I could sort of see, like, and as they're telling me this, I'm like, holy cow, man, this is this is heavy. And so, for a moment, I get lost with them, the despair of of this chain of events that they've intentionally, unintentionally be part of. You allow yourself to be in despair with them in that moment, but then you're, you know, you hear Coltrane playing. You're aware that there is a there there's something, and that allows me to keep at least one toe on the bank to maybe help them come a little closer to the shore. Okay. We'll see how it goes, because that's just our first session in a while, but good gravy. No, we, yeah. we've talked about the idea of the participant and observer, the mm -hmm. one foot on the bank, one foot mm -hmm. in the stream, uh, how important that is for therapy and the conversation mm -hmm. and the movement in therapy. Mm -hmm. So uh, so you're, you're able to do that. Well, um, this has sort of been an organic uh, start for our podcast today, because we do yeah, well, I think so we should call this yes. the, po the podcast where you've been hacked. We got hacked. Yes, See, we did. Uh, so yes, that's right. And uh, yes. before this is over, I've got to move a camera. So we're going to have a little technical break here in just a second. But uh, it's always uh, good to have uh, uh, Dr. Rose needs an audience. And so sometimes, the, you know, the audience have won today. we got the upper echelon yeah, right guess, in here today. So. Yeah, we got to, uh, yeah. If we could just take the cruise here. The cruise has been here. I That's sent right. you the picture of the That's cruise in the, in the studio. I can tell, you so. know, I can tell, I can feel his Although presence. Although there's some trouble brewing, so I want to be careful about how that goes. There I'm is, there's trouble? Yeah, well, you. <laughs> but, uh, you're yeah, start, no, you're no, going to no. start something. No. I can tell no, you I, right I can now. feel, like, I, I can feel that, the, you know, that, um, that his presence, you know, it's like he, 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 he sort of bends space and time wherever he is, and I can feel that, I can feel that curve, you know? There's a cruise curve going and, on. And the good thing wrong? is he can explain it to you. <laughs> he could, he could, yeah. <laughs> exactly, he could. what you're saying. Yeah. So that's always good. Looking forward to him. Matter yeah. of fact, I think we're on the books for next Thursday, if I'm not mistaken. The cruise will be in the, the studio. Well, what is he going to yes. talk about? What, what's, what's he going to say? It's going to be... Um, what is what is the well? We're going to grill the expert. Oh, and that's, that's uh, right. The, that's the right. questions that the that lay people like uh, Mike and Tom want. I heard to, about that. I was. This is really intriguing. So, what sort of questions do you ask an expert? Okay, so for for a quantum in quantum physics, for instance. Uh, what's up with that dead cat? Tell us about that. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Uh, like that. The, uh, there was a couple other ones, like uh, what was the one you came up with, Mike? You came up with one oh, that was uh, um, well, that was I, out I, there. You know, um, I, you know, first mentioned aliens, for example. The mm -hmm. uh, the idea that there are a hundred billion galaxies. Uh, mm -hmm. There are 100 billion stars in the, each of those galaxies, all having planets revolving mm -hmm. around. Why haven't we heard from s someone yet? Yeah. Or maybe we have. If you listen to the last uh, Joe Rogan podcast with Dan Aykroyd, uh, okay, <laughs> yeah, that guy be careful have, there. I he may have taken a turn. I've heard about that. 
But what I, one of the questions I'd ask him is like, you know, how come um, astrophysicists get more chicks than Sinatra? What, what, what's, what's, what? What, what, what is the deal with that? Okay, well, we can, we can put that on the agenda to talk ask about, him about it. that, like, up, man. Maybe just send is, in some uh, what viewer is questions, and then we'll That guy, you know, that guy's got expert. a, he's got more notches on his belt than, I don't know, Tiny Tim. What, speaking All right, of, so, so, so here what we sort are of questions would you ask a psychologist? Uh, well, the, the first thing I would ask about this mindfulness okay. uh, concept. You would, you would. So, so, so many people are really, as you say, they're, they're focused on, I'm a prisoner of my life. Mm -hmm. So if, if you're the prisoner, maybe you hold a key. I, I, well, how, how does all that work? That would be, a, mm -hmm. uh, if I came to you and I said, all these forces are, mm -hmm. are impinging on me and I, I can't seem to get unstuck, my relationships are bad, uh, my job is not happening for me, mm -hmm. help me. Help me, Mr. Wizard. <laughs> you know that, 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 that's a tough one, man. And it, I, I, um, I'd say retire. <laughs> hey, and uh, and retirement's Listen, awesome. Listen, let me by just say way, a few words about retirement. <laughs> All good. Uh, maybe, uh, go. maybe, so maybe, maybe this is something to work for. Maybe I'll make it. I'll make on, it. On the other hand, you, my friend, mm -hmm. um, retired doesn't seem to fit. I'm just going to say, might, given what we've just learned about you, I might. Uh, uh, I might. Yeah, it's not a. Yeah, that's, I, a, that's a fixed point in time. We're not moving toward that. It's, We're just. It's going to be a progress. Well, it's funny. One of my I mentors. Um, he just retired. Um, he was uh, one of the first psychoanalysts I knew in my program, and he's 91. <laughs> All right, there you go. And uh, I think he had a private practice and was teaching up until the age of 90. Wow. So, All right, let's get know, that. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's a pretend we are living longer, and so that he's yeah, making I think, use yeah. of that, that kind of thing. He, um, sure. he, uh, I think uh, he did, you know. I think the reason he retired was because his meth habit. I think it finally okay. It finally there you took go. its toll. See, that's a, that's so that's I why know. that's exactly that statement right there. Um, <laughs> and Sean Cruzen, the Cruz, mm. coming in the studio with those kind of questions. <laughs> Uh, that guy needs a meth habit. The, I'm just saying, pit the that guy needs me. meth. If anybody, I, I normally wouldn't say this to someone, but you know, man, I think he needs a drug habit. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't. Wouldn't All right, we are so off the rails today, um, but at the, at the same time, like we said, it's organic. We're kind of moving towards it, something it is. here. Well, we talked about it, several different things. You want to kind of uh, go on any of those topics that you? you well, well just I'm, up I'm intrigued because, by intrigued by a couple of things because you know Hackett has the five questions for experts, and I felt that you know I don't think I qualify as an expert in any way, but I would at some point like to have though hear those five questions because because I would like you know I just want to know like what what would be uh, what would be you know. Well, the first first thing, Mike and I have to go to the panel of experts. We have a panel of experts panel that of experts. De de yeah. devises the questions for the experts. Is this the chicken really... and biscuit place downstairs? Uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> Brewster's ice cream is the Actually, last one. Actually, yeah, the last one was it, outside uh, Brewster's okay, ice cream. Right, that's, uh, that's, just that's whoever, okay. whoever's at Brewster's. Uh, <laughs> uh, really? Yeah, that's right. Okay, well, I... Uh... Yeah, these, are, these, uh, these questions, uh, dubious at best, <laughs> a little sketchy is what somebody said. Okay, it's thing. like... So, hope, uh, it's just the way it is. Right my now. luck, you get... you get my, you, If you were to ask me, you get my questions um, um, mixed up with the... Um, with the uh, adult film star that you were going to interview, so suddenly right. I ask questions like, you know, like, what is it with that gag reflex? I'm like, well, I don't know. I, just, uh, <laughs> like, I, don't, I don't know. See, it, it, this is. I'm glad Dr. Hackett is getting uh, uh, to observe and to understand <laughs> what I have to go through yeah, sorry, to sorry. get a podcast out on the on the World Wide Web. So you um, know, one of the questions of we asked, things, but ooh. hey, we keep doing it for some reason. So, the first yeah. grill, the expert, we we grilled Mike and. Since Mike was the on the grill, he Let's couldn't grill really himself. Uh, <laughs> but the remember but, the movie Reluctant Astronaut with Don Knotts. Okay, that was uh, yeah, the, I that remember was that. Uh, that was where that's I was at. Yeah. As, uh, yeah, he did a movie expert. with a talking fish. Remember that one? Oh, please. <laughs> but worst, the, one of the worst. But still, we like Don Knotts. Okay. The the questions we did uh, or that the panel of experts came up with for Mike revolved around the the idea that okay, we're in a new millennium. What are the uh, first? What are the mental health issues in this millennium that may be different from previous times? And then second, uh, we went to the idea of okay, so what are strategies for dealing with those issues? So mm -hmm. that that's the kind of thing we came up wow. with. But we had very specific questions, you know. Well, see, we, we talked about that. The idea that um, yeah. that uh, the Gutenberg mind versus the digital mind. Yes. 
and that that my like matter of fact, I pull some of the stuff <laughs> we talked about from that. that. Was, you see, that, yeah. that that's why these things kind of help and come together sometimes. Because so the the, the idea that that like when my son, and it, just an example, it's like my son is um he plays uh, he plays League of Legends, and uh, by the way, CSU now has a League of Legends team. It's like a that's like a campus sport. Oh, was that one of the but, things? Uh, oh, okay. So okay. Uh, I, I um. And he sees, I keep saying, Tim, it's character. I got this character. This character is so cool. Let me show you the character, how cool he is. You know, or how cool the character is. Kept saying, the cool, how character the cool is. Right, right, right. So I go up and he says, and this is the character. And it's a female character. Right. It's a woman. Oh, look how cool she is. She's on it. I'm thinking, when I was his age, I couldn't do that. I couldn't have chosen a female character. Hmm. No. I couldn't well, have. Those, I, would have I mean, I could have thought it, but I couldn't have expressed it. And could I have said it to my dad? Now, my dad probably was pretty cool, and he was a liberal commie, so probably he would have been more than okay with it. But, um, uh, if he only could see me now. But um, I think that notice how the very fabric, the web of culture has changed. So, you know, um, that there has, there has been a movement, and my mind is different than his. It already is. Like mm -hmm. he has, I, 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 he is a digital native. He is, he has a digital mind. He can think. When, uh, uh, when he's trying to teach me how to play one of the games, like the keyboard to him is a different thing. To, mm -hmm. to me, it is simply a word processing right. go and, and so you can literally see the, the the shift and the change. And I, since I do a lot of work with with adolescents in my private practice, you know, they they force me to move out of my Gutenberg, you know. Um, uh, book sort of way of thinking about things into in, and you can you can often tell the difference between other therapists like um, if if you're gonna work with folks within I work with a lot of college students too you're sort of you're sure. forced to be able to think to to but I still will not have the mind that he does so when you talk about what what are the mental health issues we have to face one thing is it's you 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 can't go back we can't. No. When the and again, not not to get political, but you know, uh, our current president kept saying, "Let's make America great again," and I think of part of what drove the folks who voted for him is the sheer terror of realizing that first off, there never was the America you want to go back to. It's it's right. a it's a it's it's a, what we call apricou in psychoanalytic thought. It's a retroactive reconstruction. No lost certainties can be found, but. By the sheer terror of the fact that we are now, we have been replaced, and we are slowly but surely being replaced. I will not be able to compete in the world that my son is being, is being uh, uh, formed for. And that's a scary thing, no? I think so. I think so. And, and we talked about some of this with uh, our podcast we're talking about the, the coping skills and, and the way to sort of take a break from all of the chaos in, uh, that is going on. And so... Uh, yeah, these basic uh, counseling skills as well, where mm -hmm. you have some empathy, you develop the ability to see it from another person's point of view, but also you're authentic. You're mm -hmm. trying to be who you are, and mm -hmm. I think that's the way we let off this conversation today. So mm -hmm. uh, it, it seems to permeate a lot of things that we talk about, and I, 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 well, I'm it, down it, with that. But I think, it, mm -hmm. and you mentioned too, uh, Dan, just to say that, this is a progressive thing. It's it's what's mm -hmm. before. It's it's mm -hmm. during. It's after. It's mm -hmm. a uh, it's a chain of events to be um, truly aware and uh, in the moment, as we talked about so many times. And think about what you said there with the in the moment. You mentioned the mindfulness. I think at its core, and um, there's a philosopher named uh, I've mentioned him before, Slava Zizek. 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 Uh, uh, by the way, some some of the most interesting uh, videos out there and and, and talks uh, out on the internet is Zizak because uh, you will not predict what he's going to say next. No, in fact, he, he, if if um, he is of the left, but he is one of the most offensive and politically incorrect people you will ever ever encounter. <laughs> willfully so, willfully so. Yeah, yeah. But um, but but makes sense and comes around if you listen to him yeah, long enough. That, that, he brings no, it around be, and you got to go. Point. Oh yeah, I get that now. Okay. I Okay. But uh, yeah. his take on mindfulness is is that in a way mindfulness, at least what he calls it Western Buddhism and the Western Buddhism practice of mindfulness, is in some ways the most inauthentic practice available. <laughs> because the goal of Western mindfulness is, is just to be able to get you to lower your anxiety enough so you can continue to be a cog in the wheel, right? Right. So yep. you're continuing yep. to buy, 
continue to work and not question the fact that the anxiety that you're attempting to still through mindfulness is a, is actually a, a, a reflection of your sanity. You should be feeling the things you're feeling. And the moment you, that you're trying to move into is the is is not the real moment. And this notion that um, that in some ways mindfulness, if we're not careful, is will will turn us into capitalist zombies. We will work and we will spend and we will not ask ourselves what is this anxiety we're experiencing about. You know, mm-hmm. some of the things. I mean, there's a part of it too that we buy into, that we have accept we, we accepted as a result of being in this society, and we are a cog in the wheel. Although we like to demonstrate mm-hmm. our independence and our individuality. Mm-hmm. But there's something very important about what he's saying there that we need to be aware of that and decide what we're going to do about it if we do anything. Well, when you say well, what we're going to do, because one, one of the things that, that Hackett said there is that if somebody comes in and they say that, look, you know, I've got all these things going on, all these conflicts in my life, you know, all this, this you know, I want, I want all this changed. Well, the goal is one thing is to be able to say that um, actually, no, the conflicts that you have are the life you have. You don't want to, you know, if you untie the knot, then you may have nothing at all. You do this sometimes in couples work. Uh, couples, I, I have this spiel where I always say, you know, couples don't have fights, they have one fight. And our goal is to name the fight you have. And the goal is not to stop that fight, because if we untie that knot, we untie the marital knot. Mm-hmm. But the goal is to be able to have some understanding so this conflict can move you forward. You should get better at it. It's not that it should stop. Right. And that I think there's something... Mindfulness, if we're not careful, and some of the quick fixes that we have are are aimed at. Uh, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm I'm not a huge fan of CBT. You know, good. Now that's not the oil. That's that's CBD, right? That's yeah. Okay, that's, <laughs> Here we I'm go. a huge fan I'm of that. I'm glad you clarified all of that. I'm a huge fan because right. you know, every night before I go to bed, I, I, a bathtub of CBD oil. I'll just sort of lower myself into it. But not cognitive behavioral therapy. <laughs> I would never okay, do that, that, but that, I would the bathtub okay, full of CBD, go. just sort of, just sort of float. <laughs> If I could have a swimming pool of CBD, we'd have a party. We'd all just kind of. But what would that? How would that end? Uh, with the police? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> that doesn't sound right. That's but true. Uh, yeah, okay. So I'm, I'm not. But I'm the not, point. The point. The point. There was a point somewhere. I'm not a fan of CBT partly because I am. I, I, um, as you know, I, I supervise a bunch of folks. Yes. I supervise burgeoning psychologists and counselors and therapists. So they're, they're like they're like they're Who on may their be CBD. Tea. They're, they're often uh, very young, well. and so, often, yeah, their programs often sort of do this. And so often Until you convert them, I might say. So. I, I try to. Having, and usually having, conversion having involves, you know, it's, uh, you, ever, ever, you know what trepanning is? You put the hole in the head. <laughs> that's how, oh, yeah, that's that how was a while it. back. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. okay. we had the uh, we ancient Mayans used to do a lot of that trepanning sort of thing. Okay. It's not a, yeah. But yeah. so th- th- they come in, and they'll often, um, and I'll, I'll see this where, you know, like, and, and I'll, I'll watch a video of, of one of their tapes here. Right. I'll often see an, an instance where, um, I don't know about you, <clears throat> yep, there you go. but um, there's this famous saying by one of my man, men, men, Wilfred Bion. I've heard talked about him before, too. I bet we have. We have. And he says, anytime two people meet, an emotional storm is created. So his basis is that even, even among friends, there is always a disturbance in the in your internal world the minute someone comes close enough to you for it to be considered an encounter like the way the moon affects the tides right so there's always this emotional storm and we have a reflexive automatic way of being able to navigate this you know the earth doesn't have to think the moon the moon's already there and the goal is um, what we do with that and as therapists oftentimes the way they answer that initial impact of the person walking in and sitting in their office is to reach for a worksheet. The most... Okay, let's do this, right? I've actually been in that situation <laughs> supervising when the person left the room to get a worksheet. <laughs> That's right, yeah. And, the couple and they was, never came back, even though they had the well, worksheet. Well, <laughs> it took a long time. They must have had a Xerox copy, maybe, or something. But the couple, was they were crying in the, in the session when the person went for the worksheet. Well, worst and, example, but yes, but, I But that's exactly a beautiful example mean. of how they are mediating the, that, that emotional storm. And there are ways to do that in an authentic manter, manner that generates the very impact that could be healing, right? right? Like you can tell when somebody is sitting across from you and they are literally waiting on the next thing they're going to say, right? Right. That would be the exa- a wonderful example of inauthentic- 
But if you're in the presence of somebody who's open and you can tell they're actually listening to you, sure. that in of itself is a healing thing, right? Yeah, it's a beautiful thing too. I mean, I don't think we often get that right. in our hustle bustle mm -hmm. society and well, chaos. I'll tell you, occasionally now. when my wife overdoes her Xanax, I get that. I come home, you know, she drools a little, but I can tell she's listening. <laughs> you know. Let me just, just uh, we'll have Julianne at some point, and she'll yes. clear up clear up uh, all of these she misconceptions. Will. Well, here's what she'll her, say. She said, the reason I need the Xanax is I'm married to this bastard. That's, you know how many that, Xanax? Now, now that part, to get, I think I understand. Absolutely, to get yes. Well, you, you bring up some uh, interesting <laughs> ideas, too, and I think sometimes the behaviorist, not only the cognitive behaviors, but the behaviors themselves, mm -hmm. are really talking about how to end something a bad behavior how to right, how to yeah. stop something so mm -hmm. <clears throat> not not just lower anxiety but get rid of anxiety mm -hmm. so we know that they're marching well, uh, in the wrong I was trained there, I, sure. uh, Nate Azrin he was one of the because I was into behaviorism the reason I went to my program that I went to was Nate Azrin was there and he's the guy who helped invent token economy and this it. guy was like one of the foremost behaviors <laughs> on the planet and I remember him giving a lecture and he's saying that anger is a bad thing and oh. that if you can have an anger-free life, it means you're healthy. And I remember thinking to myself, like, ah, boy, that sounds kind of... But it is. It's all about that anger is a sign that there's a behavior that you need to, to extinguish. Right. I mean, I mean the, to, the uh, whole regime, uh, if, you, if mm -hmm. you think about it, is um, from the learning perspectives, from the learning uh, theories that we count, mm -hmm. we uh, somehow quantify, and we're marching down mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. 10 to 1 to 0. Mm -hmm. And well, it happens all the time in psychotherapy. Here's the thing, though, because I was, his, uh, I was the graduate assistant for the program and his main graduate assistant. I really think I broke him on this anger thing. <laughs> I really think I'm not hanging out with me enough. <laughs> He really, at some point, was like, you know, I, because you know, just my mere presence toward the end, just, you know, he would. Um, my question is, <laughs> is that going to happen to me and Dr. Hackett? I think it's already here? happened. Right oh, now, it's too late. Now. Can, okay, there all we go. this suppressed rage, you're like, God, <laughs> like after you, you guys are going to start drinking after this. You're going to go down to like find like I don't know. Uh, is the loft open is at this point? Is there anything to drink around here now <laughs> is my like, question. You know, so, you know. uh, yeah, well, that, it's kind of an interesting... Apple teenies. You guys look like guys who would really enjoy a good, uh, like a bucket of apple I teenies. I think that's an insult. Yeah, we'd probably we just go down to pluck chicken and have a chicken sandwich. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, that, that yeah. would get okay, you. All right, he's that fighting. would do it for us. Dr. Hack is fighting back right now, so <laughs> he knows you're a vegan. So here <laughs> we go. That's was, that, a, was, that, was that a shot across the bow? That was. That was a meat shot across the bow. Which, by the way, I I had a uh, a vegan slider last night at a local restaurant. Can okay. We say, can we say the restaurant's name? Can we say the Jar Flies? You like that Jar Flies? Uh, mm -hmm. Sure. You Have you been there? Mm -hmm. We've done, mm -hmm. done things. We've it done. was actually quite. Actually, useful. we need sponsors for this uh, yeah. program. So, they should sponsor yes. Beyond. It was a Beyond Burger slider. I really enjoyed that. You know what? They're small. How many? You know how many I had? Forty-two. <laughs> no, that's not true. Uh, like, but. Uh, see, I have to. I have to quickly call you on these things because if I let them stay yeah. just silence afterwards, yeah. people go, "Oh, really? Forty-two? That seems like a lot." No, none of that's real. Okay, I'm just saying. I'm Irish. All right. Uh, <clears throat> all right. So, what were we talking about? I think we were talking about inauthent authenticity. Inauthenticity. We're talking about the idea of the lived moment. I think on some level, your question was saying, "Look." I've just heard a great deal about the behavior of this really obnoxious, obnoxious, obsessive bastard. Surely this must be hell. And you were trying to say, I think you were trying to do the intervention. You were trying to say, how do we get you to live in the moment, man? Like, you know, whatever. Well, I know. No, it was just a reflective. I wasn't trying to do any work on you. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I've tried that before. And, you know, nothing's say, happened. So. Anybody, anytime I, I go saying. looking for a therapist, like, they would be like, no, man, I've already heard stories. No. <laughs> I don't need this. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> I can imagine the uh, rest of the therapists in town, if you were to call for an appointment, I mean, they'd probably like, close their practice. Here, they, I don't they, know for like, sure, here, but... They would hand me a hammer. Just hit me in the head with this a couple of times. <laughs> let's, let's get this over with. But but I'm, I'm fascinated about the topics that we, we talked about so far. I'm fascinated about you mm -hmm. in, in, certain, in certain ways, but it, this is not a necessarily podcasts about yeah. you but uh you certainly have an influence on some things that we're talking about here um but yeah and i don't think i was tr really trying to do an intervention but I, I just want to know more in other words okay if you do 
and we talked about Malcolm uh, Gladwell just the other day. With uh, if you want to be I an thought expert, you were with Malcolm X, but uh, Malcolm Gladwell. No, that's, that's that's coming up on that's the good. schedule. But for the most part, ten thousand hours of practice if you want to be Boom. an expert. Mm -hmm. And somewhere ingrained in you is that if I'm interested in something, I gotta get going I gotta get my thousand. I've got to, I've yeah. got to start doing it. Well, works like this, and this is an, my. I was really trying to get into. Um, I decided at one point I was going to get into Beethoven, and. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you ever go on the Pirates Bay. I assume it's still there because Soul Seek. I got in trouble with a couple of lawyers, so I don't visit Pirates Bay anymore. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's a true story. Uh, but but uh, I went on the old Pirates Bay, and okay. you could literally find they had compiled um, 62 different conductors with 62 different symphonies. It may not all have been different symphonies of each of Beethoven's symphonies. And so I stole it. And so I would spend like, you know, um, I would be Beethoven's first or second. I, I, I go went through all of them, and I would listen to weeks on end of the same symphony just by the different. I would listen to it over and over okay, again. Okay, hold, hold on, just a second. <laughs> all right, all right. I, I'm glad you you put yeah. that out there. Let's just take take a take it gets a worse. It gets take, worse. Take a policy. <laughs> <clears throat> and so the idea for you. I mean, I'm, my first thought was, okay, you real, really want to drill down and, and look at the comparisons between to, how this music is going to go. But so crunchy, explain yourself, sir. There, there, there's, like, there's a crunchy style. There were um, Mahler came along and added a bunch of stuff. And so there's the romantic interpretation of Beethoven symphonies. There are all these different, and based on when the conductor was born, their influences, there was a return to what would be known as that's the crunchy style, a classic, like with classic instruments and pared down and all that sort of stuff. So all these sorts of stuff that you mm -hmm, get. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, I probably read every single Beethoven biography in study. There's even a site, there's two, there's one book by a psychoanalyst on Beethoven. I read that twice. And so, in the midst of all this, so okay. I'm, I'm going on and on. And my wife, at some point, she said, if Let I me just say, <laughs> thank God for Julie in so many ways. She okay, said, go ahead. if I have to hear one more. <laughs> 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 <That's>, <laughs> to the moon. <laughs> that is literally, you know, can we can we hear mu some music with words? How about that? I said, well, I haven't gone to the ninth. That's got some vibrato. That's we can. <laughs> I'm <laughs> we not going to make it. Though, I'm right. not going to make it to the ninth. You're you know, going to make it. Your marriage is not going to make it to the ninth. <laughs> That's what she said. I can't. You know, I can't. So, so, it, I, and my point of saying this is that I got a point, maybe just to show how, how right. ridiculous I, I I can be, I guess. But I know. the idea is is that. Um, there, there is, a, like I said, there, there is a core, there is a depth, there is a way to, you know, I don't have, like I, I, um, I, I can't read music, but even if you can't read music, people have come up with pictographs of Beethoven scores, and I've got those too, and I would occasionally try to look at them while I was listening to the music, so it has some sense of, of you know, placement of instruments, and, you know, his, his notions of tonality, and, and his compositional choices, I'll, I would, I'd attempt at that too. But yeah. <laughs> hey, can I interject something? If I were to interrupt that, you were going through that, or, or your wife Julia at the house would say, "Hey, honey, how about this?" Or, "Hey, Dan, what what about the? You know, could could you? Yeah, could, could gonna, you respond it's, to that?" It's, it's, it's fine. Yeah, I, I do. Or say, "Hey, uh, no, I'm." I'm f no these talking, would be times when you know when people are when in the morning when everybody's asleep, or you okay. know, I would All be. Right. Uh, I, I, it, they would often be when I was doing something, or I would. I had at that point, I had a. I didn't have a music room at that point. Maybe I did. At some point in this, I had a music room. Okay, all right. So I, I didn't would, mean to, I would I go down there, take but, us off yeah. on that. But, but, the, but that, that's, that's his intervention. You're trying to see if, if, if this was taking the place of human interaction, if it was somehow uh, uh, impacting. Uh, oh, yeah, <laughs> and, and also kind yeah. of being in that moment and being able to kind of uh, move with the mm. with what's happening in, in that time frame. But you, what you're saying is that you set aside that time to it's, yeah, indulge. It's just a, and is it an indulgence, though? I mean, is well, it this? It goes back. We talked about Doc Savage. I don't know if that got, was on the thing, but what you know, um, the idea behind it is is that it's like lifting weights. So you 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 it's it's like li an aesthetic lifting of weights. You know, it's like a way of 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 placing something a burden in your path that you can grow from in a way. And so um, even if I were listening to those Beethoven things, I would still think about how do they connect with with uh, whatever philosophical discourse I might be engaged okay, in, or okay. how does it connect with the work that I do. And, oh, yeah. You know, that, that's why I think when I discovered some of the books where they were sort of talking about how, you know, how um, um, there's a mysterious letter that Beethoven wrote that some people considered a suicide note that he never actually 
you never actually did but and if I remember correctly it's he scratched out or he just um, um, you, you didn't have um, I think at some point maybe I'm wrong about this he could no longer write his father's name and so there would be blank spaces where he would write his father because he was so you know his father wanted him to be the next, next Mozart and so he was literally tortured Mm -hmm. to play the piano to play it till his fingers bleed he was like four or five six years old he was you know humiliated and, wow exactly. and uh, wow. he was no mozart he wasn't he wasn't natural prod prodigy i mean he obviously was beethoven so he had some stuff but right sure. and so you can see tangled up in the music this this you know um um a cry for connection um it's also oddly enough a, a, one of his letters where he's sitting at the salon and he and his friends are talking about um uh, women's butts <laughs> yes <laughs> i think like apparently that was a I guess that's always been a thing <laughs> um, <laughs> but I'm not making that up that's okay, a real thing I, that's, the, that yeah, sounds like I'm, something I would make up but it's not made up <laughs> Tom or I are not going to answer and respond to any of that but, uh, but it is, yeah, it's, so they were doing that yeah, but. He, was, he was really sort of you know talking but um, uh, you, you can see in the letters that we have left that you know you, you can see a sort of his humanity sort of seep through and all that sort of stuff and so there are ways to be able to look into these things and and uh, know something more about the human condition than you did before well, you jumped in. Well, it, it occurred to me that a, a lot of this, what what could be considered obsessive, mm -hmm. compulsive type um, responding and, and, and living, if you will, um, always ties back in to what you're doing in your work and trying to help someone else mm -hmm. in the therapy process or trying to broaden your own uh, view of things and gain more information. Finally get that. the respect I deserve. Right. Well, um, you know, one That's of the a nippy situation in any case. But one, yes, one of the things that occurs to me as I, as I listen to all this, so there's so many things that uh, I, it's really thought-provoking, but this whole idea, is it, is, are these behaviors obsessive, compulsive, or is this more like what Jack Kerouac would refer to as being mad for life, passionate? Oh, yeah, in other yeah. words, oh, yeah. his his That's idea, uh, and, I, and I'm I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> he got but, you out of trouble, right? But there, what what Kerouac, Kerouac said in On the Road is he wanted to be a member of that group, that tribe that was mad for life, mad for talk, mad for living, uh, mad for experience, and. By being mad, he meant the whole idea of passion, so that he he and uh, uh, Neil Cassidy got in a car, went on the road, and saw America and lived America. And in fact, uh, the whole 60s thing is really engendered out of the whole Kerouac kind of trip, you know. So so uh, those of us baby boomers, Mike, we, we're sort of the the sons and daughters of Jack Kerouac in a lot of ways, you know, some of our attitudes. And I wonder if that whole that whole thing could be framed that way. But maybe I'm being too CBT about it, you know. I'm reframing. Well, no, no, no. That, 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 I like that because, you know, uh, especially since it makes me sound less crazy. Uh, <laughs> and by the way, you, you oh, said that's you guys... That's where I was going, but on the other hand... Uh, <laughs> no, 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 we're guys, good, the, we're uh, good. The children of, of Kerouac and Cassie, that, that, that explains the, uh, the smell of hash. Uh, I, uh, okay, I'm kidding. But uh, there's a, a, a Kerouac quote, if I remember, he said that um, he wanted to eat with his food naked and quivering on the end of his fork. And um, that's where the, 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 the title for Burroughs' Naked Lunch comes from, from a Kerouac quote. But um, I like that. I, I like the idea of being able to, um, um, that Winnicott prayer, Lord, let me be alive when I die. And uh, Freud talks about it in terms of that, you know, we need to de develop a love affair with life. And so how do right. we find, you know, a way to be, to be, um, um, and, and there's something about that, um, that imminence, that, um, that explosion, that, uh, it can be, um, it can be a, uh, a, a, a drug, it could be something you could pursue that could keep you uh, away from quieter moments, I, 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 I guess, too, but... I like that. I like the. Um, it's not. Well, it's it just it, it 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 make it makes sense in in lots of ways. I think it connects with authenticity and this idea of just living life and taking advantage of all that we have. I mean, it gets back to what Tom and I were talking about with Pinker. I mean, we're in a place now that we have more. We have more riches. We have less mm -hmm. violence. We have all of these things at our disposal. Why not go for 
just mm-hmm. everything that you can learn and kind of move mm-hmm. in this in this space. Yeah, but most that people don't. Now. I think that um, I, think, I was talking I to right. a, a patient a while back, and they were describing um, their um, uh, ex, and they said something to the effect that well, you know I, I still miss them because, and it's been years and years and years, but I miss them because they had such a passion. And the, this individual was was really into collecting things, and they had mm. uh, um, they were into things, and so. This person was saying that I, I don't I, I've encountered a lot of people since then, but but most people don't have that. And the qu- that question might be is is this is this passion, is this something we're all born with and then it gets beaten out of us, that um, we become uh, departmental, we become uh, compartmentalized, all that sort of stuff, or is it something that some people are born with? Or is it something that we have to uh, learn to cultivate? I mean, that's, I mean, what uh, Well, I, I mean, I, if you wanted an answer to that, I would say all of the above. Mm-hmm. Because I think um, there, there, are, there are some educators who say that the educational system sort of squashes yeah. that and Oops. tries to make you conform and, mm-hmm. and really squashes that passion. And really what you want to do is every individual needs to find that passion. What gets them up in the morning? What, what makes time go by so fast when they're focused on something and using the moment? Being in it is not just the phrase, but it's mm-hmm. actually taking advantage of the resources and who you are mm-hmm. and finding that passion within you to sort of move forward. And I think that's a goal f- for everyone that comes into therapy, but I think it's across the board. But, but when you say that, though, I mean, maybe I'm wrong because, um, and it also could be because I am crazy, but... I, uh, the jury's out. <laughs> it is, yeah, they, and they're not Today coming we back. came close, but I think the jury's still out. <laughs> and the jury's right? out, and they decided not to come back. <laughs> they're not coming <laughs> back. <laughs> Don't miss. No but um, the, um, um, I think that um, if I were to tell, you know, obviously this is being recorded and maybe reverberating forever, <laughs> uh, my, my, the, the things that interest me or how I pursue my interests, for lots of folks, that would be, that's just crazy. That would not be, you know, that would right. be uh, this, what you call passion or what you call investment is frivolous. You know, it's not, um, um, it is, so I, I mean, I wonder about this. I well, wonder, I, I think, I, you know, also just our culture and what we brought up, uh, um, those of us who came up in the 50s and the baby boomers, as Tom had said, that, like w- um, what the model that we had was that you go to work for the company, you work for 30 years, you get to go watch, you retire, you singularly focus, take care of your family, go mm-hmm. to work and do this and these uh, very sort of uh, narrow guidelines that we sh- should live our lives in. And I think we're coming to find out that maybe there's other ways to do it. So mm-hmm. maybe this is our sort of response to that. Well, I mean, because that would be Kerouac and Cassidy were sort of reacting against that very right. sort of culture, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. That sure. was their, you mm-hmm. know, that this is, this is mind-numbing. This is, you know, the reason why Daddy comes home and drinks until he goes to sleep at night is because the life he has is killing him. Well, and, right. and also I think w- what we're discovering now is uh, more of the interest, and you've certainly demonstrated this, with the arts, with music. Um, those kinds of things other than the grind of making mm-hmm. a living and getting mm-hmm. through and those kind of things we're now at a place where we can expand and look at what are we really interested in what is my passion mm-hmm. so, so but the question may be then is it that if someone could could find what they're passionate in then they can then have lived moments with it they could pursue it so would the goal then be like um you know, you uh, you bring them into a room and they can pick up all of these different objects, or they can they can look at these different things and they'll whatever suits their fancy. Okay, we'll go for that. Is it is is that the equation, or is it? Um, and I'm I mean I'm obviously have an idea about this from from uh, a psychoanalytic perspective. What else have I got? But um, is that the goal? Well, I mean, how do we? How, you guys have things that you like, right? Well, the the first thing sure. is when we when we engage in that human, apparent, apparently human need to label everything, when we label a passion, do we uh, maybe in some way kill its essence? In other words, oh, they're, they're obsessed with this concept or they, this kind of thing. The, the, why, that, why that sort of is an idea that popped up? At, last night I saw a, a, a band that uh, played an amalgam of what could be called jazz, funk, rock, 
R&B. Mm -hmm. And they made the point that, that people need to call it by some name, mm -hmm. but what I saw was just a bunch of guys blowing and playing music, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, they were just going. And so when we, sometimes when we say, okay, this passion, oh, well, that's, you know, that's really over the top. Well, what makes it over the top? And, and it has an essence. Mm -hmm. Do we kill it by trying to, trying to encompass it with some kind of label, some kind of walls around it? There are just so many um, ways that I think the, the culture and the, the society we put together uh, tends to reject that. And so they're always looking for uh, judgment, right or wrong, this is not good, this is good, this is a category, let's put things in pigeonholes, let's make uh, a, a label. And now, with our current um, society, and not to be political, but we're in these tribes, we're in the camps, and so now it's either or. So it becomes a zero or one, it becomes one or the other, as opposed to being those things that we can develop unique because everybody's special. Well, there's some truth to that. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know. I like this discussion where we're kind of saying if you call it something, then it suddenly puts some boundaries on it. Mm -hmm. And we, we talked about that a little bit last week as well. And there's a, there's a saying by uh, uh, Lacan. He says that um, the word is the murder of the thing. He also has a statement that um, we're the only animal tortured by language. And so, where, and, oh, that's great. Yeah. I love that one. And you, you can see that there's a benefit of this, but um, if, and there's another famous that, you know, if we're not, let, either we use language or language uses us, and usually it's language uses us, the naming is often a way, right? That there's something dangerous about passion. There's something dangerous about getting lost in something. We talked last time about the notion of between assimilation and accommodation. Right. To grow a mind, I mean, if you, like, uh, when I think of some of the, my favorite music out, my albums, and often I didn't like them at first, right? Like, mm -hmm. my, what is this crap? And then suddenly, somewhere down the line, right. I'm like, oh, how have I lived without this? Right. right? <laughs> I'm not the same person that started this journey with this piece of music. I'm different now. And I think there's something dangerous and scary about that. We might want, want to murder things because we talked about that last time about the tyranny of automaticity, that the goal of our nervous system is to render as much automatic as possible because that is the easiest way to pass our genes on from an evolutionary biological pers perspective. Automaticity, a certain level of it is really important. You know, we don't want to think. We may not want to feel. Because because it's like climbing a rock wall. It's it's adventurous. You 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 said something, and it 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 really resonated with me about when two people meet and interact that there is a a disturbance, mm -hmm. and that often we we work to mitigate that disturbance. In mm -hmm. in in my case, a, a lot of times I have a tendency to to go to the I'm introspective. I I'm shy, so I just rather mm -hmm. remove myself from the situation. But really what you're removing yourself from by trying to encompass it with CBT or, or flight or fi uh, fight or flight, or those kinds of things, what you're really doing is avoiding an adventure. Right, right. So, and a potentially dangerous one. Right. Because the person across from you could disturb you in ways that you can't get undisturbed. <laughs> right, right, right. And, right, like, yeah. and I, I think that any adventure, there is the potential for calamity, or it wouldn't be an adventure, right? Right, yep. A roller coaster ride is the exact opposite of an adventure, right? Because it, it is it is a it is a canned experience that has no it has the faux uh, okay. risk connected to it. Yeah, I'm just saying that's not what the average person goes to a roller coaster. They're looking for the, they, they think that's it. If right? I want to get but a real adventure, you could get hurt. Well, there could be caution tape, police tape at some point circling the place where you were. If you're not right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> that is. All right. Well, I was just I was thinking that uh, life really requires courage, uh, and you have to take those adventures mm -hmm. out there, and you have to look and find your passion. You have to figure out what you're willing to do and uh, examine life, the unexamined life, for example. Well, well, and no one gets out alive anyway. So what the heck, right? Right. <laughs> 
Yes. We, uh, we all owe God a death. <laughs> All right, uh, this conversation was um, an adventure. It was. Uh, so I was disturbed. I, what yeah, say? I was disturbed. There's probably a lot of people that watch this who are going to be disturbed, too. We want to apologize in, uh, in advance for all the things that, that just happened here. Well, that was good. So can we, can we summarize with a couple of things, or is it just too much? Well, for I'm it crazy. It? And we don't want to put the word uh, on it because it, uh, it interferes with it. But... Um, I, I'm, I let that go. You know, I didn't mm -hmm. respond to what you just mm -hmm. said. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> well, right, we, so what do you think? Can we summarize that, that this is about, um, you know, Freud says that the goal of life is to be as best that we can at working, loving, and playing. Yes. And I think we focused a little on playing today when we talk about some of the arts and, and music sure. and whatnot. But, you know, it's important that all three of them, we don't want to place it. They're all equally important. So maybe the goal is how to be able to uh, to realize the uh, the the dangers, potential dangerous and um, and gains of of having a lived life. Maybe. All right, I'm good with that. Well, it's been a special day, so I have to say this has been a lot of. We fun. got hacked. <laughs> we 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 got we got hacked uh, because Dr. Hackett is uh, in the building, and um, you know. Uh, I appreciate this, Tom. I appreciate Let's you stopping it, by and being a And I want, I want, I want those questions. I want those We're five doing questions. We're doing it. I want those five questions. I want, and I want, I want, I want they got to be some uncomfortable questions, too. Maybe, you know, like. Is that the. Because we, we want you thoroughly disturbed I for, want, for Grill the Expert. Ask me, have I ever found my grandmother attractive? <laughs> Listen. You know, if if we didn't if we didn't talk about it today, I don't know if we're going to have a breakthrough in, with these five questions. I think we we got a lot out today for something, and uh, I don't know what just happened. That was my phrase. What just happened? I didn't deliver the punchline of that joke because it's really inappropriate. <laughs> yes. Yes. But, uh, but. All right, we, we're we're gonna funny. we're we're gonna end on that note. Thanks for watching. Hey guys, come back. Let's do this again. Talk to you next time. Welcome everybody to talk with Mike and Tom and today we have a very special podcast we're doing uh, we're including Mike although Mike's producing so he'll be off screen largely but you may hear him chime in occasionally well we're delighted to have Elaine Clayton she's a noted artist and writer and she does some other things too we'll be talking about those in a minute well welcome Elaine Thank you for having me. I love it. So I'm happy to be here. So you're living in Atlanta now. You were I working am. out of the Connecticut area and out yeah. of New York for a while. Sort of tri-state area. I was uh, in the New York City area for a very long time. Yeah. Yeah. And before that, Boston. Yeah. Little little blip of time when I was first starting out doing children's books. I was in Boston. Yeah. And all of mostly all of the uh, publishing industry is in you know, in New York City, so you can live anywhere, but it, it was, it really pulled me to be there more. So I just ended up gravitating to that area. So I'd love to talk about the Boston time. The first I realized you had gone to art school and you were starting mm -hmm. to sell paintings. And then next thing I know, you have a book in USA Today. Can you tell us how all <laughs> that happened? Well, it wasn't easy. Um, Sometimes people ask me about that, you know, when I would, okay, so in, in art school in the 80s, early 80s, I was a major in painting and drawing. And if you remember the early 80s, that would seem like the stupidest thing to major in because it was all about, you know, money and shoulder pads and big hair and get your money, you know. And, but I just wanted to do what I love. And so I was also throughout college and before that, and for many years after that, teaching children. And I decided that I was either going to do, besides just painting and drawing, fine art, I right. wanted to do some form of editorial art. And I was really in love with Linda Berry, some of those cartoons that, not cartoons really, but you, you might have thought of them that way, graphic novel stuff that now we see is out there, but it was really, really 
independent and new back in the early 80s. And so I figured that I might be better doing children's books, but I really kind of had both that I wanted to do. And so out of teaching children, I had a real passion for doing children's books. And I would take my little portfolio from Atlanta, where I was living, um, to New York City. And back then, you could go to New York City with your little portfolio. And right. believe me, it was like going to Oz, you know. It was pretty intimidating. And uh, so, you know, I would meet with editors and art directors. And I, I just felt like maybe you feel this way sometimes when you're in your early 20s or maybe it was starving artist kind of determination but I think at that point I would have rather died than not get published I was going to make that happen but at the time you know it took a long time um, you know I would sort of get the pat on the head if I told someone I, I want to do children's books you know they would say well, that's a nice dream or whatever and uh, I would s started to say, I am doing children's books. Because I was writing uh, stuff and sending it out. And I was really easily embarrassed because I remember actually getting a, I think it was Green Tiger Press in California. Um, I got a, a letter from an editor and she had all these sort of criticisms. And I just hid in the corner and didn't do anything <laughs> i only learned later that's what you want you want the <laughs> editor right, the to, feedback. you know so I, I had to i had a lot to learn but the magic moment was i would always at the paideia school in atlanta georgia it's an independent progressive school i had a lot of freedom a lot of creative freedom to experiment with best ways to approach education uh with young children mainly and before we did creative writing with, you know, six, seven-year-olds, we would, um, I would take that whiteboard, you know, not the chalkboard, but the whiteboard with the markers, and I would just start drawing, because I had noticed that five, six-year-olds, when you ask them to tell, you know, to write a story, right. they start by drawing almost every time. It's a very unusual if they don't. It's not bad if they don't, but most do. I think drawing is just a natural way for them to tell their story and to discover a story. So I would start drawing a story, and it was, you know, after lunch and the sun was coming in, and it was, you know, that kind of beautiful early afternoon. And um, one time a little girl in the group said you are not erasing this story because of course I would erase it when it was finished and she said you are putting this on paper and I thought you know what I'm asking them to do this kind of thing so I will also and then I'll send it off to see if it can get published you know they have to go through these they have to have teachers check yeah. their work and all yeah. that so why don't I try that and what ended up happening is they were probably in junior high by the time it, got, it can take a few years just to get someone to look at it and then two to five years to get a picture book actually out there. So did it resonate with them at all that they'd been published? Because now they're middle school age. They're not little children anymore, right? Yeah. It, well, I don't know if it meant much. I think it did because, um, you know, I, I'm in touch with some of the students right. as, as adults, young adults, and they're, you know, they're still as wonderful as they were, and that's kind of magical to me, too, that they're these grown-ups now. And then I continued to do it, so I had students, um, you know, after that, too, while I was doing uh, books. So, yeah. So the book that, that gained all the attention, and you mm -hmm. were – you were in your 20s when this happened, mm -hmm. right? What, mm -hmm. It was uh, really a children's book, and it had a unique subject. It had a, a sort of a didactic approach, yeah, right? Yeah, it was Pup in School. Right? Pup, P-U-P, doggy, little doggy, Pup uh -huh. in School. Um, I, I realized by telling those stories on the whiteboard for students um, that not just students, but all of us can handle a story a, a criticism better if if an animal is at fault <laughs> right. so if you say the chicken was very rude today everyone goes yeah <laughs> but if you say you were very rude today nobody wants to hear it right. and i don't either right so i realized uh dogs you know they're cute we love dogs they're all little cute puppies kids look so cute so i just made these um characters to try to help solve some 
I would like to say power struggles with young children learning how to negotiate uh, passiveness, passivity, yeah. or aggression. Right. And, um, you know, I ha- so, so, yeah, the central character pup was very passive. He did not know how to assert himself at key moments. And a little doggy named Rodney Dog was very assertive to the point where he probably was a little scared at times how well it was working. Right. Um, and the publishers, you know, I think it would have been better t- as a se- selling point if I had used the word bullying, but I thought that's a label. Bu- to call someone a bully is you're also labeling right. them. It, we can have bullying behavior, Yeah. but um, labels don't really help. So I didn't use the word bullying. Nothing was out there. Nothing that I know of that anyone no, ever. No, there really wasn't. There at really that time. wasn't. It just wasn't a hot topic at that time, it, as far as being in the public eye. Although right, it, it was happening, happening a lot, right. but yeah. nothing had been done, and so I think it would have been a. It, you know, it would be probably still in print and everything today if it did have the word bullying mm-hmm. but you know what it was what it was it was a great experience it was i love the book i think uh, i know people teachers who still read it every day as a first day of school little intro right, right. for kids you yeah. know and in kids as young as two it really was for two to six year olds they will in their little cute you know plastic pants with their little yeah. jeans on to say this happened to me. You know, I mean, they will talk <laughs> right, about right. this stuff. This stuff matters. What happens to us at school or at work between people that we're relating with really has a big impact. So, yeah, that was the first one. And and you, you it's unusual what you did. You you wrote it and you illustrated it. Well, so there are tons of, of artists who do write oh, their that story. Right, yeah, too. there yeah. are. There are. Um, and I, I don't know that, honestly, that being a picture book artist was really my calling. I, mm-hmm. I, I, I think I would have needed to stay in it for much longer. Mm-hmm. After doing, I don't know how many, maybe five, Yeah. Um, a publisher at Clarion said, who knew me and knew all this other spiritual stuff right, that I love, right. she said, why don't you do a book about your real work? Right, <laughs> right. And I thought, you know what? I really should. And it, But everything has, I think of divine timing. I think there's a time for everything. And um, after she said that, and then after my kids, who were pretty young um, by now, you know, by then, yeah, I was able to sort of welcome another era of taking all these sketchbook journals and dream journals that I had kept recording right. spiritual reflections and messages and drawings for since I was 18 probably yeah. 17 or 18 um, I didn't know what all you know all the art was for either all the all this painting and stuff I was able to finally start um, focusing on that yeah so my career sort of segued a little yeah you were you were getting calls to collaborate with other people and do the illustrations for their their books I too. I have. Yeah. I've illustrated for many other authors, not for picture books, but uh, for chapter books right. and uh, YA novels. Yeah. That's young adult novels. I've illustrated for Jane Smiley, who's a Pulitzer Prize winning author. Awesome, Jane Smiley. Right, that right, was, right, right. Yeah, she had a series, um, The Georges and the Jewels. And this is about a girl. This is really a fun series about a girl who grows up in the 60s on a horse farm and she has to get up before school and you know do all that work and you know, it's just really interesting um the art director knew that i loved horses and that i was a writer so she knew i would know the equipment because that book was illustrated with ink drawings just showing the equipment so that a, a reader in, in an urban environment or someone who's just you know doesn't know writing if if um something says bridle or breastplate or harness or whatever you there's an illustration so i was i really was in heaven doing those so were your her. illustrations for those you you do all kinds of styles so you do a a style that looks sort of not cartoons but they they're uh, have an element of caricature to them mm-hmm. but you also do things that are very sort of hyper realistic and then you have the 
the work you're doing now, which we'll mm-hmm. get to. But uh, were those more of the realistic kind of approach, or how? That I, was I tried to make it look as real. Right. It, it wasn't realism exactly, but right. I tried. You you needed to see what the bridal right. was. It couldn't be off on that. Right. I actually, and I do love rendering, so. I did do that. And the topic about artists and styles is real interesting because I think in art school, sometimes that idea, I mean, it's the cart before the horse. It's like um, you want to be yourself. In some ways, art school will sort of ring out your style because whatever you were doing before, you end up learning a lot of things and maybe changing not always in a good way, but right. there's influence there. Right. And and then there's... Um, it can almost be pretentious too. Like I got to get a style. I got to be me and have a style. And I never really wanted to do that. I just wanted to paint and I wanted to draw and I wanted to do it however I wanted to do it whenever I wanted to do it. So I love to paint people. I love to do life studies. I love to do, I mean, you know, there are just a lot of different approaches, but as I've gotten older, my paintings are still figurative, but I would say I've developed a sense of style by just, I guess, experience and time. Right. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know if I have a look or not, and I don't know if I care. I just want to do the work that I love. So, but I have noticed that both the abstract work and the figurative work, as far as paintings that I do, you know, not, not editorial art, but the paintings that I do, you know, they're developing and they're, they're telling me what they want to be. So that's kind of interesting. Well, one thing, uh, and w- I'm fortunate that I have some of your art and, and I have, I have from different eras, I have mm-hmm. some, uh, a small piece that's a beautiful piece about a, uh, communion line in a Catholic church. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. it, and you can see all the different really People. characters and yeah. it, and that and you were doing a lot of character kind line of work. work contour yeah. drawing line work yeah i love to do that i still do that all the time yeah in the, my sketchbook the the pieces uh, that are more recent that that i have mm-hmm. uh and that hung in my office and in my home office are are uh iconic size they're first they're large mm-hmm. and second they seem to be tied with the with some of the other work you're doing now, the the spirit work mm-hmm. and the intuitive work and that kind of thing, you want mm-hmm. to talk about how you sort of morphed into these huge iconic pieces. I mean, there uh, when you when for a long time you did almost miniatures. Yeah, well, I still like to do that too. Yeah, you do. Uh, yeah. I do. Um, well, I'll start by saying so when I went to graduate school at School of Visual Arts in New York City, and it was. Uh, illustration as visual essay and it was Marshall Arisman and Carl Titola and uh, Marshall Marshall was he's a he's a brilliant artist and w- one thing he noticed is that people that wanted to do editorial art they would kind of be at the service of whatever it was that they were asked to do and Mm -hmm. then burn out after a while running around doing whatever they're asked to do and then driving a truck later or whatever job you know so he would he told us early on just do what you love and if someone asks you to do an illustration for an article in a magazine or you know a book um do what you do and let it fit the the project Find yeah. a way to make it work so that you're never not doing what you don't do. You know, don't give up what you love. Right. And so that was the best piece of advice. And you you know it because it feels feels terrible to have to draw something that doesn't feel fun to draw. So um, I, you know, I, I just would over the years draw and paint what I love painting. And that changes. Um, I've always been really influenced by dreams. Yeah. And. When I was young, I was really influenced also by Edgar Cayce, who was the sort of, he was called the sleeping prophet. Right. Uh, So interesting. And he would go into these sort of trance states, and he was predicting things in the 20s and 30s, you know, that no one really paid that much attention to that we (laughs) all now know. Yeah. So so I would go around saying, you know, through the 80s, through the 90s, oh, there's going to be a pole shift, because he would say the Earth's poles will start to go funny and you can even go on nasa's site now and just see this you know day glow snarl of the magnetic uh 
Right. I don't know all the scientific terms. Well, you terms, can see the changes in the light now you in, can't, in, in our, on our property. You can, you that's can really, interesting. over the last 15 years, you can see the changes, and we remark on that. Oh, that's, yeah. I haven't noticed that, yeah. mm-hmm. besides seasonal yeah. changes. Um, yeah. That's that's kind of spooky. But, you know, and, it, and with it, he said there will be extreme weather events, you know, also mm-hmm. earthquakes, you know, that ring of fire the mm-hmm. in the Pacific uh, going into the Mediterranean, I guess. Um, you know, there's going to be activity and there's there will be and people seem to me to be coming more and more polarized. Uh, and obviously we're very polarized. Mike and I were talking about that earlier. Yeah, today. yeah. Mm-hmm. it's it's sad and hard to watch. Um, the the weather and nature is reflecting it and we are reflecting it. And, yeah. Uh, so about five five years ago, five or six years ago, I started painting uh, a series called Earth Changes. That's uh, the, actually the title of one of Edgar Cayce's books. Um, so, you know, these paintings are about these extreme events, and, and I'm amused by some of it. It's not funny, really, but it's interesting, and there is a little bit of humor sometimes that we grew up with certain terminology about the weather and now it's all different like now when there's a hurricane who is in the cone of uncertainty you know and (laughs) so there's just all this you know stuff and um so i paint those things my hopes are that the paintings will show us a way out um be honest about you know that the paintings will be authentic about what 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 it feels like to be in a polarized situation and maybe to talk more and i definitely i'm so much about the healing arts i use color and line shape and light and form and shadow to hopefully have a healing effect on people i don't want it to ignore that we're feeling anxious so the paintings have a punch Mm -hmm. a little bit but Mm -hmm. i don't want them to also leave us there there are areas one woman at uh, one of the shows she actually was tearful and she said she was looking at the painting this one painting, I don't remember which one it was, and she said, there's always a way out. There's always a way out. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, that's how, you know, moving through the visual landscape, she could find places where there were openings. And, you know, and that that meant a lot to me because you want your art to mean something to people. Right. And so that has has been a really uh, enriching project i've started doing some other things uh now too though that are more i th- i was doing this sort of theme of eve in the garden i i had this idea of my own midrash about uh dreams and yeah. you know who who would have been who who had the first dream what what human being had the first dream and i thought maybe it was eve because you know uh, with all the different ways that we can look at what that story is about, there are so many beautiful perspectives on what Adam and Eve and right. you know Genesis and how all this happened and why and, and what the story is trying to help us understand. Um, the rabbi that I really was impressed by looked at it as um, puberty. It's about puberty. At one point, mm-hmm. you weren't ashamed. You could be naked. You're running yeah. around. Little kid doesn't matter. All of a sudden, you have some responsibility. There, you are. You're a little bit embarrassed right. with your body, and there's some pain. And so sometimes that tree of life that they're standing under with the fruit is considered the tree of knowledge, also because you. It's a time to learn. Yeah. And you, we weren't that aware of that when we were younger. So that's mm-hmm. one way that I really look at it. But still, I thought um, if it was a cataclysmic sort of realization for Eve and Adam, then maybe she had a dream. And maybe the dream, she longed for paradise. Right. Just the way we do. Uh, right. the, usually young adults kind of love to reminisce about oh, remember what we loved when we were seven years old and how we did this and we did that. And, you know, so I think that there, that we do do that. Yeah. And so uh, that's a lot of sort of ethereal, natural, floral kind of stuff that I'm painting. 
Yeah. This is Talk with Tom, Mike and Tom, and I'm Tom Hack, and I'm here with artist and author Elaine Clayton, and we're also going to be talking with her about some of the other work she's doing in the areas of healing and intuitive work. We're located downtown Columbus on First Avenue in the Rothschild Building, CMG Studios. Uh, Elaine, uh, just delighted to hear about how you came to to do those large iconic pieces mm-hmm. also. So uh, I, I know that uh, some of the other things you're doing, and all uh, incidentally, all this is on Illuminara.com. Well, it's actually ElaineClayton.com. ElaineClayton.com. That's your yeah, website. It gets so. hacked now and then. So yeah. just uh, if you find that, I, I am on it. Yeah. So just, uh, yeah. Uh, her, her website, ElaineClayton.com, and you will be able to see first the current art she is doing and also uh, some of the other areas she's working in. Uh, wanted to talk to you a little bit about the uh, what's gotten you a lot of attention, especially as far as uh, what's gotten people interested in your writing here lately is the uh, is the work you're doing as uh, as an intuitive and a, the work you're doing as a healer. Mm-hmm. So you, you want to maybe tackle how, how did that happen? Mm-hmm. Well, I think it started actually in childhood with dreams I had really intense dreams yeah and I won't go into any of the dreams but there was a pivotal one that was that had to do with my mom and dad and dad was kind of the protagonist or was he the antagonist anyway (laughs) he anyway it was a bad dream and I remember this is such a 1960s memory I sort of stumbled out of bed I was probably six years old I might mm-hmm. have been five years old but mm-hmm. don't think for a minute kids don't know all the themes that adults deal with because I had all of that in this dream it's not it's not like they don't get it they do get it they see and watch and feel it so I stumbled out and I was terrified to even express this dream it was such a bad one and my dad and my mom and dad were having a little cocktail party, 1960s style. And I think my dad had a turtleneck on and a blazer. Think and Ad Man. Kind of, yeah. yeah. Or and is it Mad Man? Yeah. I can't remember that. Yeah. yeah. And he was do- making a um, mint julep. No, it was a uh, cream de mint. It had like a f- layer of cream. I'm watching him do this in the parties over there. And he says, oh, what are you doing up? And I said, um, I had a bad dream. And he said, oh, what was it? What was your dream? And I said, I can't tell you. And he said, oh, no, why? And I said, because you'll be mad at me. I'll get in trouble. And he said, no, you can't get in trouble for having a dream. Your dreams, you can't get in trouble for those. And I remember that momentous anxiety as it welled up as I finally blurted out the dream. Mm-hmm. And because he was kind of the bad guy in this dream, he really laughed. He laughed. Uh-huh. But, he, but he gave me the best gift, and, and two gifts. One is he was compassionate and curious as a parent and mm-hmm. as a human being toward me um, with whatever it was I was finding overwhelming. That's very important for us to not ever lose that curiosity in each other, I don't think. Um, Second of all, he let me know that you can't get in trouble for your dreams, that that is an area of you where you are learning and capable of experiencing a serious impact, actually, without it being uh, right here and now where we can get blamed for our choices. This is a different arena of human experience. Yeah. Um, and then the other point is that there's humor. You know what? It felt like the worst dream in the world, but there actually it can be seen as funny too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's a light side to these heavy issues, and it's important to kind of re- realize that and uh, reflect on dreams, and, and they don't let don't let them be so heavy. Don't let them, you know, ruin your day. But it started with that dreams that uh, every morning, sometimes at school, I would feel like the dream was still right here as I grew through high school. It would be, uh, you know, elementary school, junior high, high school. Dreams just were staying with me. So there was no option but to use them because they were so impressive. And at some point, I started to delve more into, into you know, how do you, how do you learn about who God is to you? through your dreams? How do you be a loving person? How do you make correct choices while you uh, allow dreams to 
be messengers, you know, uh, sort of like that. Yeah. Um, and but I didn't want to have the certain bad dreams that I had, so I, I started mm-hmm. to try to play with uh, flying dreams because they were the fun ones. Mm-hmm. And I learned from, you know, different things I was reading that you can, you can do that. You can create dreams you would like to have. Yeah. And I think the Iroquois tribe, they tell their kids, if you have a bad dream and someone's chasing you, you're in control of your dream. So turn around and face them and do whatever you have to do, but never run scared in your dreams. And I found that really empowering. So it started with that. And then... Um, we were always kind of playing at intuition at home because yeah. we had, uh, uh, you know, there were stories about uh, people in the family who had crossed over but came back to visit mm-hmm. quickly and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, wonderful stories. Um, and so there, it just seemed like the quiet knowing that we naturally have was allowed at home. And the surprise... I like that phrase, the quiet knowing. Yeah, because we all have that, you know? Um, And if you have a place at home where you're able to freely uh, admire it, talk about it, wonder at it, marvel at it, happened just yesterday. There was somebody I hadn't thought of in months and for some random reason had thought of yesterday, just a blip of time, and I spent a few moments on it, and then I get a text from that person so these are the common ways that this stuff happens it's it's a quiet knowing where you get synchronistic events that match your thoughts for no reason that you can explain and you're saying you can you can develop that actually you can absolutely develop it you can ignore it usually to your peril though because (laughs) i mean even after all these years of practicing it and helping other people get comfortable with um seeing it as a spiritual level of uh What's the word? It's part of being a spiritual human, you know? I mean, it's sort of engagement with the world. It, with it's your a, soul, yeah. with mm-hmm. your soul. Oh, okay. it's, a, it's a way of knowing. And um, of course, there are a lot of people that do, you know, dark arts. They say, I like to just call it the shadow arts. This, mm-hmm. uh, there, so there's a good reason for being um, careful and, you know, stay away from all that. I don't like that. That's one of the reasons why I write books on this on the idea of spirituality and intuition is because I, people are out there doing damaging things to people. And I thought no one has to go to anyone for advice. You know, we can, you can talk to God yourself, you know, that, that is within you. Yeah. And so, um, you know, those, that's really important to develop that part of yourself rather than ignore it. But even after all these years, I'll have a feeling, oh, I shouldn't do that. Yeah, should I do that? No, I shouldn't do it. Oh, I'll do it. And then, I, and, you know, later I'm like, yep, I knew I shouldn't have done it. If you And, and we've all had that feeling where, where you go, hey, this sort of feels weird and icky. And mm-hmm. then, uh, mm-hmm. as you say, if we ignore that feeling, it, it we ignore it to our own peril, right? Yeah, you, it comes yeah. back to bite you. It yeah, always it seems does. to, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's always a... It's a process. We're never really there. We get as far as we do. We do well some days and not as well other days. You know, I mean, it's just that way. So so people come to you mm-hmm. and ask you to practice your intuitive skills with them relative mm-hmm. to their lives. And you've done done it through painting. You've done it through mm-hmm. through drawing. Talk about that a little bit, how that yeah. came to be actually a practice for you Mm -hmm. along with the healing practices yeah this was interesting so i think around 2007 i started this website at the time it was illuminara.com i just thought the word was very spiritual and i liked it and it wasn't really a word but it resonated and so i used that as the name of my business i Mm -hmm. guess or my enterprise i should say yeah and then i've changed it to elaineclayton.com more recently but I started that site dedicated to the healing arts, artwork for healing and intuitive studies, sort of not in an academic way necessarily at all, but just in my way. And I became a Reiki master, which is, you know, um, an ancient Japanese healing art. Yeah. Um, And it was really kind of it felt strange coming outward with this was a thing that I would do. Anyone who knew me knew I was into all this kind of exploration, but 
becoming, you know, it wasn't really conventional yeah. at the time, even just 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. I think it's funny because now words like being intuitive are on TV commercials. Right. So right. I'm happy. I don't mind being one of the people to kind of help pull all this stuff out there because I think that we want to feel better. We want to be aligned with our higher self, with, you know, a sense of love. And, uh, you know, the world wants that. And I think, so I don't regret that I started telling people, you know, I'll be intuitive with you if you want, you know. Yeah. And uh, and then there's this thing that happened. I mean, I worked with some different psychic groups um, that, that were great for me for the brief time that I was with them. And it was kind of fun because they would test you. Some actress tested me for... California psychics at one point and and it, that was fun for me and she was like mm -hmm. oh you're she said you're this was wonderful you know so it was kind of validating as I stepped out to do this and then the other was uh, CT psychics um, also you know it's just real interesting to be with other people who get what this is and, and that you get a feeling you can help people but then I realized that for my own schedule with my kids and other things I needed to just um you know, be on my own. Yeah. And so a, a call was coming, and I didn't know anything about the person. I was in my studio. I was, I wanted to be really helpful to this person. I always say a prayer before I do a, a reading because the goal is to help the person. Right. Yeah. And so um, I closed my eyes, had a pencil, had my sketchbook, and I just sort of drew randomly. Yeah with my non-dominant hand and I looked at this drawing and I was I was thinking wow and I started seeing things in the drawing I couldn't believe what I was seeing and it's it's actually in the book making marks yeah. discover the art of intuitive drawing um, that first drawing changed everything uh, I, I should have marked that page so we could get to it but maybe I can do it later and we can we'll be able to pull it up um, the so what I saw in this scribble that most people would throw away, calling mm -hmm. it a scribble or a doodle, mm -hmm. right, was what looked to me like a grandmother, and maybe she had some uh, IV and maybe some breathing tubes. It looked very hospitally, and mm -hmm. I'm thinking, whoa. And then um, she only had one leg, and I mm -hmm. thought, how am I going to say that to this person? That <laughs> right, is that is, so... that's sort of hard to bro uh, yeah. broach that, right? Yeah, but what I've learned with all this is trust what comes, and you're not, you don't have to, you're not God, you don't have to be a guru, just trust what arrives, and if it has meaning for someone, that's what you want. You want it to have meaning. If it doesn't, you move on. You, there are a million ways to look at a drawing. You know that as an artist, right? Yep. So I... Um, you know, she called and I said, hey, can I just tell you I'm an artist and I was saying a prayer for you before this, uh, <laughs> before you called. And can I just tell you what I saw in this drawing? I mean, I don't know if it means anything to you or not. So she said, yeah, sure, go ahead. So I actually credit her for being so open minded. Yeah. yeah. And I said, you know, um, there's this grandmother. She's in the hospital and she's got breathing tubes, but um, she only has one leg. And this young woman said. They did take my grandmother's leg in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And I thought, no way. This yeah. was just, I, this was a nothing thing. Yeah. And then there was another way to look at the drawing that was important too. And I told her that that also checked out. And I thought, okay, a big thing is happening. Yeah. First of all, we live in this big capitalist society where everywhere you turn, there's someone to tell you that you don't have enough and what you do have isn't valid or just buy my stuff, okay? Your hair isn't thick enough, your <laughs> lashes aren't long enough, you're overweight, whatever it is, it's using visual imagery to smack us hard and get us to feel like as bad as we could so we will spend our money on the thing that's supposed to save the day. Well, here I was with a drawing that was a nothing thing in some ways and super profound in another way at the service of actually strengthening someone's yeah. core rather than uh, ripping them off or even not that, pro I mean, we all need products. I need I needed my dress today. I, right. I, yeah, right? Yeah. Not totally knocking it and I'm not 
you know, anti-capitalism exactly, I don't think. I don't even want to yeah. get into that. I mean, <laughs> we're in it. I love it. Hey, yeah. I sell my art and books. Yeah, right. But I think that we could be more conscious of the effect and the impact of visual imagery on us and also know that what you need in order to heal or to feel better or to have your dreams come true is not hard. It's not something you have to go get. It's not something you have to effort. It's not something you have to die for necessarily. Even like I said in my early 20s, I would have rather died than get published. I had to go make it happen. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't necessarily have to do things that way. Yeah. But I at that time thought I did. And maybe maybe at times we need to learn how to do boot camp. But at the same time, I think that we can use very simple methods to actually give each other a lot of support and to change our lives. It's not hard. So you you, you receive quite a bit of interest for with making marks, and I know mm -hmm. uh, uh, there there are a lot of people interested in that whole idea of art being a, a two, and maybe even a three way street where you have all these different things happening communication wise. Mm -hmm. You're working on a new project, and it uh, it's sort of a book series, uh, a little bit of angels, a little bit of well, fairies. Well, actually, yes. Um, this is with Sterling, and it's a beautiful little series. I'm not the only author in this series. There are all, all these wonderful authors. So this series is called A Little Bit Of, and the first one I did was A Little Bit Of Angels. I absolutely was in total heaven making that book. Um couldn't have been happier. And then I was so lucky they asked me to do, would you do a little bit of fairies too? And I said, yes, <laughs> Yeah, I will. right. And so that was really interesting because on the one hand we have angels and we have this rich uh, Judeo-Christian history in the Western world. I'm, I'm not that knowledgeable about all the different uh, places in, on earth that have a concept of angels, but very rich, beautiful uh, history to draw from. And then our own personal experiences and stories and thoughts and, you know, um, ideas about what angels are. And then you have fairies. And so, and sometimes there seems to be a very, um, almost a power struggle with uh, pagan, you know, the idea of uh, notions of, of there being elves and fairies and sprites right, and stuff yeah. like that in the natural world, probably yeah. because the natural world is a little scary. It does stuff we can't control. Yeah. Uh, so, but yet God created it. So it's not a fairy isn't going to be exactly like an angel, but a fairy has her job. So when you look at a flower, you see a beautiful flower, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Imagine being the carer of the life source that fills that flower. You only know a, f a flower only knows to bloom and be beautiful. It knows no other. And then it does fade and die, but in its peak, it knows only to be beautiful, right? So I discovered through my own meditations and dreams that that is what the fairies are like. And you know, when you watch, well, you do yard work, right? Mm -hmm. you, you know, that vine's trying to strangle that one, trying to do that tree in, trying to do, oops, sorry, that yeah. tree in. And, uh, you know, I realized, yeah, because whoever, the spirit of life that is in, that vine, every little atom of it, is going to fight for it to live, just like we're supposed to live strong, too, you know? And uh, was that from the Talmud? Every blade of grass has an angel whispering, grow, grow. Mm -hmm. Everything out there is, is burgeoning with that beautiful life source. Yeah. I think from God, that's how I see it. It is It is creation happening creation didn't happen and now we're just dealing with it it is constantly happening so there are spirits within nature that uh you know they're out there now would i go out and say start playing with elves i really wouldn't because i think from dreams i've had they're a scrappy bunch i really <laughs> wouldn't do that um i nor would i um I guess think that you know I can get fairies to do my bidding for me or something like that. I don't I don't know about any of that. I just enjoy that nature has its job. There is a spiritual essence in everything alive out there. Yeah.
Yeah. Well, th- this series has been very well received, and I know you're you're getting a lot of interest with that. Uh, I'm with uh, Elaine Clayton. Her website, elaineclayton.com, where you can see her art, you can see her books, you can see what we're going to talk about in this final segment, which is the the card she's doing, and they're, they're cards she's developed that feature her art and also her creative ideas. You want to talk a little bit about those? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, um, you know, when I was doing the, um, actually before what, you know, the drawing that I said that I used that turned out to be really meaningful to the client that I had on the phone, uh, that, that was very intuitive and it, all it was was a two second thing. That, at that same era of time, again, I was realizing the impact that visual imagery has on us. Now, this isn't new to me. I've thought it for as long as I can remember, especially doing art you think a lot professionally as an artist you're going to have to be responsible as as much as you can about how your imagery might affect people Uh, you can't control that but you have to be responsible for what you're trying to say at least and um, then let it go do what it does but um, my personal philosophy for all these years as an as an adult has been that we're really affected by visual stimuli I think you know we don't get a chance to process how this stuff affects us though wherever we go we're highly visual and and we don't we just move through the day we're busy we don't have time to think you know how did that brick wall affect me but actually most things do have an impact so Mm -hmm. i decided i would take um images from a lot of art that i've done over the years and just create a deck of cards and they're large in this first book on intuition uh, it's called Illuminara Intuitive Journal. So I also love it for people to journal because then you're having a conversation. You're going to that quiet place. Um, you could just be complaining when you do your journaling, but maybe it needs to get out. And then after you do it for a while, you start actually asking questions and you start allowing answers and it can be interesting. Um, so Illuminara Intuitive Journal with these large image cards is designed so that you turn a card over, maybe you do them at random, you just pick one at random, and then you look at the imagery and you actually spend a few moments thinking about how it impacts you. Um, does it remind you of anything? We have really strong memories and we have really strong associations the way our brains, you know, group things together and you know for us to understand things and and it's we're very unique so we have uh what jung called the collective unconscious and we have the personal so if i said to you let's say we were we had one of those cards in front of us and you you had a picture of an apple we would agree that we uh know what an apple is you know what an apple is i know what an apple is but if i asked you to write about your impressions, memories, feelings, anything, even random things that don't really make sense, but they come to mind. If you were to write all that stuff down in the journal, you would then be able to share with me, and it would be very different from yeah. my first memory of an apple. Like, can, do you have any childhood memories of an apple? Oh, sure, yeah. Name one. Just uh, name one. Well, I, I can remember uh, bobbing for apples in South America. Okay, now that's cool, because yeah. my early memory is also bobbing for apples in texas wow and the, and funny. i didn't expect you to bob but like Isn't i that was funny yeah. yeah and it hurt my teeth i didn't like yeah. i'm sticking my face and in this cold water and icky other people have been in it and yeah, yeah, I, all what this, were the mom's uh, thinking yeah right you know, yeah. it was supposed to be a yeah. fun party my tooth hurts Ugh. yeah i wasn't digging it yeah <laughs> So, but you're, see, I could spend a long time talking to you. Well, tell me about South America. What kind of apples do they have there? I mean, we start going places. That's right. The important part of it is is uh, you being able to enjoy your own experience with whatever in, had an influence on you, and in this case, an apple in South America, and then me being able to share that with you. And then when you... Allow me to hear about your memory and your impression of what an apple means. I'm actually valuing you. That sounds like a a great way to get in touch with yourself and your own feelings and how you construct meaning about events and all kinds of things. Absolutely, I'm and with others and to appreciate others. Yeah, if you if you do it say in a group you learn Mm -hmm. a lot about each other what a great yeah or you just one-on-one you know yeah yeah 
Yeah. So, uh, so that was the first um, book using visual imagery to access yeah. intuitive um, knowing, and uh, then the making marks. And I call that stream drawing. Yep. Uh, we I don't call it doodling. I think doodle is a non-word. It sounds silly. Mm-hmm. This profound thing is kind of happening. Okay, it might let you draw freely because it's a non-word, so that when you're on the phone, you can do it and not, there's no pressure on you. That part's beautiful about it. Yeah. The ugly part is when you throw that thing away or you don't value it because no one valued your marks. So I think, you know what? That's People need to make marks. It's a very yeah. natural, innate instinct. The cavemen did it. Cave women too, I'm sure. Uh, and we need to do it. Babies do it. Mm-hmm. It's not something we should stop yeah. doing. Yeah. Um, and actually, we should value it and find ways. So, I call it stream drawing because you're kind of entering the unconscious, and it's like the stream of unconsciousness flow that comes easily when we dream because we can't help it. It's just happening. Um, but you can allow that same flow to actually actually to be aware of it. I think it's never really gone. It's right here, right? But you can make space and time to be aware of it, and you will be more conscious of why you do things. Why did right. you get in that relationship? Yeah. Why did you uh, choose that job you hate? Mm-hmm. Or why did you? Uh, why do you want a, a different thing to do with your time or whatever? You know, you get to the root of things, and it and it really helps make um, choices that you feel more aligned and happy about. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And so, you can forgive people because you can actually explore ha- all the stuff you learned, and then you know be thankful for some of the hardest things even. But you then own your own responsibility for some of the reasons why you unconsciously let this or that happen. Right. It allows us to think about how we construct meaning from these events, too. Yeah, we uh, need A lot to. of it has to, has to do with how you construct meaning and what meaning you construct. Absolutely. I think yeah. it's about meaning. I think yeah. it is about, it's about what do things mean to me? How do I feel in awe of the world and not then know what things mean to me? It kind of goes hand in hand. There are so many projects that you're working on and have been working on and you and you're creative in so many areas it's uh, unusual to to talk with someone who does this many different things usually folks have an area where they're really uh really strong but you 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 have these multiple talents so i guess my question Thank would be you. <laughs> you've recently made a transition to georgia from mm-hmm. connecticut mm-hmm. What's next for you now in the d- working out of the Atlanta area, Atlanta, yeah. Georgia? It's fun to there. come home. I yeah. think of the South as home in so many ways. Yeah, um, yeah that was an interesting thing because it was the, ch- the children flew the nest, the birds flew the <laughs> nest, you know. And so I thought, well, how do I do this next era and um, without sort of – slumping into despair because my kids aren't there right right that was mm-hmm. that's a big deal to raise two kids and then all of a sudden you really have a different pattern you know a, another door is opening and so I thought what is it I would want what would my ideal be and wherever we ever moved I always had a studio whether it's in a corner somewhere or a room or in the barn or whatever it was mm-hmm. there was a studio and um I'm real grateful for that. And uh, I thought, you know, I just want to live in my studio. I want to get up. I don't want to have to go somewhere. I want to get up and it's right there. Uh, if I want to do some artwork before I go to sleep, it's right there. So um, this just kind of fell into place. Like this is part of that stream of consciousness flow. When something is effortless and it's attached to something you feel drawn to, yeah. that you have a lot of a good feeling about positive feeling about it doesn't hurt to just allow that flow you know it's like they say don't ever try to row up river yeah upstream you know because you can't it's just not gonna you're not you're gonna be tired and it's you're gonna be weary and it's not gonna work so i just sort of put my boat in and all these doors open totally easily yeah sure come here we have a place available there's never a place available at this one place and hardly uh-huh. and I, so i was like hmm, this is very interesting yeah. and the people are nice they're not saying hurry up and decide or anything there was nothing aggressive right. and so i got myself to atlanta 
And Georgia has a real soothing love vibe, if you ask me. Mm -hmm. I now I I give credit to Martin Luther King, Doctor Reverend Doctor Martin Luther King Jr. because mm -hmm. I think that he put an umbrella of love mm -hmm. over the city of Atlanta and mm -hmm. the state of Georgia has a quality about it. There, are, there's also a lot of hard history and all that too. So there, there's layers, but. Um, I am soothed by it, uh, even though we've had no rain this summer, uh, maybe once. Right. Uh, so um, we're sort of in a big drought, but it's it's still, to me, almost subtropical. The, mm -hmm. the uh, crepe myrtles stay in bloom all the time. Right. You know, you yeah. might wear flip-flops in December and all that. Yeah, so I'm in there and uh, just being soothed for this point in time. I don't really know what's next, but I am doing the work I love, and that matters. I'm not so sure how smart it is to have so many irons in the fire, but I do, I do love writing. Uh, I do love, of course, painting, and um, I do love helping people. Yep. So it's so doing those are your three things. Pretty much. Yeah. The healing arts, uh, visual, fine art, yep. and... Uh, and you know writing it, it's cyclical um the thing that never goes away is help you know the the intuitive stuff um with with clients yes. and um doing visual artwork almost never wanes but writing kind of comes and goes so again i go with the flow i try not to force anything it's really hard to get a book out usually though yeah yeah oh it's it's like you know it's like anything good it, you got to suffer a little so it's not only blissful there's some you know but when you love what you're doing and you and you love what you have to say or you believe in it and you yeah. think the world will be a little bit better for you know i'm not trying to say i have an ego and i have the answer but i mean in our way we have this one chance right now to give the world the best that we can give and through this work that's what i feel like i'm doing I'm trying to do that. And there are countless ways in which I could be way better. One of the most important things is taking this um, stream drawing stuff to um, people to do, you know, in small groups and large groups. I was at a, a place for um, kids at risk, you know, young adults actually yep. at risk, yep. uh, may, uh, maybe a month ago, Covenant House. and Right, um, right, yeah. This room of gorgeous young adults, who knows what hardships they've faced, mm -hmm. they got it immediately. They could close their eyes, draw with their non-dominant hand, make a drawing, not even questioning, go in, do stuff with it, see things in it, have conversations about what those things meant. I was completely blown away. Um, you realize when you have the idea that you might help people, really they may be helping you because these people, as young as they were, were so composed and so creative and so empathic, like natural empathy yeah. just coming out of them. But I like doing those kinds of things. I've done workshops with kids and adults my whole career, especially as a visiting author in schools and things like that but i i my idea is uh you know taking the stuff that, whatever it is uh, that i'm doing and using it with um groups and individuals so. back in atlanta georgia where your career began so yeah these, i'll do these, it anywhere i do yeah. it i i'd still go anywhere to do those yeah. things though. but yeah at, right now home base is atlanta so yeah well i'm here with uh elaine clayton i want to thank you her uh website elaineclayton.com where you can see all about her work and get in touch with elaine too she she will uh respond to your inquiries and uh i i sure enjoyed talking with you Thank and you. uh and it was good catching up because yeah. uh uh, as as long as I followed your career, I, I still kind of lost track of some of the things you're doing right now. So uh, well, thank you for being here with you. with me and Mike Baltimore, who thank you so uh, much is, for having me. Uh, Mike's uh, doing the producing today. Thank you, Mike, for doing the producing. Oh, I you're think very this welcome. Is, you guys did a great job. Yeah. Uh, it's very interesting podcast. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank Elaine. you again. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so what's, what's on your mind these days, my friend? 
We were just talking about the cruise as we began this. So, uh, <laughs> we were. We were. Uh, just wanted to kind of go. <laughs> say, uh, yes, Dr. Sean Cruz, and uh, he was here in the studio. He did a fantastic job toward explaining to the rest of us about quantum physics and how the sun works. Mm. Things like that. It's mm. not a ball of fire. Mm. And he's uh, he, he has his love of Tiny Tim. I think he is no, probably one of the. I remember that part. He, he is a uh, a real fan, a super fan of Tiny Tim. I don't know if you realize this, but he I has a not. ukulele signed by Tiny Tim. He does. Okay. Yes. Uh, well, he may have. And, but and people I don't, don't realize this, but Tiny Tim also had um, a problem with um, with uh, wetting himself. He had bladder control. Okay. Um, okay. Sean has a, a oh, diaper. Oh, Sean, are you just trying to say or implying <laughs> yes. that... Uh, he has a signed Tiny Tim diaper. <laughs> this is not good because... No, no, it's if good. If this it's goes good. out, I mean, Sean's going to hear this and... Uh, no, no, he's a super fan. I think For this some is good. reason, I'm the one that gets in trouble about all this. You can say anything, but, uh, but uh, I'm the one that takes the hit. So uh, our apologies uh, to Sean right at the start here. Um, love this guy. Actually, he is the best, uh, and uh, I'm so glad he's coming in the studio. He's going to keep I'll coming what, in the studio. We're gonna his have presence here actually overshadowed, because I don't know if you realize this, but uh, we, lock, we lost Rick Okasik. Yes. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, Jeff and I were talking about that, uh, and a couple of uh, other friends of mine. I mean, it had an impact on, mm -hmm. and also Eddie Money. If you remember, there you go. Um, uh, and that happened. He cashed so. in one of those tickets to Paradise, is what I hear. Uh, yeah, <laughs> he finally cashed in that <laughs> ticket. All right, that's uh, that's nice. So um, mm -hmm. that 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 makes a difference. I mean, um, this week also, um, Ke uh, a Kim Burns says is. Um, a series on country music. It is just started true. a documentary. Yes. Yes. And I think they've played like. It's uh, funny. Eight I just uh, it so far. I, I listened to, to just like ten or fifteen minutes of that, and suddenly I was attracted to my sister. What's that about? Okay, all right. <laughs> See, I don't know. I don't know how we get like that turned so quickly. Uh, but I'm gonna I'm gonna keep uh, having to respond. <laughs> Evidently, that somehow that's become my job. Um, I'm not sure if I signed up for that, but. Um, actually, it was a great documentary. Uh, the last half of it starts this Sunday on mm -hmm. our Georgia public television stations here, and um, it was really interesting. But the point I was going to make about mm -hmm. that was that... Rick Ocasek did country music? Is that what we're going No, I mean, we're not going down that road. <laughs> what I was going to say is that a lot of stars, even rock stars, but also country stars, died at an early age. Hank Williams at 29 there years of age. Yes. Um, uh, Patsy Cline, of course, in a, a, a plane accident and some of the others. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, mm -hmm. it was an interesting topic. I was just fascinated about why it had such an impact with this with Ocasek and um, Eddie Money this week. Well, I'm, I'm, I, and I, I can't, I don't want to speak ill of Eddie Money, but I suspect yeah. Ocasek's uh, passing probably cast a larger shadow. I think so. <laughs> but, I would uh, think so, yes. I, I think Ocasek is, uh, was interesting because um, I, I really didn't think much about the cars. But there've been all these retrospectives and whatnot, and they, they, they had a lot of songs that made it on the radio. And I kept of thinking, course. these things were soundtracks to my existence in lots of ways. And right. and um, you can think about it. It's the, one of the one of the radio guys was talking about this. We're losing the 20th century, so all right. these folks are beginning to fade. Lou Reed, uh, we can begin to, and they're all starting to die. This is, you know. Yeah, there's a there's a it's a change that affects us all, and we I, I, that's a good point that you made. The idea that we're not really sure just how much impact in our life, and sort of that mm -hmm. background that's always mm -hmm. going, and we accept it. Mm -hmm. The idea too that that the music from the the '60s and and '70s and so forth um, are still ar around. They're they're at the uh, shopping malls. They're at the grocery mm -hmm. store. They're 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 ubiquitous they're the as it were. As a and I know that's a a ploy to get you to stay in the store longer and buy more merch but um mm. i'm i'm just uh I'm, i'll I'm tell you what about that uh whenever i'm in uh, walmart and they're cranking up that bad company song feel like making love <laughs> i buy a lot of you know s uh, school supplies and cat food it's <laughs> like you know <laughs> but um bum yeah. but um bump and suddenly i'm like you know i've got more items in my cart okay i think that is actually <laughs> true and there's probably some um psychology experiments we can pull to say that as yeah, an that's aside, why they're doing that. Exactly. Th th this is a true story. There was a uh, one of the um, uh, one of the ice cream trucks. It cruises around. Uh, I used cruise again. Uh, yeah, I, I love it. I love it. I, uh, when, well, I love when a plan comes together. <laughs> but uh, it, you know, and it's cruising around the um, lake bottom. You know that they, they have the songs they play. Right. The, right. You know, usually it's like that. Pop goes the 
people. Goes away. It's it's very ch- childlike. They were playing that early. bad company song, "Feel Like Making Love." <laughs> but but I just didn't. I didn't That's know what not to do. for the ice cream truck. Okay, um, I didn't know what that you know. I don't. I don't know, but um, it hey, seems to be a favorite of yours for some reason. But. Hey, when you talk about uh, you know like us losing, like so many so many folks have died for sixties have died. You know, but there's going to be some major ones. I, I think when Jim Morrison dies, man, that's really okay. Let me. Really um, I'm sorry to um, break the news to you. Uh, but Was that yes, uh, uh, you can visit his grave? Uh, so. No, no way, no yes, way. Yes, absolutely. To Jim Morrison, I thought you. That guy was. You could look at that guy. He was a picture of health. Well, how did he? How did he uh, I, I'm, I, I think the big breakthrough will be when Keith Richards dies because evidently he can't uh, die. He, he actually has died he, several times. <laughs> Let's be honest. That guy is. <laughs> he's uh, Whatever you can uh, do to your body, he's done it a couple of three times. I think so, it's, uh, uh, somebody was telling me that he, on at least more than once he's had a complete blood transfusion. That they literally... Is that true? It's true. That literally, oh I'm not goodness. making that up. Oh, yeah. Oh, and he, he had a concussion crazy. from falling out of a coconut tree. I don't know if that was that long ago. That was like about 10 years ago. He, <laughs> what was he doing in a coconut tree? But I, uh, that's another, that's another story not, altogether. I'm not sure what... I had a, 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 a friend in graduate school who was a huge, huge Stones fan. And always tell me stories about, you know, yeah. Keith and his, his exploits. Yeah. And, uh, and he's a, a fabulous musician. He knows history of music. I mean, the guy is uh, still smart and talented and moving mm-hmm. and going pretty at a pretty good clip. Well, he said if you've ever watched a, a live Stone show, he plays like like nine notes the whole show. Cause right. It's, it's not a... Well, that, I mean, that may be all he needs. Uh, I mean, it is. It may, I'm sure it is. But like, if you look, really look everybody that. else is playing, and he's occasionally you know doing like a riff and then stopping for about five minutes, and he does it again. I mean, that guy, that guy is... <laughs> and you know, he's making money, so there we go. I'm making lots of money. Which, by the way, I think the um, um, Metallica now has the um, they've made the most um, of a uh, of a tour. I think they made one point something billion they hit for a, for a tour. So that they they now wow. officially have made the most of any touring act. I think. Yeah, it's, uh, that's a that's a interesting to kind of look at what uh, how much money you can make now as opposed to the days uh, before. Uh, making a reference back to the country music days when uh so um listen man uh what's on your mind uh today well, i mean what is our topic we're going to help well some I, folks i'll be honest i keep thinking about tiny tim so okay. that's, that's See, obviously not what we need to no, uh, that, that, talk about so. but it, uh, it sounds like it sounds to me like you may know more than you actually know but i don't know if that's about, true or not well, about actually, Tiny Tim. About yeah. a lot of, and this, I think this is an attempt to lure us into our uh, our topic today. Uh, it's, it's called a is, segue, and yeah. evidently that wasn't a very good one, but uh, I tried well, anyway. Speaking of segues, those things didn't take off. They okay, were supposed to, but they, they were not. You know, that the inventor of, of that and owner of the country went off a cliff uh, really? on a segue and died. No way, that, did that really happen? That, that's a true story. Look that, that one is, up. Yeah, he did. He went off so, that. Well, that would, you know, I have. Uh, <laughs> doesn't say much for the product, though. Uh, but well, it was supposed to be there. the next big thing, you know. We were supposed to, instead of jetpacks, we got that. So um, uh, no, it didn't work out. <laughs> we, we didn't get jetpacks. So we, we're thinking about what we're talking about today. We're talking about the um, those uh, Keurigs, those um, those really <laughs> no, cool I, that Swedish. Was my, that was my that was my joke to you, uh, or, or attempt at a joke uh, to you about our topic today. Uh, yeah, it's the uh, so really the Dunning is Keurig. If, is it? Let uh, I me mean, pronounce it right. Dunning. Not Keurig. Kruger. <laughs> Kruger. That's right. Dunning Kruger effect. Okay. I'm like, glad I could help there for just a minute. Because I got really confused with the Keurig. You coffee or something. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So it's the Dunning Keurig effect. All no, right. All no, right. No, it's Dunning. <laughs> what is it? Dunning. All right. Are we going to have to look this up? Uh, Hold uh, on. Wait, we got, Kruger. We got to, Kruger, Kruger, I think. Dunning Kruger effect. Dunning yes, Kruger effect. Yes. That's where we're at. All and, right. And, glad we could help. <clears throat> Right, and so we, we, we were talking about this. And yeah, this, what is this stuff anyway? Well, I mean, you, I you were know. telling me because I, I actually didn't know some of the backstory, but it was it's it's um it's based on a a guy who robbed a couple of banks, right? And he put um he put uh, lemon juice lemon juice on his place. face yeah. because he had uh, was 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 certain that this would do to his face what it does to um 
Um, invisible ink. Invisible ink. I'm gonna help out. Yeah. There you go. Because yeah, right. The invisible mm -hmm. ink. And the, as kids, you know, coming up, we had that. You, you did could, the, uh, you'd write with it, and then you could. Yeah. See, you, know, so. you had a sad childhood. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was. <laughs> Don't think of it. Another topic, for another day. That's but, right. <laughs> but uh, <it's>, oh, <laughs> thanks actually, for reminding me. <laughs> as an aside, this <laughs> may not be up. something I should right, I should say, but this actually happened this morning. This happened oh, yeah. this morning. Oh, yeah. My son hasn't taken a shower in a while, and. I got up this morning and I, I smelled him and I said, son, son you need a shower. Get the shower now. And I said, he said, what's wrong? I said, you smell. He said, he doesn't. And I literally said this to him. I said, if it were possible for a lemon to have diarrhea, that's what you smell like. <laughs> 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 but, right. that, that's I, funny. But he, did, he wasn't. Now, he said, I don't. Meaning that he did not smell himself. In this, <laughs> he did not. Right? So, and, yeah, but right, here's right. the other thing about this. I went to open his door to see if he was up. And I could smell right. him before I opened the door. Okay, through the door. All right. That's, <laughs> and, that's a sign. And I told him that's when I sign. opened the door, two of our downstairs plants died. That's how bad he smelled. <laughs> All right. But, yeah, but is, he was unaware. I keep going back. Was, but yeah. He was. And he and hopefully my wife right now has coaxed him into the shower or, right, right, or something. Or, or there's something, a fire hose outside or something. something. We need, but, need some help. But th th this in some ways does, doesn't relate to it. By the way, when topic. he sees this later, <laughs> in his, you know, this, might, this, if it goes on the web, it's there forever. So, <laughs> so maybe, as, maybe when he'll he's see an it. old man, he'll look back and he'll and see it. And it wasn't there true. He did literally smell bad. But. So this uh, Dunning-Kruger effect, no, Dunning-Kruger effect. I'm yes. going to get this Keurig no, thing. No, I see. I, I, I threw that at you early. To try and, <laughs> and now it's stuck in my... It's stuck. Yeah. yeah. Sorry well, about the, that. Well, this thing, so, so what's key to this, right, is this notion of certainty. Right. And, and, and what it captures is the notion that folks who... Um, and I think one of the studies that sort of got into prominence had to do with um, what they were... They tested some undergraduates, and they asked them, like, how good they were at grammar or were they good with math things like that right and the individuals who um were more certain of how good they were or how well they did on a task i think right. they gave them a test tended to actually do poorer right and they were able to sort of rate the degree at which they were off in terms of you know whereas folks who did well on the test uh, rated themselves slightly lower okay so, so the poor let me see if i've got that the 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 people who did poorest on the test rated themselves higher. Right. And the ones who did fairly well mm. rated themselves a little lower. Right. And so so okay. there you know, so there, there literally is and so there's there there's a way in which um there is a certain assurance and certainty that um that get, and, and there was a related and we don't know we're not supposed to get political here, but there was a related right. uh, um study where they uh folks who watched uh, cable news networks, particularly Fox. Right. And often, Fox folks who watched a certain percentage of Fox a day, fairly significant, rated their knowledge on politics, um, uh, controversial things like evolution and evolution of biological stuff and all that sort of stuff. They tended to rate themselves really high on those. And guess what? They tended to be really, really missed. Uh, 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 their, their expertise was quite absent. Right, right. And they found that, you know, all cable news um, have generated some bias, but there was something about Fox News in particular mm -hmm. that sort of generated this effect. Right. And so we can see it in the political landscape, and we could even see, and um, again, we're not supposed to get political on this, but uh, there's some interesting studies by uh, Drew Weston out of Emory, and there have been a few others too, that there's something specific about, say, um, a conservative mindset that might lend itself if you're not careful. Both extremes can can fall prey to this. They can they can right. sort of be um, undone by their certainty. But because um, the conservative mindset is built to some degree on um, on certainty and a, um, a a less openness to new experience because that's one of the things we see in okay. uh, when we're sort of we're looking at the psychological makeup of certain political stances so right. an openness Open to, to compared to yeah. closed right maybe, and so you literally see they tend to be a bit more um um they can be trapped by this if they're not careful right mm -hmm. So in a way, it's, it sounds like this uh, Dunning-Kruger effect, um, uh, as a result of uh, hearing about this bank robber with the lemon, started these studies, and you mm -hmm. just mentioned some of those where um, made some comparisons. 
it's almost across the board that we rate ourselves better on just about everything. Mm-hmm. I've heard the survey about the drivers. Everybody mm-hmm. rates themselves as above average driver when we we know that's Well, not if true, everybody right? was above average, then that would literally break <laughs> statistical law, right? So there's no there's no uh, but, somebody's got to suck. But there there's um I mean this this is really a kind of a problem though. Mm-hmm. If I don't know much information, but I'm certain I know all of this information, I mean that sounds mm-hmm. like a Problem. Well, it's interesting because any if this is pervasive, we are, then have to step back and ask ourselves, uh, how is it adaptive? Because if it is if it is right. part of our um, our cognitive hardware, um, then then it it has to have some purpose. And my guess is is that, um, and I haven't looked into this much, and there's, I'm sure there are people who've, who've explored this far more. But I would I, w- I would make the assumption that it. That it probably has at least short-term gain. Okay. That I mean, I can imagine in some ways, and just in terms of um, um, sexual selection, you know, the peacock that really thinks it's the most handsome peacock right. is going to generate enough swagger to get by. Right. Maybe. Right. <laughs> maybe. Right. And uh, you know, the uh, if you are um, if the lion is coming at you, and you in your heart think you can take it. You might bluff just enough to convince the, the the tiger that you are something that that it shouldn't bite, right. and so maybe it runs the other way. So okay. ma- maybe yeah. there yeah. are some survival elements to this. Okay, so might, in a way you're reframing that a little bit to say, hey, it might be positive, but it but it is in, in a certain extent uh, extent because it's uh, ego boosting. Mm-hmm. If I can convince myself I know all of this stuff and I'm really uh, well versed on all of this. Maybe that might give me a little advantage when I go into unknown situations or other situations at sense of bluster, as you called it. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's uh, it's interesting, but we all have that, mm-hmm. so it's uh, it's almost like it should be somewhere in the middle that we balance. Is uh, another way to put it is we can really objectively evaluate ourselves. Well, well, there could be that that, it, that it's possible that um, one of the cures for this, or that if if it is something that all of us are guilty of to some degree. When we uh, move closer to the possibility of expertise, I know you were talking last time about that 10,000-hour 10, thing. Mm-hmm. Maybe if we move toward closer toward um, our area of expertise, maybe um, it uh, we, we have a propensity for having it less. Mm-hmm. So if if you are um, truly assured through um, through through study and through practice. Then you are going to be um, probably able to rate yourself um, a little closer. In okay. fact, maybe uh, tend toward under appreciating right. your skills. I, I mean, that's a trend, <clears throat> isn't it? <throat> the people who are really expert <clears throat> at ideas uh, and their field, discipline, so forth, don't uh, evaluate themselves accurately, maybe even a little less than. <clears throat> Okay, that's kind of an interesting idea. But here, also, I think if we if we think about this from what we talked about um, uh, the last time or maybe the time before, um, this notion of the tyranny of automaticity and this notion of cognitive bias, because in some right. ways this is a subcategory of cognitive bias, and so it okay. um, there is there is something about um, not having to think. It, it, in right. some ways, this this um, this keeps us. From having to invest the energy and time, we are simply assured, and then we move forward. And that's an interesting thing. I think it, you know, it's um, not only does it scratch an itch and serve a purpose, but um, uh, it. Um, there's a character by the John Hodgman play. I don't know if you John know John Hodgman. He was he was on uh, Colbert and. The Daily Show. Oh a lot. yes, yes, the old comedian. Yeah. Okay, I've got he's, it. Yeah, he's yeah, the guy yeah. who would always yeah. say he's the smartest man in the world, or, <laughs> and he would often they would ask him he questions. He was the guy that did the uh, uh, PC commercial, the Mac. Yeah, he PC did. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I remember. And that, yeah. they would ask him a question, and he would sort of, you know, he would just begin to BS, and but he would be so assured, and he would have this this air of being, you know, he knows what he's talking about. When in fact he he didn't know what he was talking right. about. <laughs> and I think about he's sort of a wonderful example of this sort of like, you know. This, uh, this, um, but you can also think in terms of um, there's a concept by I think I mentioned this guy before, Wilfred Bion. Okay. I talked about him. We sort of talked about it a time or two before. Sure. That Bion's notion is that we really, in our heart of hearts, we don't want to think. 
thinking is difficult. It brings right. with it, um, um, you know, uh, our existential brothers and sisters talk about how there is a price to be paid for awareness. Right. Right. So it contradicts some of your beliefs. It's right. in conflict with there what is. you've been carrying around and so forth. Yeah. And, and, and so Bion has this notion of what he calls positive and negative K. And positive knowledge and negative knowledge. Okay. And he said there's a way in which we can know something, and by knowing it, we actually are even remain ignorant. Okay. And so in politics and religion and in certain, you know, um, one wonderful example is, and I don't know how much of these folks are just trolling, but the flat earth folks. Right. Yeah. Who literally believe. I mean, it's a growing group <laughs> for some reason. That I'm the not world sure is flat. That. <laughs> and, but notice how that's a wonderful example of negative K, of you're, you, you knowing that the earth is flat keeps you from being open to anything else. It's literally a, no, a, it's a knowing something right. that literally keeps you from picking up any other knowledge. It cancels out everything right. else that might inform you. Yeah, okay, and it's, and if you think about that from sort of a, if, if Beyond's equation is right, there's, that there has to be a moment of catastrophe for a real thought. So you can almost imagine like the flat earther, all the information is piling up and there's a certain point at which the flat earther can no longer sort of keep it at bay. And then suddenly their, their idea of the earth being flat gives way and they're flooded with all these things they then have to make sense of. And right. that requires a thought. That requires them actually being able to think this thing and then do something with it. Now, uh, yeah, so I, I, I'm thinking that, okay, that's too much information for me. We say that a lot to people for some reason. Mm. But when Usually people, when, I, when I talk about, like, you know, my uh, <laughs> Tiny Tim. Okay, or, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 no, we're used to it around here. Here's, the, here's Or that, the, that new tattoo okay. I got. That is probably some okay. TMI, I'm just saying, yeah. No, there's no tattoo. All right, so what, what, I don't, I've forgotten what we were going to say. But, but, <laughs> but the idea of all that information, you suddenly have to juggle it, make sense out of it, and that's a lot of work. It's almost like uh, some of the things we're talking about here, that, those concepts. We're, we're lazy in our thinking. We don't want to have to do this, or as Bian may put it, the, the negative knowledge thing. But, and he also has this idea that's, that's rather interesting, the idea that – Real thoughts don't require a thinker. Okay. So it's that um, real thoughts are waiting for a vessel, and the best you can be is just open to, for the thoughts to arrive. And metaphorically, this is sort of interesting. It's just the idea that that the minute we actually um, are active in attempting to think, cognitive bias is already engaged. We're already sort of doomed and whatever is about to come into our head has been attenuated. It has been um, it has been snipped and cut. It is procrustean. It um, it is smaller than it would be. So the thoughts that just arrive without us thinking them are often the most powerful and closer to some capital T truth. Right. That's sort of a Buddhist notion too. But in therapy, like one of the things that um, if uh, if you're working with someone. And a thought or a feeling hits you out of the blue, it often says something about the situation and the, the relational context that you couldn't get from any sort of attempt to be able to, to, to think a thing. Uh, Bion calls these reverie states. Oh, okay. And it's like, uh, and, and these are when thoughts without a thinker arrive. They sort of just seem to show up. And you may can right. think of these sorts of things that have happened in your life where something just hits you. Or if you're working yes. with someone and suddenly this thought arrives, it doesn't right. seem to be something that you've had to piece together and that you've been gnawing on and then you finally built it and step back, ah, oh, there's the thought. It's oh. something that arrives unbidden. And there's something about thoughts like that that's, that are important. Mm -hmm. um, have, have, some, have some real <clears throat> meaning. I mean, I'm also thinking, um, and this thought just popped in too, that, that sometimes music um, will bring back a feeling. You hear mm -hmm. people talk about that. It puts you back in that place when mm -hmm. you hear that song and it kind of takes you back. A, the same kind of idea. A Rick Ocasek song. Yeah. Would be yeah, half very, a, very much be so. a, Well, you know, we, 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 we saw a bit of jazz last night. Yes, we did. We saw some, um, was it Bank the Jazz Hounds? Was that what they, what they called? 
I didn't get the name, but no. <laughs> no yeah, I walked in a little late, sorry. Yeah, yeah. It, was, uh, they were uh, yeah, it was the first time I'd ever seen a jazz band set fire to their instruments. Yeah. <laughs> it's not really a thing that <laughs> you that normally see. Hendrix, uh, I also Pete thought, kind of I thing, think maybe. they sort of got it wrong. You're supposed to set fire to the instruments after you finish the set. Not really not, not in, when you're them. about to play them. Yes. Okay. <laughs> really, <laughs> that really affected the, uh, the quality. That was unusual. <laughs> it was. It was affected the quality of the performance, I thought. But uh, still okay. I'm not yeah, saying yeah, it's, yeah, it's good. It's, it's fine. <laughs> but um, but we were watching the Jazz Hounds. Let's call them the Jazz Hounds. Because okay, if go. I had a jazz band, it'd be the Jazz that. Hounds. Okay, yeah, I like it. And uh, I'd be the first jazz band with the most prominent instrument is washboard. No, <laughs> it's not going to work. I'm telling you. <laughs> Although, maybe. I don't know. I'll, I'll take you should, I can play softly as a morning sunrise on, ja- on uh, a washboard. <laughs> it'll bring you to tears. I'm going to bring you to tears because I destroyed yeah, the song. Yeah, you're going to bring us to tears. <laughs> and I'm also, I, I may bring my laundry over for you to do <laughs> while says, we're doing that. So, you you uh, can accomplish uh, two tasks. <laughs> but we were watching the jazz last night. Think about it. Part of what happens in improvisation is the idea, right? right. That you're open to what's going on in the moment. Yeah, and, and it's a, a whole form of communication with the other mm-hmm. musicians, and you're kind of mm-hmm. syncopated there. You, mm-hmm. You're in line with it. So, mm-hmm. yeah, it makes and sense. And so, so if, if this, this um, um, Dunning-Kruger effect in some ways and other cognitive biases sort of uh, are defensive, if they, uh, if, they, if they act as sort of a rigid, un- impermeable boundary that we operate from that, for, that generates a sense of safety, the sort of improvising, reverie states, thoughts not a thinker sort of stuff that Beyond proposes is an attempt to be able to to be open to the things that are both both your internal and external world. And I think jazz in a way is a wonderful example of how to do both, right? At least good jazz. Right. You know, bad sure. jazz maybe not so much. Okay, I'll leave that alone. Um, <laughs> in that comment, because we could go down that road. You, you were thinking of a bad jet. You were thinking of bad jazz. Well, uh, okay. <laughs> so you got me. But let me ask you this. So are we, uh, it seems like, and we don't like to talk about politics, but it seems like we are entrenched in the tribal truthiness. things. Yeah. And uh, truthiness there. But uh, are we moving more and more to this uh mm-hmm. Dunning-Kruger effect, where um, I, well, don't I don't know you, that much, but I'm thinking I know a well, lot. I don't know if you read any Stephen Pinker. You like this Pinker guy? Yeah, I heard of him. We talked yeah. about him a little bit here. Now. Well, you know, Pinker's idea is that actually things are getting better. Yeah. And that so that this isn't the case, you know, and it could be that our um, that um, our knowledge of it allows us to be aware of it in ways that make it seem worse. You know, but people often right. say, you know, political discourse is horrible. It's gotten worse than it's ever is. But sure. then you'll like pick up a newspaper from 1871 where, you know, um, the There's presidential a duel. <laughs> somebody just shot somebody. <laughs> yeah, and, and then with a, and yeah. then somebody's calling somebody's mommy, mama, ma- mother a whore. I mean, these are literally <laughs> things that happen. Right. Like, and you're like, ooh, it was rough back then. But, yeah. So I'm and not sure to what degree, you know. Okay. All but right. y- there is a... an interesting political thing because you know, I, 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 I'm on the left. I'm sick. I'm, I'm so far to the left that you know, I have a Stalin tattoo. Okay. I'm not gonna tell you where it is, uh, but I can make no, it dance. And there's no, t- there, there <laughs> and, is no uh, tattoo, but uh, that's a nice and they don't joke, call me the Red Army for nothing. Oh. Oh, but <clears throat> man, that's way too far. All right. TMI. You were talking about TMI. <laughs> yeah, TMI. But um, um, folks on the left often have this way of sort of like you know our goal is just to get Trump out. That Trump is somehow an aberration. It's a sign that things are going horrible and bad. But if we want to really sort of be Beonian in this, in terms of being able to yeah. be open, then we have to be able to think if we're from the left. Obviously, if they're right, you wouldn't think this. But you would see Trump as a symptom, right. and the goal is not to simply get rid of a symptom. But to understand it and learn from it, and to be able to to maybe untie the knot that, that that brings it, but there's something the cure is also in the symptom, you know. It's like um, okay. um, if we go back, uh, the, someone has a, a stutter, for instance, and there are lots of reasons why people, folks might stutter. But if they if they did have an impediment, and if they came to therapy, and it became obvious that um, throughout the course of their life they had often been um, they had had um, some uh, some trauma at the hands of, of of their father, and that they're now embedded in this stutter is both a fear of speaking, a fear of reprisal, and maybe even deeper, an attempt to be able to uh, to bring these situations into the future and the present in the hope that there could be a different resolution. So you repeat in the hopes that this time it might be different. Right. And uh, so let's just say those are examples. If we simply want to get rid of the stutter, we may not be able to move to the things that could be useful embedded in it. Mm-hmm. And so we could treat Trump in that way. So mm-hmm. we need to be able to think about 
How do we understand why he's here, what he means? Lots of people voted for him. Mm-hmm. I saw one poll, the guy has a 40% approval rating. Yeah. And that's actually pretty high, considering this guy's a dumpster fire. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, we don't have to get No, political. that's quite all right. I, you, can, you can say those kind of things. But, uh, I, I think it's you know, okay, but... And, uh, you know, I mean, I'm like, woof, you know? Yeah, why are so many people seeing it so differently mm-hmm. in that? So do you think it's this Dunning-Kruger effect? It is just uh, people who think they know what's going on versus what's Well, I think um, Trump really may be a wonderful example of, of someone who may often be guilty of that. He often says things boasting he his IQ and how good he is at certain things and history just doesn't seem to repeat or doesn't bear those out yeah it doesn't but you know again I, I I realize that I come from a biased perspective but I yeah. I think when history shakes this all out you know whew, this has not yeah. been a st- yeah, stellar uh yeah. but yeah, yeah. but he's certainly assured of that but I also think that like um like for instance a wonderful example is the evangelical support for Trump right and um, I mean, I, I could certainly see lots of ways of of supporting him for various reasons, but um, these are folks who have high moral standards. Sure, they value uh, prudence. They value so many things, and um, sexual morality. And, and Trump embodies none of those. <laughs> right. I mean, even if you squint, <laughs> you have to look very hard. We even you literally have him it. on. We have him on tape. We have him on tape saying things. Right. Don't repeat those. Yeah, yeah well, so we yes. Understand. Yeah, and, right. uh, they, they, I mean, and, and, and people fix that on the one where he talks about grabbing women's genitals. But we have him on tape also saying that, that um, uh, young women, he said young women, I believe, who have troubled sexual pasts are the best in bed. Oh. He, he made a statement that like that. Okay, there, 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 there are more, more troubling me. things. Yeah. And... I think that the ability to be able to um, to not be shocked or um, by that to a degree that you you couldn't see yourself casting that vote right. doesn't happen. He is still overwhelmingly supported by evangelical Christians, and you know it, well, it doesn't it, make sense. I mean, you can't balance that uh, mm-hmm. in some way to try mm-hmm. to make sense of why someone. Uh, who who had these strong very strong mm-hmm. beliefs are suddenly discarding them or not using them or not applying it to well the you, you could sort of if if we had uh, um um was his name dunning or kruger let's go uh, it, it was two, it was actually two, two guys two, two guys two guys yeah yes. right, it was two guys so if we had either dunning or kruger let's say we had dunning on the couch he came to you for therapy okay and he came to you therapy prior to the moment when he was about to douse his face in uh, in lemon juice. lemon juice. Now it's possible that there could be some cognitive deficit here. By Maybe the way, a, that was another guy that wasn't Dunning or Courier uh, that did that. They studied the case. With, really, <laughs> with the bank robber who did that. Yeah. Okay, so just to clarify that. So it uh, wasn't Dunning or Kruger that did it. No, no, no. Okay, no, okay, no, so, no, no. so I'm these glad you. These are two researchers who studied I'm, the I'm, guy. I'm, I'm, okay. glad, I'm glad you're here because this, this is important. It's important. So right. let, let's let, let's call him then, um, um, Trumpy. <laughs> okay. Let's call we him Trump. Have to, but okay, okay. Let's, yeah. Let's say so we, we we get Trumpy before he's about to engage in this crime spree right. and with Robbing a bottle of and putting the <laughs> with a bottle of juice. lemon juice, which right. hope he didn't get in his eye because that's painful that's stuff. That's gotta hurt. Yeah, or you have any if he shaved and then put it on there, because I'm gonna tell you, that's really gonna be painful too. <laughs> it's gonna be like home alone, but you know, with a guy with the guy going <laughs> out of the bank too looked at the camera and smiled. Because he knew <laughs> that they were yeah, he was that's very beautiful. devoted. So it's possible that before he launched on this really not so good crime spree, that um, he could have had some cognitive deficit. Sure. You know, maybe maybe some 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 trauma, brain trauma of some sort, or some you know congenital de- condition that sure. may have limited his capacity. But right. assume he didn't. Okay. The go- we might want to think about what what would cause him to be trapped by such a ridiculous construct. And you know, this is where Freud would come in. Okay. For just like the parapraxis, just like, um, you know, as famous Freud says, there's no such thing as mistakes. So if this wasn't, quote, a mistake, what sort of internal conflict would generate this act? And I might wonder, like I want, might wonder if, if, if even at the most basic level, the fear and concern of being caught was high. And he defended against that fear and concern through the action of the lemon juice. And so if he were to come to me for therapy and he was saying, you know, I'm going to rob a, 
and I got this lemon juice. Right. We could then begin to explore, well, let's let's talk a little bit about, um, first off, why you want to rob the bank, because that may give us a clue as to yeah. what, what creates the symptom yes, of the lemon that's juice. Right. That's a basic. We might also begin to get him to sort of talk about, you know, well, what do you think it's going to be like? And, and if he begins mm-hmm. to... to um, touch on and own with the possibility of modulating his anxiety instead of regulating it through symptom, he might decide not to do this, or at least might right. decide a different way of doing it. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, it makes sense. And, I, and But I'm kind of wondering about the lemon juice idea, too, mm-hmm. that he really believes, since it was uh, used in invisible ink, uh, mm-hmm. kind of child's uh, play there, that uh, it would it would not show his face it would cover his face while he did this and they couldn't find him so there's a that's a that's a delusional to a certain mm-hmm. extent is it not well here's the thing because symptom itself you know um not to get political but in some ways support for trump from an evan- evangelical basis is delusional right i mean it's not it li- I, I could see if you said i'm going to support him because i don't like him but he's going to further he, this agenda, he, the agenda that, 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 that I that I'm yeah. okay right. makes okay. I understand that, but if 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 they say that he meets some standard of godliness, right? I mean that's a little like the lemon juice. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it, is. it really it is. is. Uh, so uh, the, this I, this idea of delusion is part of this stunning Kruger effect mm-hmm. as well. If you really believe you're so much more knowledgeable mm-hmm. than you really are, and, you have to stretch that out. And, and sort of a Freudian reading of this is it's it, a, a delusion is a way of, of, of um, it's a story we tell ourselves to be able to deal with the things that we're feeling. So it, right. it, it, is, a, it is a solution for internal, for the conflict between what's inside us and what's going on outside of us. So it's a way of, you know, it, um, like I would imagine some evangelicals that um, um, their the basis for their religious investment may be far different than what they think and truly believe. Mm-hmm. That um, you know that uh, there's a a guy by the name of Peter Rollins. I think it was Rollins who talked about this. Maybe it was our man Zizek. Okay. But that part of what can make someone invest in Trump is he gets to do the things that you secretly want to do. Okay. That. That uh, Zizek even there's says, an admiration for right, some of this. Right, because he's okay. doing it. Yeah. That that you know he gets to well, you grab get, you, women's you, genitals. But I would secretly like to, but I can't because uh, I feel retribution. Well, that, you yeah, know, yeah, and, and the sense of morality it. and ethics right. and some other stuff. But but it's interesting that they that this kind of get locked on that. And what the defense is, he's um, saying uh, what he believes, and he's. Um, does he always says something? He that, is a rascal. He, he he is he is in plain sight doing the very things that I don't, that I secretly want to do, but my conflict over them won't allow me. So he is, right. you know, he is. You know? Yeah. Well, it, it's I, I can't help but coming back to this idea that we don't evaluate ourselves very well. We do it poorly. Even per, well, people who I know. Do. Okay. <laughs> what? Let's be honest. I, I evaluate myself quite, okay. quite well. All right. All right. <laughs> I'm so, like, you know, I'm not. All right. I don't know. I, I, my thought was that we don't evaluate ourselves very well until now, evidently, <laughs> That's right. you. And, um, but what I, what I would say is that is an objective to try to figure out our goal to try to figure out um, how can we be accurate. Don't we want to be accurate in our mm-hmm. evaluations? I mean, we talked about sometimes if you – Overestimate your well, but here's the thing: skill. maybe it, we don't. It may help you in some other way. Maybe term. we don't want to be accurate because if our you know, existential existential brothers and sisters are right, awareness brings with it a great deal of pain. Oh, okay. So may, may, yeah, maybe yeah, that's not that something you know. Maybe if you were truly uh, one of the themes in a lot of uh, Lovecraftian fiction is the idea that um, if we truly were awake and saw how things were, we would see how horrible. And how insignificant we are, and we'd be crushed by it. Ah, that there is a madness much. of knowledge. Right? That, so, yeah, okay, that, so, that. so ma- ma- maybe it's Lovecraftian. Can I say Lovecraftian? You just did. I did. Yeah. So if it's Lovecraftian, that sounds like um, you know, like uh, your um, your mac and cheese would be screaming at you, you know. Okay. But, uh, now I just lost that. <laughs> but but the idea that uh, it's too much for us to handle. It's just too big a burden if we looked at an insignificance and so forth. So uh, we. Uh, have this boasting and we evaluate mm-hmm. ourselves uh, in a in, at, at, 
better than we actually are. Mm. But, but shouldn't we be able to handle all of that? Here's uh, what my thought, because if I give it sort of my personal philosophy on this, and um, is that, um, I mean, I think if we take the Lovecraftian stance or um, that um, awareness, if we were truly aware, we'd be crushed by what we know. I don't think that's actually how it works. I think that we have, um, we take small bites of the world. Okay. And uh, the, at the best, what we can do is we, as we move through the world, we take, early on, I think we're forced to take larger and larger bites. But even as we get older, and it generates the possibility of growth. We move closer and closer to who we are and what the world is, almost like an ascend, in an ascending helix. And there's a step forward, a step back, a step forward. And so there's this movement. So it's okay. not a matter of either you're aware and you're freaked out, right, or you're right, aware right, and you're yeah. enlightened, or you're aware and you are, you know, crushed by the knowledge. No, but that, can't. and then embedded in that too is this notion that it's always a, a bit of a dialectic, that the truth is always, to some degree, requires our fictions, and that it requires our biases, mm -hmm. and that we could even say that maybe part of this stunning um, um, Kruger effect, maybe it's it would be a lousy place to be stuck in, but it's one of the steps we need to move forward, and that we're catching sort of the mind. In a, in a in a in a in a moment, without thinking about what's about to happen next, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It is it is a necessary component in our movement forward. All of these biases, they serve a purpose. If we were stuck there, we'd be in trouble. But they serve a purpose as we move and we get to know more and more. I, I think I've said before that you know I have a pre-adolescent son. I'm not just growing a pre-adolescent son. He's growing the father of pre-adolescent son. Mm -hmm. Our capacity in this dialectic to be moved, to move the world and be moved by it and to be able to, to find a way to dance forward. And I think all these biases we talk about, they serve a purpose in that dance. That you know, And uh, this is a, I think I mentioned this guy Lacan before. Yeah. Truth is structured like a fiction. Fictions are necessary. They are they are part of what we need to be able to bind and dance with the things we have to dance with. But what's often asked of us is to get we have to get better and better fictions. Mm. Okay, so it's a, it, it's a, it's some kind of balance to keep us from mm. being overloaded with this information, also being in the moment and not uh, moving too far out. But but it does seem that people who overrate themselves in driving and all of these other th mm. categories it seems to be across the board. By the way, that's why uh, I think it's that it may be part of that dance we have to do. That is, you know, that there has to be a that um, fiction is necessary. If you ask the person they're a better driver, well, probably that's part of the way they can get on the road. Because if you really thought about all the things that could go wrong, right, <laughs> you might. Uh, might not get yeah, the car. I'm thinking of First Avenue in the parking place is right out here. It can that's, go very wrong down there. That's uh, yeah. That road. That's, that's, that, that's for sure. So, what about the people who really are experts, like you know, myself? Talked, to, uh, talked about Sean. For Sean, example. that guy. I, That was my example coming up it's, with it's uh, like, Dr. Cruzan. Um, I mean, they are underestimating their knowledge and expertise. I, I've talked to him. That? I don't think he underestimates himself. That's not what I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm uh, joking. Once again, not true. <laughs> and uh, Sean will talk to me about that. But okay, there we go. Okay. Um, but yeah, so that's a tendency. And, and that's what the Dunning Kruger uh, found in some of those experiments mm -hmm. that uh, the, the people who did very well had the expertise. Well, we'll think about it just in, in, in our profession oh. the idea that. Um, a good therapist, and there's some interesting uh, uh, out when some of the outcome studies when they do the master therapist. One of the one of the major factors in 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 defining what a master therapist is is um, um, humility. Okay. It literally is. I, like it. I mean, and I was uh, um, um, uh, supervising a. Someone and they were they were they brought a tape in where this individual had just had um, someone very close to them pass away and die, mm -hmm. and um, the uh, the intern and I talked about this that um, if you come from a place of humility, then the grief they bring into the room is something both of you are awed by. You're not you don't suddenly move to a place of certainty. I'm going to fix this, and if you did. That, that would really wreck the possibility of moving forward with it. So I think that, you know, expertise generates just the right amount of humility to be able to stay in the room but not take up too much space in it. 
So in therapy, I think that, uh, and when I think of, you know, you supervised a lot of folk too, part of, you know, new therapists believe they're supposed to be experts. Right. They'll, they're supposed to know what they're supposed to do. Okay. And part of what happens, right, is you realize, no, 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 you realize you don't have a clue, <laughs> but that's okay. Yeah, it's okay not to know. <clears throat> right. That's a, that's a life lesson there for all of us, I guess. In, and it may be way. that you may have to wait, you know, 10 minutes into the session before you have a clue, or maybe a couple of months. <laughs> it's not, depends, you know. Yes. And you may know for a while and then suddenly not know. You may know and not know in the span of five minutes. And okay. you're okay. right, your capacity to be able to move through that and to be, but, you know, and I think that with some patients, they can they can they can help to rob us of our humility and our anxiety. We can move to a place of, of uh, of thinking we know more than we do, and and I think those moments are often co-created too. Okay, you know, all right. They'll often uh, they they will come into the room expecting an expert, and their potential disappointment, their potential whatever, right. will move right. you at least unconscious unconsciously into the place of the what Lacan calls the subject supposed to know. Okay. <clears throat> And okay. you're both undone by that, right? And and maybe that's how that uh, therapeutic relationship is built. Uh, that uh, we come to that place of uh, not knowing. And by the way, what what's wrong with that question? It seems to me that when some when somebody I thought I think is an expert and they get to a point, they are freely they're freely saying it. I don't know. It comes. Yeah. It comes naturally, and it sounds like, kicked my butt. Like, I'm like, yeah. yeah I, don't I, know, I like the idea that okay, it's a certain honesty that comes mm-hmm. with that. Mm-hmm. So, if you ever used said that, that's uh, that was only on my, my wedding night. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> I, I should know better, um, no, no, but no, I no, haven't no. learned. Uh, there's some things I just have not <laughs> learned around here. No, no, I, I think that, you know, like part of, um, I mean, in a good therapeutic relationship, I was talking with a, with one of the interns about this, that I like to imagine sort of a, a, a garbage can in the middle of the room and that the, the patient is free to throw anything I say away. Okay. I'm not going to, you know, right. I mean, it's, it may hurt my feelings, but I'm not so wedded to it that I'm going to suddenly run out of the room. Right. So the capacity to be wrong. But yes. there are certain, like, um, I, I have a patient with a, with a strong OCPD character structure. And this individual, they um, they can really annoy me by how often I'm wrong. You know? <laughs> 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 and, like, it's it's very important for them to be in control and in charge and in that space. Yeah, no. It, and yeah, yeah, and yeah. <laughs> suddenly well, you find tough. yourself like, you know. So everything you say is canceled out to a certain like, extent. Oh, man, it's I'm, like, oh, come on, <laughs> what's going on here? But the idea to be able to say, okay, well, what's going on here? You know, I, I can be an idiot sometimes, but right. I can't be, I mean, even a broken <laughs> clock. Occasionally. Right, well, that's even right. a broken I, clock. I figured one of you is right twice. Who right. Could, <laughs> and so either, either statistically I've suddenly hit this jackpot where I'm 100% wrong, which shouldn't happen. <laughs> didn't happen as much <laughs> yeah. maybe and then you can say wait a minute so what is this and then you begin to think about it so what is it between the two of us yeah. that generates this i'm always it's, wrong it's indicative of another right. issue mm-hmm. to, to, to kind of deal with but saying i don't know what it's kind of refreshing because if everybody mm-hmm. all right let me let me just stop there but the idea of this overestimating and overrating yourself um too much so i guess it moves to sort of becoming a part of your personality and it may move you along the continuum from the m- mild or s- slight delusion mm. to narcissism mm. of but, some things which we've talked about but here. even the narcissist or individuals delusioned both of them are attempting to quote make the best of a bad job and all of our defenses no matter how, do you, how, how primitive no matter how many of our fictional constructions they still have the potential to move us forward in a healthy way, too. Okay. They are the best we can do in a situation like that. So yeah. um, I still think that there's something about these biases that, like all defenses, they can serve. You know, it, it, It's a good place maybe to start from, but a lousy place to be stuck in. Okay. So, you know. All right. Well, um, that's <clears throat> this has been really interesting because this this uh, Dunning Kruger effect is pervasive uh, to a certain mm-hmm. extent that 
uh, it, it affects us all in, in, in various ways. And I think sometimes when you f- hear someone who's an expert or thinks they're an expert and with very little you know, information. Are you looking at me? Uh, no, <laughs> I am, but uh, that wasn't my point. That, that basically it turns us off to those people. We also want to say, hey, wait, you don't know as much as you know, and it's that's uh, mm-hmm. either it turns us off or forty percent of the country suddenly are turned on. You got to be kidding. <laughs> yeah, that's I it. That's are, it. Right. So it, yeah, a, but it, in, in, in a way, it kind of explains the factions. It, it puts you in a, in the camps in the tribal mm-hmm. uh, idea there. So uh, that's interesting. Anything? Any advice for uh, Elizabeth Warren in twenty twenty? Okay, here we go. <laughs> not going to be uh, <laughs> political but here we yeah, are yeah, there we go it. we just said that uh like yang he's going to give me some free money so uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll just anybody if i can get some free money <laughs> that, that's free money's cool. good so, yeah. but, but that that's that's been uh this has been an interesting discussion i i think we need to maybe we'll come back and touch on it as we go forward because it's so it it, it is really important and 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 for me i think um in, in doing the research I had for my degrees and some other things, you come across a lot of uh, information that uh, uh, you'd rely on experts, but science gives you a chance to uh, kind of see what it is now, but maybe future experiments may uh, refute those findings, and there's always a growing and a moving uh, process to learn uh, more and more. All right, so man, we covered we covered it's a lot good. of territory here, but uh, no, no, I don't know. There's so, still some questions unanswered. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll we, we will back. certainly answer them next time. I'm certain of it. Okay, you just contradicted <laughs> what you said before. If I'm so certain about things, but by the way, I mean that's hard. That's difficult in therapy. You were saying earlier that if I come in as your client, I'm the, I know exactly what it is, and you know mm-hmm. that it's not. Mm-hmm. We have to find some middle ground to keep that conversation going. Mm-hmm. All right, my friend. Thank you uh, for today. Um, Watch productions from the Columbus area and our educational program. We're training um, with folks who were trained under Heinz Cohut. Cohut was a guy who invented this thing called self psychology. I still exist. Stay connected to Columbus by watching on your mobile device or laptop 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Dan, good to have you in the studio. It's good morning. What's good morning? What's on your mind today, my friend? What's oh, what's yeah. the topic of uh, conversation for you today? Want what's on my mind or the topic? Because that's um, a different day. Wait, let me. Um, I tell you what, so I, I need to do. I need to refrain that and let's talk about the topic. Well, you what's said your about topic? T- you, I think you said what's on t- your mind is always the scary thing for me for we had, some reason. We have ten or twelve minutes. We're supposed to talk about whatever the topic isn't. Right? We're supposed to I sort think of that's the way we've been going for goes. a while now, and I'm not sure any listener is appreciating maybe not. that. Well, he, so. maybe we, we can talk about one of these days. We should talk about Bob Dylan. I was telling you, there's a Bob Dylan pop, podcast. Oh, talking, yeah. I think it's Talking Bob. Yeah, well, in one the last, days, in we last few sessions, we've ta- we talked about music in a general sense and touch on different yeah. things. Rick Ocasek from last week, we mm-hmm. talked about his death and so forth. So now, today, it's Bob Dylan to start off our show? Well, I think we should devote a couple of shows to it, because Bob Dylan, man, is... I, uh, he, he, He's the closest we have to to Shakespeare, you know. Nobel Prize, National Award Award winner, uh, French Medal of Honor, um, bakes really good cupcakes. I mean, the guy's like just you yeah. Know, he can do it. Guy, he can do it all, he's, and he's done it all right. He's you know, and he's, and he's still going. He he's is. I saw strong, him in right? Macon like about uh, almost a year ago. Wow. Okay. Saw him in Macon. Okay. All right. All right. There's not a lot of things in Macon. In fact, if you ever if you're feeling bad about Columbus, Georgia, go visit Macon. Go visit Macon. <laughs> really puts things in perspective. All right, let's say something nice about Macon. You know the Allman Brothers, okay? James Brown. I mean, yeah. uh, been a lot of concerts yeah. over there at the Civic Center and back in the old days. Mm-hmm. Probably not true anymore, but hey, mm-hmm. it, at one point it was a music capital of the state. Yeah, my, I'm just a, saying that. Um, I think um, Blind Willie McTell is also from uh, from Macon. There you go. 
you all right wanna, so yeah. so what is it about dylan you would like because this you just said we talk for 10 minutes before we get to the topic which is not a good thing i'm not sure that that's what <laughs> yeah, we need to be doing well, well maybe maybe we could just sort of talk about dylan another point because i think what might be interesting is a i, I i'm obsessed with dylan in fact i've probably seen him in concert at least 12 times i have probably um i don't know 500 uh, Dylan bootlegs, easy. I got like, oh, yeah. uh, I mean, I got, um, I got, I just got can a lot you of say, stuff. Can you say bootleg these days uh, without getting into trouble? Well, that, I don't that's, know there's what now a, 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 uh, an official bootleg series. I think we're up to 12 or 13 for Dylan. Oh, say, so. So, so bootleg has become sort mm. of uh, okay now, uh, in yeah. a sense. Uh, well, I remember uh, the first Dylan concert I went to, you could, you know, there'd be guys walking around selling the bootlegs of other concerts. And it was cool. It was like, you know, it was like, it was just super cool. You got you people hanging out these things. And I remember the guy was like selling bootlegs. And I yelled across the, um, the parking lot, hey, bootleg guy. And when I said it, the guy ducked behind a car. Well, um, evidently that had something to do with somebody selling something out of the trunk <laughs> of their car. And that's not always a good place did, to they get did, your they music. Did, uh, I'm not sure yeah. about that. Actually, I think uh, because security was so tight, most of the merchandise he was having to store rectally. So that, that really I'm, I'm made sorry, for I'm it. trying to give some instructions over here to our producer. But you know what? Um, I've lost this you'd conversation be, a minute ago. So I'm not how I'm many not. CDs a grown man can store like that. I'm just saying. I, you, well, that you, is, you that, give me a number. That guy was, he, he doubled you know, up. I kind of feel like <laughs> one of our listeners would I just kind of fade out, or fade away from what's happening. And I'll, I'll be back in a minute, and these guys are going to say something about psychology and mental health or one of those kind of things that might be helpful to me. So I'm kind of like well, that person I just right amused now, listen. myself. I went someplace I thought was funny, which is really – I, I, I'm an audience of one. But, right. Okay, but, <laughs> We've established that on the show about narcissism a while yeah, back. Yeah, if you yes. want to know more, go that's, back to that episode. That'll it. tell you what's happening. Well, here's, um, here's, here's what I was thinking about. The, the topic could be uh, there's a there's – a, 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 uh, it's, a, it's a thing. It's a, it's a concept that has been bounced around, especially recently, this notion of cancel culture. Okay. All right, cancel culture. Mm -hmm. I think that may have something to do with social media in particular, but maybe it's a larger thing. I'm not sure. Well, about well, that. we got to be careful because even before we dive into this, and you know, we want to be able to tie this some way to uh, psychology or, um, you know, um, yeah, the mental health world, the things that we talk about in topic. I do them. We'll, we'll we'll find some way to <laughs> to tie it to things. But, okay, I know, but, but yeah, um, I got it. I'm, I'm with you so far. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. we'll see how this turns out. I just out. like saying the word duodenum. Yes. You of do. all the parts of the anatomy, you just say that. You just feel good. Just say duodenum. Okay. You just feel. It does know, something for the, the. Just you just feel good. So, okay. uh, all right. not like appendix. Then. That just doesn't feel good. Don't and I don't I don't like saying no. that. No. Not a not a word. I'm I'm. Uh, so, so, but before we dive into this, we've got to think about this because here's, here's, here's the issue. It's a, it's a concept that already is problematic the minute because I think where it was given a name, it already has sort of a political vertices. Right, so, right. Well, because, everything seems to be it's a, well, sort of pervasive, the politics, the mm. tribalism, the split in the mm. U.S., well, all of those things are happening, but that's a kind of a pervasive thing that it is. seems to enter itself in just almost every conversation it um you know it, it, it is certainly uh, despite his um his his claim to have bring the nation together since uh since trump it, it seems to have gotten worse oh i'm i think it's uh, yeah i'm it's pretty gotten, much uh, down with this it's gotten worse sorry, sorry, it's gotten I, I'm, worse. I'm however an eternal optimist and i believe we're going to work mm -hmm. through this and we're going to come out of the other side of things and we're going to be more cohesive uh mm -hmm. maybe only one but that's mm -hmm. how i'm thinking mm -hmm. We're gonna see. We'll see yeah, what I'm happens. A, uh, I'm an external pessimist. I just want everybody else to be sad. But um, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, um, I like that comment. That was good. That's, it has some real meaning behind it somewhere. It did. It did. It did. I don't know where it came from. We'll we'll work on that in a new show. I, somewhere, trust me. So. Nothing else from here on out is going to be uh, in any way <laughs> no, meaningful. There, nothing so, as that profound as that. In, that in, was, in it's all downhill so. from there. But me, this notion of cancel culture, sort of yeah. in, in a similar vein with um, social justice warrior, these are labels that often get, um, and I think in right. some ways they reflect an attempt to understand our current societal growing pains, right? Right. So if we approach this with um, 
uh, with our uh, hearts and minds open to this, what is this notion of cancel culture. And it, it's recently been in the, I don't know if you, you ever watch the news? You watch that news stuff? Yeah, I see the news if all the time. Like yeah, it's, it's coming you in like various forms. You like those Fox and Friends? Do. You ever watch those? I, I do. As a matter of fact, Facts, uh, uh, it, doesn't, um, uh, it doesn't help uh, in the way I think it will when my wife and I are watching the news and I go, okay, we watch this channel. Let's look at Fox and see what mm -hmm. they're saying mm -hmm. about the same topic. And it doesn't go well. So we have to, <laughs> I can only take it for just a moment and does, we have to does, go back. Yeah. But we know what's happening there. All right. Yeah, so yeah. I think it, well, let me put it another way. Mm -hmm. I really think we need to see all these sides, both I sides did. and all the other sides, mm -hmm. that, that's what's going on. Mm -hmm. So that's what, that's my attempt at mm -hmm. kind of seeing everything around. Well, I, I, I can imagine about five minutes of Fox News before I uh, set a living thing on fire, usually. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> really, you know. No, we're I not doused gonna, something in... No, that's in, not... No, gasoline, we don't set, things, set it on fire. Set anything on fire is probably <laughs> so the best way to go. But uh, there might be some work to do there, but I want... <laughs> it's not the time for it now. Um, uh, that is Steve Ducey? That's the guy on there, right? Ducey? Yeah. Right, Steve Ducey. Ducey. What's his name? Yes, I like that. I just I just like saying Ducey. It, that's the sort okay. Of guy. I was thinking you were going to go somewhere, but that's good. You I've held never it in been there. in a fraternity. Never. And in fact, I don't think I really would fit in one. I'm sure somewhere out there's a fraternity that you know might have a me shaved hole in it I could fill, but I haven't found it yet. But if I were in a fraternity, fraternity, I'd want to be in a fraternity with a guy whose last name was Ducey. You know, because you'd be go out. Who's, who are you hanging out with? Do, me and Ducey. Me Ducey, and Ducey yeah. Are doing it, some sounds, it, sounds, it sounds. It sounds right. Now, the thing I've read about in the paper uh, just this last couple of days was this notion that there's some debate on the Fox and Friends or some of the other shows they have on there where people Shib, are questioning. Yeah, Shep Smith right. and Tucker Carlson. Right. Which, by the way, you know, any time I'm starting to like... Um, Here we go. <laughs> I swear, what? <laughs> no, I don't know. I don't know what you're about to say, what, 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 but I know... When, whenever I start to really, you know, start like um, like um, um, getting really down on Hitler, I turn on Tucker Carlson. You know, he's not such a bad guy, that Hitler guy. Oh, you know? okay. Now, I'm just see, saying that's, that's... I, this is one of those things where I think we just crossed over the line. I'm trying to keep us in a boundary somewhere. <laughs> okay, yeah, let's... But, that's what uh, I'm saying. Okay. All right, there we go. You had a point. I had a point. Can a we point. come back? So so there, there is a political vertices about this. And there, right. I, I believe that the place to start... And I think I was going to mention sort of in the news that right. there was a comedian that had been hired on the new... Uh, new uh, Season of SNL. Right, that's where right. uh, that's Saturday Night Live for those folks right. who, who aren't hip. That's good, the there you SNL. Go. And so um, um, he was, uh, he actually had been hired, and someone started looking at some of his earlier um, uh, podcasts and things he had done. And apparently he said some what could be construed as rel racist things about right. Asians. About Asians, that's right. That's right, that's right. Yeah, that's right. And so as a result, there was an outcry, and he lost his job. Yeah, and so there's this notion that right now that there are, um, and and you could go all the way back to say Woody Allen that somehow he maybe uh, his I think his last film uh, his he had a contract to be doing a series of films with Netflix that fell through I think and his last few films have not had any distribution in the United States and so there, there's all this sort of thing that there are these um, the, and um, celebrities and folks um, right um, it could really kind of be in their career it stops yeah. all the progress the sponsorship um, all the things yeah, that Neil that deGrasse kind of... Tyson I think has recently had some some issue around this sort of thing right um, uh, Barney the dinosaur I I'm not familiar <laughs> so. with that that one uh, but so what you what you're saying is that someone um, comes out they they are in the news mm -hmm. and then people find something that maybe they have said in the past that's happened a lot lately mm -hmm. and and then all of a sudden it blows up what happens in that what well, do you, see, I, here's, here's where i think we if we we can come at this several ways and i think one way to think about it is that let's be generous to the the construct for a moment before we offer any any criticism sure if we see this in some ways a reflection of our growing pain as a culture that um, there is a way in which the table at which we sit is expanding, and more and more folks who haven't had a place in the table now can sit. Sure, uh, more voices are heard, uh, and it's a good thing. Gay and lesbian brothers and sisters, um, tran transsexual brothers and sisters, uh, 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 gender-fluid folk. There's really just sort of, um, um, if we could find a way to... to Take Tucker Carlson off the table, we could, but uh, but uh, he, th he gets a voice too. <laughs> yeah, I guess he gets right, a voice that's too. That's always that. So there is a so as the table grows, th there is th there is um, there's some growing pains in this. Sure. And 
uh, there have been some corrections, possibly overcorrections, as a okay. way to be able to increase the size of this table. And I think critics would say that it's been an overcorrection. You okay. know, that suddenly, you okay. know, I was even I was even talking to a friend the other day, and they were telling me that in a group that they hang out with, that suddenly they can feel sort of marginalized because some of the voices there really sort of pigeonhole them as if they may maybe um, represent sort of. Um, uh, privileged white person, right? And mm-hmm. so there's, you know, so there's th- 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 there's that element. And um, I guess technically, I would, would would I fall under privileged white person? I think there's a little privilege for all uh, <laughs> yeah, but, white, yeah, maybe white. Yeah, I think that's that's, that's it's, kind it's, of an issue. Yeah. I, but but you're saying that these things, it almost sounds like you're saying it gets overblown with all the voices in here. It can there can be this rage uh, for for another person um, injury more than the person themselves in some ways. Well, but it, there's a big reaction to it, I this guess. This is where I'd like to generate some ambivalence because um, I think that's been sort of a more conservative talking point that somehow that this represents um, an overcreaction. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm not sure about that because we've got to be, I, we have to be careful because it's very easy when, when someone has a new place at the table and they're only beginning to be able to recognize the voice they have and they're beginning to speak, it's really easy to silence them. It's really easy to send a message that they need to go back, and it's really easy right. to stop this nascent progress. And my worry would be that if when we begin to talk about this as an overcorrection, or we talk about you know that these are just angry people, and even right. a concept like uh, cancel uh, culture could be, if we're not careful, a way to shut people down who really need to speak. Like right. for instance, yes. um, I, I don't know about you, but we talk about you know. Um, racist humor I can remember um, um, Jerry Lee Lewis routines where he mm-hmm. would do this mocking sort of Asian uh, stereotype oh uh, yeah yeah, uh, yeah. I mean we, we, we've you know and not being Asian myself I would see that and I would think it was funny and laugh about it without any consideration that this that this could be an act of marginalization this could be um, uh, not just a micro but a ma- macro aggression Toward people who were who were watching this, and as right. society has shifted, we were no longer allowing this to happen. Then, um, uh, and and we're still in the process of combing through this because there are still right. places on the planet where th- this notion of blackface, for instance, mm-hmm. you know, that is another example of how, for the longest time, that was acceptable. Now it no longer is, and I think I think the fact that it isn't acceptable is not some sort of political correctness going awry. But this is a necessary shift. We're starting to think about our impact on other people in a way that we didn't before. So I want to be able to hold on to that and keep that momentum going. Yeah, that makes sense. The idea of empathy, and, and mm-hmm. we talked about that many times on the show, the, the idea of kind of seeing it from another person's view, kind of feeling it from their point of view. What mm-hmm. would it be like if you were in their shoes? Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that needs to grow. That, that's mm-hmm. a positive thing for us. And I think it would be an easy thing to get in the way of if we're not too careful. But there's a but in this. You know, so if we, if we take critics of this notion of cancel culture, that suddenly that there is, as opposed to voices being heard, we want to shut other people down. So in some ways, uh, the idea that the table that we're at is one of, it doesn't grow, we're going to have to replace. Somebody gets kicked off if somebody else comes on. And that's not what we're really looking for here. I mean, I was joking about Tucker Carlson and, you know, uh, mm-hmm. but sure. uh, our um, our conservative brothers and sisters have a place in the table. They should be able to speak, even if it's things that, that we are uncomfortable with. They're right, they, they, they have a place at that table. The catch is, though, how do we find the right sort of balance? How do we find a place where the um, one side can speak and the other be heard and the other side can speak? And I don't think we're there yet. I think part of Roseanne, another example of what right. we'd say cancel culture. She yeah. um, she was fired, and that happened quickly, and she they was had, done. They, was uh, James Gunn, the director of Guardians of the Galaxy, uh, he was removed from the project and placed back on. There's all this sort of – there's lots of movement and attempt to be able to, to answer, to change, and to grow. But um, 
I think it, I, I think it's really interesting. You know, you mentioned the the Saturday Night Live uh, person they just hired, and they were about to. He's coming on the show. He's going to be great. They looked up and they found some uh, remarks that he made about Asians. Mm-hmm. Um, I re- also remember in the show in, in, in reading just recently that Andrew Yang, the person that's running for president, mm-hmm. uh, made a comment about that and said he said basically, paraphrase, that wasn't so bad. Give the guy a break. <laughs> yeah. And then then he was hit with this cancel culture notion by others, mainly white, I think, in that group, that sort of wanted to cancel him. And he's the person that the insult was uh, aimed at, but it's somebody else feeling more hurt than the person Mm-hmm. who is targeted. Mm-hmm. That's kind of a strange phenomenon, I think. It's almost like we're taking on somebody else's hurt more than they feel it. Mm-hmm. I don't know what to make of that. Well, we, we, let's let's dive a little deeper than maybe a, let, let's get a little into psychology. Or we we're supposed to do that, right? This, yeah, this I think supposed that's to what this, we so. generally do, yes. So, and there are a couple of models here. There's a way to sort of think about this in the same way that we would a therapy session, but maybe we won't go there yet. But okay. you said that what, why would suddenly, maybe some of the folks who are driving cancel culture, maybe it may not be the... Um, um, the individuals who are most directly impacted by this, right? It may have been not right. Asian Americans who were who were driving this, but um, uh, uh, Caucasian folk, right? And if that's the case, then so what is going on there? Is this there's this notion of um, uh, of white guilt? Okay. There's notion of. Um, um, We've talked about this guy Zizek before, right? Yeah, we have. By the way, has a new book out called "Sex and the Sublime." Just came out last week. Okay, I'm going to have to get you to read it and tell me what it says. I've tried uh, to. I've listened to this guy. He's amazing. He's wonderful. First, yeah. I, I mean, I love this guy. He just he helps under, us understand things at a, mm-hmm. at a different level. He brings it all in together. Uh, but. Um, I won't say anymore. He does. Stuff. He does that. And the That's International Zizek Conference is going to be coming in at Athens, Georgia, uh, sometime next year. I'm going to try to uh, send Athens, in a, Georgia. Yeah, it used to be University in Cincinnati for a while, but it's now moved closer okay. to home. Well, we we may so, do a remote. Um, we could uh, a hopefully got therapy from there. That would be great. We get him on the show. Of years ago, and I'm going to I'm going to come up with. I got to come up with a paper that's sexy. You got to. You always got to come up with something sexy. So I yeah, you think do. About it. it yeah, has to grab the headlines, or they don't put it's gotta, it out it's there. Grab the That's headlines. part of the problem with with uh, what we're talking about too. What you say in these cancel culture situations is it has to make headlines, and uh, that's part of the problem. Everybody's grabbing that fifteen seconds of fame. It seems. I think uh, nowadays everybody everybody's going to get at least five minutes. Maybe that's You're uh, going to get five minutes. That's so way too long. I'm so thinking so for yeah. some people. I some know. people don't. Right. Know. So this notion of like. Um, um, why they may be overinvested, and uh, Zizek talks a bit about how there is um, a, a, a subtle. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm making a uh, technical move here. Sorry, no, that's, that's good. We, it's go. good. we just want to make sure we get to hear this. Whatever's coming next, dear. Yeah, 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 sure. but the, uh, I, it, I'm sorry, I might interrupt. It's going to be an iambic pentameter. Here it's going to sound See, like I it's going to be. Uh, <laughs> it, anytime I project, I know we have to come back on course. So yeah, wait, wait, I'll wait, just wait, and we'll, we can do that. But Zizek. So, there's this notion that um, that they all talk about this notion of white guilt and whatnot, but there's a way in which um, he he talks about that you can sort of separate the racism of the left and the racism of the right, and the racism of the right is often highly projective. It's you know these people are are this and that, uh, pejorative, dirty, lazy, whatever the case may be. Right. But the racism of the left is does the opposite. If the racism of the right is um, diminishes, um, the racism of the left expands. It's like they talk about how wonderful the Native Americans were. They didn't. They had all these. Why can't we return to what they had? Uh, it's as if you suddenly uh, iron out all the humanity, and they become an ascendant sort of principle you have to aim for. Right. And right. so uh, th- th- when he talks about that, he said, "But it's 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 a uh, it's it's just a, the same form of the same part objectifying. Yeah. You're no longer okay. seeing the person as a whole person. Right. And so I wonder about part of what may drive this is that you know. It's as if um, the message they're sending maybe to Asian Americans who are saying, you know, give the guy a break. That's, you know, okay. He right. said them dumb stuff. Let, you know, chastise him, all that sort of stuff, you know. Yeah. Uh, we should talk about shame in a second, too. It's oh, rolling yeah. all this. But yeah, I'll refer you back to an early episode, but <laughs> yes, go <laughs> ahead. Really, well, but several of them, I'm ashamed of all of them, really. There's a lot of shame. There's a lot of Ongoing theme here. For a lot of shame sure. and all this sort of thing. We're going to need to call a psychologist <laughs> yeah, in here to help yeah, us yeah. with this. Right? But, um, 
I um, so uh, uh, this notion that in in that um, by um, you won't even allow the individual in question to be able to uh, feel the things that they feel. Instead, you 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 color over it with if if one colors in in black, the other colors literally in white, whitewashing everything in a way, pun intended, and that mm-hmm. we have to. Um, we have to be worried about a pull in either direction. And this is where, because, you know, the other guy I like talking about, that Wilfred Beyond. Yeah, you ever talk about Beyond that guy, guy, that Beyond yeah, guy? Yeah, I like his first name. Uh, yeah, you know, Wilfred. You don't, you don't hear a lot of <laughs> Wilfreds. Not a lot of new you know, I was going to name my babies, son but, Wilfred. <laughs> that's right. And my wife hit me. Oh, so she you like, tried, and she, she said like, she corrected. She said, okay. that's not going to happen, Wilfred. I thought that'd be cool. Yeah. But um, instead, we, you know what we ended up calling him? Don't know. <laughs> I don't know where this joke is going. I do not know what you're saying. Think. Thick. Thick. That's my son's name, Thick. It's a, um, that, it's a masculine. It's quick and masculine. I wanted something that was rapid and masculine, and sort of like a, sort of like a, a well-timed punch, you know? Thick. It's yeah, a, yeah. It's None a, of that makes sense, okay? I just want to say that. That's not your son's <laughs> name. I know your son. This is not right. <laughs> sorry, sorry. But, yeah, get uh, a little. For the effort of the pun, I think we'll keep going. <laughs> okay, yeah, there right. we go. So, so, so but, but man, Wilfred Bean talks about how, and there's a famous, well, he talks about that. He, he was one of the first guys to study groups, by the way, group process. That's okay. was worse. Yeah, yeah. So he, he talks about these, um, and um, a group that's unable to think, he calls it a basic assumption group, they often get stuck on a thing without thinking. And that, that um, um, in these moments that we move to what we could, in a pejorative sense, call cancel culture, could be a moment of not thinking. Because right. um, what we see, seem to be stuck in is the idea that we either, we either have this individual or we get rid of them. As if there's nothing in between. Right, right, yeah. As if yeah. there's not the possibility of opening up a conversation and saying, okay, how do we reach out to people who may not be at the place we want them yet? How right. do we help them to grow as the culture changes as opposed to simply um, eliminating them? Right. How do we actually have that, that um, adult – and this is the word that's been used sometimes. We need some adults in the room. Mm-hmm. But, but that adult conversation where you have a different opinion than I have and we mm-hmm. talk about it. And, and obviously I'm right. To, but I'll allow you to I have know, that see, different that's opinion. Exactly. <laughs> you're just demonstrating exactly what the, what uh, the know, problem but is. But you can still here. talk. I, yeah. It's just as opposed to you know. Um, I won't listen to you. I'm ready for <laughs> to say something I've got in my head, and I don't. Whatever you stop, I will say <laughs> that. Right. <laughs> so that's the con. But the but you know the conversation is difficult, and I don't think we have any models or really good models of a, of that conversation where I respect you. I'm going to listen to what you have mm-hmm. to say. I'm going to do something thoughtful in my response back as opposed to sort of cutting you off. And I don't think we have a good model for that yet. And I don't, I, well, I wish can I more say something people that's going to make, make some, some people upset? <laughs> because I think that whatever his strengths and weaknesses were, Obama was a good model of that. Okay. He okay. seemed to have a capacity to be able to stay calm and collected and to be able yeah, to be right. um, a good example, contemplative yeah. in the face of things. And right, but it, it, it's, it's only isolated in some, um, in some situations where the average people mm-hmm. on the street are taking up camps, one camp versus the other camp. And uh, who, who's in the middle of that? I don't mm-hmm. see that many people. Um, mm-hmm. And I don't know if this has to do with politics, and politics has sort of forced us into this, this black and white idea, or um, we just – all right, so I'm making a, uh, a call for more uh, conversation well, and see, listening to the other person. And, and, and I don't know, you know, I, I think um, – and, and I'm a little we, – we, Stephen Pinker, that, that yeah. guy who says – he, he says yeah. things are getting better. Great book. And I wonder if, 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 um, if our current conflicts are actually a result of getting better. I mean, I think now it's there is more acceptance, more inclusiveness for folks of different genders, yes, that's for true. Um, mm. for all sorts of folks. Now, it, it it may seem less for religious conservatives and conservatives in general because these shifts do um, do, do generate conflict for them, and um, and I hate that, but I don't I don't see any other way out of it. I don't see right. that there isn't you know that there that this is this is a place of growth. Right. Um, also, we sort of think about this notion of shame. When we talk about it. Um, you know, we, we we did a podcast on this. Yes, we did. And how shame has a point that the, that there is a reason we have shame, and that it is um, it from an evolutionary biological perspective, it, it has a utility and a use. Mm-hmm. And one of the things it does is it is a it is a rapid way to correct action. Um, and 
Yeah. There are certain actions that may only be corrected if they um, if they have a um, a societal impingement. If there is a consequence, uh, and it has to be a, a societal one. When a when a mom shames a child, say you know, right. you know, shame on you for doing that. Right. Um, it isn't just a no, don't do that. It in, it it generates within the um, and uh, Alan Shore talks about shame as um, it's an act of implosion. You know, if rage is an explosion, if that's an anger, okay. that, if that's an emotion that goes this way, shame does the opposite. It's an implosion. And a, a tactical implosion allows you to be able to, to generate a corrective action and to be um, – um, so there is some utility in this. Some of what we're calling cancel culture may be the necessary shame that the individual needs to have and we all need to have. I mean there was a time when – um, let's take the blackface as an example. Right. And I remember, this is an actual story. Okay. Uh, when I was in graduate school, oh, here we go. Um, my wife decided that we were going to go as the Mod Squad. Yes. Remember the Mod Squad? Yeah, the Mod Squad. Now, mod that squad. takes us back a while. It does. Um, but uh, was it three people, I think, in the Mod Squad? Yeah, they were. I think there were three or four. I can't remember. They, okay. they were, they were going to be, it was some friends of us, and she was going to be the woman, and, and she wanted me to be Link. Link is a black guy. He's a black guy. Yeah. And you know, and she bought me all this okay. stuff. And she also well, it's been bought- nice doing this podcast. Um, <laughs> well, I had a lot of fun and uh, wish just, everyone well. Well, there are pictures. We go. But, and so she brought me the outfit. She brought me an afro, all this sort of stuff. And then she also brought me makeup for blackface. Okay. Still, and, could, you could purchase it back in there. Well, you still can, I think. Uh, yeah, I guess but, you can. Uh, okay. But she, right. So she bought it. And she goes, this is going to be really fun. And uh, I remember I'm getting ready, and I already felt guilty putting the afro on. But I was like, yeah. okay, this is so far not, you know. But then there was the blackface, and I was like, something about this felt wrong. It, it felt, felt like wrong. And I, at the time, I really couldn't necessarily articulate it, but I was like. Why didn't those politicians <laughs> have that same reaction? <laughs> well, that we I thought to myself, about- you, know, you know, I think this is fun and I, I don't mean it in a, in a in a in a hateful way right but i was fully aware that there were going to be other folks at this party some of them are african-american right and, and a white guy walking in in blackface might make them uncomfortable yes <laughs> and i thought to myself and I, I had pressure from several no go ahead no one's going to care and i was like you uh, know and no. i remember putting it down and not doing it okay <laughs> man i am <laughs> i, I, I am entirely relieved at that i want to get to that point uh we're back on the air I want to thank you people <laughs> continue to watch no uh, no I, I i literally but but i if if that had happened five years earlier May not have been. I might have done might have something done different. So, that's, right. that's right. I think there was that there was enough shame, there was enough movement at that point for me to feel something about that, right. and yeah. to be able to say, you know what, I don't think this is the best idea. Wow. Yeah, I love that example, and I appreciate you sharing that because um, I, that's the question I have when I see some of these things coming out in the news with the politicians. I mean, why mm. didn't they think about that? I we've been knowing this for. Mm decades that that's not I mean somewhere you have to have that reaction but again maybe they had the people like you said you had were there the well, ones but, that spoke up said no no problem go ahead y- and here's do the thing this. I think I had and a profession I had gone through enough multicultural classes and I had uh, I had I had already understood the notion of systemic racism you know right. like people often say things well you know if a black guy puts on white fish you don't get upset and you're right. like hold on a second you're really not thinking about this clearly right, uh, right. It, it isn't that I am a racist person, and I'm doing a racist thing. At its worst, it is I am part of a system that allows me to walk and breathe in a way that other folks don't. I certainly, I, I mean, still, I'm a straight white male. There are lots of things that I have. That I, I can walk into most stores, and no one's going to bother me. Right. Simply no security guard of, is going to follow I, you through I the have, store or whatever. That when happens, I purchased... Right? When my, you know, but we we had a little difficulty with infertility, so we thought we weren't going to have a kid. So I purchased a ridiculous car, a bright yellow Porsche. Yes. And nice um, car. I uh, I drive. I have never gotten a ticket in that car. Okay. And I drive like a maniac. I know that. And I think part of the reason why I've, I've been never in got, one, one had, time, had, I was pinned back to the seat for a long period of time. And I think it's because when yes. they see a middle-aged white guy go by in a yellow Porsche, they don't bother him. 
Yes. But I suspect if That's I had systemic if I had been gone, a, yeah. a different race, I think this would have gone very differently. And that's what we mean by systemic racism. There there's right, something right. in place that allows me to have I hate to use that word because people don't like it, a privilege otherwise others wouldn't. Right. And it's not like and I could speak to all the ways in which I've been underprivileged. I come from, you know, um, um Appalachia, relatively economically deprived area. I mean, I could count on the things that are not sure. privileged about me, but right. I still, my place in the order of things, just by just by some sort of genetic lottery that I won, right. allows me this. Right. Right. And so I, I think that there's a role for shame in being able to dismantle and to be able to move society in some way. And uh, maybe, maybe if we could find a way to be able to experience the emotion of th- shame and allow us to generate some thought, we might not move too quickly, and maybe that allows us to be able to think. No, I, and this SNL guy, I, I mean, heck. Well, actually, I'll tell you, the um, mm-hmm. Trudeau, it's not Gary Trudeau, because that's a guy who do, who's, uh, what's the Trudeau guys in Canada? Uh, uh, president of Canada. Uh, yeah. uh, 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 let's call him, uh, um, God, let's call him Wilfred, up. Wilfred Trudeau. No, no Wilfred. <laughs> We've only have one. That's beyond. <laughs> that's right, okay. okay. So, uh, it's beyond me, but uh, <laughs> but a boom. But a boom. Yeah, we, so. we're going to get a trap set in here with a drummer at one point for these. But, but um, not, not yet. Uh, his response to this. Yes, I know. And we're and talking I, Canada. I, think, I know it's still yes. sort of in motion, but he was able to say it was stupid. I literally shouldn't have done that. What I did was, you know, in re- in hindsight, right. good God, that was a d- dumb thing to do. Yes. And you know what? I've done it before. There's some other times too. If you look, you're going to find it. Yeah. Shouldn't have done it. Okay. And I need to rethink that. You know what? And Tabibi uses a platform to say, I think that makes all of us need to think because it certainly was not my intention to hurt people, but look what I did. And we say, all need to think about this. We need to think about that if we're making jokes, doing that sort of stuff, we need to have some consideration of its potential impact. It's not a matter that you should shut someone down. It's a matter of let's think about our impact on other people when we do things. And I think maybe... I mean, this all could go to heck in a handbasket, but yeah. I think he was able to answer that in a way that may have proved fruitful, not just to salvage political career, but the possibility of having a white, middle-aged man who is obviously privileged. I mean, his his father was former, they have prime ministers up there? Uh, I don't I know. So, something like yeah, that. You know. Yeah. And for him to be able to, to in front of, to be able to, 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 to own this, um, that may be a wonderful thing. Yeah, so so you've been saying. I mean, this is a uh, this is uh, we're we're experiencing growing pains in a way because this is such a huge issue to our society. It permeates everything, and now we're really getting this um, sort of struggle that we're trying to come through to get to a good place in this. And these are the growing pains that are well, causing we, us problems we when the, we have this cancel culture mm-hmm. take charge of uh, something well, like that. If 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 we if we want to own this and say there is such a thing as cancel culture. We see this notion, we've talked in here before about the difference between assimilation and accommodation. Learning at an accommodative level, learning that requires us to to rewrite and re rewire the internal maps we have, always come with some minimal trauma. Yeah. They require conflict. They require pain. That's just they just do. Struggle and suffering, you know, the uh, one of my favorite quotes for in for folks who come to therapy, our goal is not to stop suffering but to get people to suffer better right there is something about the pain that we feel that grow us and as a society we're in this place this is a place of growth and struggle and sometimes maybe we overdo it and some people get hurt some people we underdo it and people continue to be hurt in ways that we want to stop but Mm. we're in the process of finding some balance in this and i there's an inherent struggle there's 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 an inherent pain in that you know, I was thinking when we have the um, the, the the white uh, cancel culture folks coming after someone and feeling more pain than the actual victim does, it's all it's overcompensation. It's mm. over empathic. Is it too much well, empathy? Is there such a thing as too much? Empathy I would argue with this, that it's, it's too far. It's projective in a way because okay. what happens is I can I can take my own um, discomfort, my own. Um, 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 
uh, I don't use the word racist, but maybe, maybe we could say that there are things inside of me that I won't have to own. I can put it in someone else and then burn them in effigy or burn them literally. It right. literally doesn't have to, you know, to be able to, uh, it, it doesn't allow me to have to really own the parts of me that may f- think those racist Asian jokes are funny. Or, right. you know, and I, so I think that there's something truly projective about it, mm-hmm. and that lends itself to um, um, it becomes despairingly and depressingly only assimilative. It just allows us to continue. And Zizek right, would say, right. and then th- this will be his criti- criticism of what he calls political correct culture, is that the problem is that it, it, he talks about this with the new things with straws. And he says, you know, the problem is not that um, we sh- we shouldn't be thinking about straws, but the problem right. is that's all we'll think about, and then we'll stop. Right. We're not okay. thinking about the fact that as individuals we certainly have an impact, but the vast majority of impact on the environment comes from corporations, comes from countries. Sure. And so what happens is we all decide to stop selling straws as an individual, yeah, and we okay. don't in we any do. way hold accountable the system and the, the, the other things in place it's that need to be challenged. Much, yeah, it's causing much more harm. Yeah, and so his, co- his concept is, okay, the problem is, so, okay, we, uh, you know, we, um, we uh, get this comedian fired for telling uh, racist jokes, racist Asian jokes, but we don't think about anything about the Asian countries that we have subjugated for our iPhones or that <laughs> there are people right. being ground under the dust all around us to be able to prop up our first world culture. Nobody asks those questions because we're focused on this. So his idea would be you have to be careful that um, uh, we, we can be stuck in thinking we're doing something when really all we're doing is just the smallest thing while the other problems continue. And those are systemic. Wow. Mm-hmm. Okay. That, that, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, he's, he's got a, a great point. And the idea of projection really is about the person doing the cancel culture mm-hmm. idea. It's really about them mm-hmm. in some way boosting up their ego or getting their mm-hmm. 15 seconds of fame. Or well, whatever. I mean, and, 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 and he, he's, a, he's, he's a Marxist, so he, his criticism would also be that there's something inherent in capitalism itself. There's something inherent in unchecked growth, this notion of the movement and the the generation and selling of products that lends itself to once somebody has a place at the table, we we take away their teeth and we sell them things. Mm. So someone who comes outside the table has a truth to bring us. Uh, They are bringing something that we need to hear, but instead we find a way to get them to to assimilate and whatever, whatever... minimal and necessary they trauma they bring to us we find a way to cancel that may be the thing that's canceled and potentially in quote cancel culture mm-hmm. you know like mm-hmm. he uses a lot to when he talks about um transgendered individuals he says the problem is our rush and move to suddenly normalize this and place at the table keeps us from thinking about there's a truth they bring to us there is we've all bought into notions of gender We've all bought into notions of, of being gendered at, at a Western level, for instance, that we're not questioning at all. That right. there's, there's something about, you know, there, there is something inherent in their experience that is universal. And that universal experience we need more of, not less of. And instead, suddenly, he says, you know, suddenly you'll, you'll see transgender individuals represented in, in uh, Gap commercials or uh, they're eating a Big Mac and the problem is, okay, it's good that suddenly that, you know, that there is representation so individuals who've been suffering alone all this time now can see themselves reflected back. And mm-hmm. that's a wonderful thing. Mm-hmm. But it, it's not so wonderful if, if it suddenly so normalizes that we don't get a sense of the truth they have to bear on us and what they may bring. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I, I'm glad you mentioned the advertising uh, thing, too. And I, I would like for us maybe to talk about that in a future show. But uh, the advertising sometimes is on the cutting edge. Those adver- uh, the big agencies that are putting this ad up to get more dollars in the capitalism mm-hmm. culture here um, or maybe doing a, a, a service to bring those people out well, and, and those kind of things. I know it's a profit margin there for sure, but... Well, Marx talks about this when he, he talked about, uh, he quoted Shakespeare, that under capitalism, all that's solid melts in the air. 
And, uh, you know, the person who um, said that um, capitalism was the greatest invention of mankind was Marx because he saw suddenly we had this tool that could generate, it could level things, and it could begin to melt systems and institutions in such a way that we could melt them down and then, re and then recast them. There was a possible ability of moving from these, this rigid feudalism to, um, to uh, the liberal democracy that we have, but we have to keep melting and casting. That there is that that's that's not and his idea broadly speaking from you know there's lots of different variations of communism and whatever your thoughts on that are all but the idea is that slowly but surely it goes from a rigid structure to we're all in it together and the right. whole idea behind you know at, at its best and there are things that are not so good but at its best it's the notion that how do we think about ourselves as a as a collective that we are all in this together. And that what do we need to do together, you know? And right. again, Zizek's right. criticism of the straw thing may be that it, it throws it back on the individual and away from us, thinking about that we're all on this together. The great ship Earth is going to yes. is has all of us on it. Brings us to the climate yeah. change issue yeah, too. And yeah, that's, that we've uh, got to be together. Greta, on that one. What is what's your last name? Third. third? Oh, uh, Thurberg. Thurberg. Sir? Greta Thurberg. Yeah. Which, by the way, lots of people upset about that. She uh, sailed the boat. She arrived here, and um, if you haven't seen her, uh, that video of her, you need to watch it. Uh, pretty incredible. So maybe another step in the process of getting us to pay attention to the planet uh, mm -hmm. for our future, for That's our children, and so there's forth. There's a quote so from Zizek. Really interesting, we're, we're but a lot of controversy from a lot of people, too. So well, well Zizek talks about, he, he had a quote for about, about Thurberg that uh, came out a couple of days ago, and he thought that, you know, he's an advocate of, of, of a form of violence. He okay. says that, um, that the time is not to, to for accommodation and compromise. The time is now for a scream. And that he, f he felt that there was an important amount of anger in her. And that she represents, of, you know, how dare you. Right. right. This and, is my future. Yeah. That kind of thing. So, yeah. and, it, and in that the way, tears it, in her eyes. Right. The time. And yeah. it demands something as opposed to, you know, a softness or a, a, a call to some sort of compromise. And he even said that, you know, the fact that she didn't have um, a set list of things we need to do, she didn't come with a um, with an itinerary. Right. That's actually, for him, from his perspective, good because there should be an explosion first. There should be – it should rock things. And then – then um, he, he talks about um, – ever seen that movie V for Vendetta? Uh, it's got yes, that – um, uh, what's uh, It's got that Natalie Merchant. No, no, she was – she's Portman. Portman, yeah. Natalie yeah. Merchant was, okay. was the singer from 10,000 Maniacs. Okay. Yeah. Remember those guys? 10, uh, obscure reference. <laughs> <Let's go. laughs> yeah. Yeah. Natalie Portman. And she was in it. And Zizek has a famous statement because, you know, at the end of the film – there, everybody like puts on the mask, and there's all this sort of revolution. He said, actually, the most important thing is the next day, right. because something big has happened. How do you sustain the necessary violence of that event? How does it move forward in a way that is that is a um, that we are um, um, what's the term? Uh, uh, Badu uses it's you use it in marriage. You are not devotion, but um, Ah, I'll, I'll think of it. Okay. But we have to maintain our invest fidelity. We have yes. to maintain okay. our fidelity to the event. So there's this violent rupture, and then we have to maintain fidelity to it. In some ways, Badu talks about this, that love is like that too. Love is a violent thing. It suddenly rips the world apart, and there's one person above all else that you have this level of investment, even above and beyond yourself, and it is a violence, and it is a divine violence. And then after, what we're called for is to say yes to the person we love every single day. Every time we see them, every time we wake up, we're, there is a call to fidelity. And if we do not answer that call, if we become uh, distracted or we begin to say no instead, distraction is usually the, the greater crime, then we've no longer allowed ourselves to continue to grow with the necessarily viol necessary violence of that event. So, right. So it's really important that these are not just event, isolated events, and now we go on to uh, things as normal, but we, we continue to pay attention require, to them and do something yeah, better. Just like a, they require the work, the, the, the truth 
always demands something of us and will continue to. When uh, evangelical ministers talking about that, can when you've been convicted by the truth, you can't go back. Right. And if in fact that's a definition of evil, knowing the truth, but going against it. Uh, that's an also a Bedouin notion. I'm going to be uh, doing an, uh, an ethics uh, keynote address oh, yeah. for the Georgia Counseling Association in January. And that's oh, going to be my thing. We're going to talk a lot about this Badu. They don't know what to, they have no idea what they're getting into. No, they don't. And I I need to send a message to that group just to warn them ahead <laughs> of time. Not yet, uh, yes, I yes. want to make sure they're ready for this. Uh, and the other hand, that when the entire audience is silent and mm-hmm. looking at you after you've made mm-hmm. that. Comment. Usually, I see be. people like uh, masses of folks with pitchforks and torches. Yes, that's usually what happens. Usually, that's and, and, I can, I, and then I, at I some totally, point, I'm chased into a uh, a, a, a tower, and they start, you know, and then I. Oh, you. That's that, how Frank. That, that's a movie. Ended. That's Frankenstein. That's, yeah. So no, that's, that's how not, it ended. Yeah. But but it could be it could be interesting to say. All right, we'll uh, we'll come back to that at, at cer- certain point. All right, so let's let's uh, kind of summarize a little bit here. This cancel culture. Um, mm-hmm and what's happening because uh, it's this projection process that people white privilege in some cases I guess that's what we're talking about uh, kind of coming to the aid of someone else in a different culture and then going overboard and let's expand the categories maybe part of it is this projective um, a a, a disowning by uh, uh, those in the um, the, let's say uh, the privileged white folk who are who are that's that's part of it. Part of it could also be individuals. You know, I mentioned pitchforks and, and torches. There are people who've been kept out the table long enough that they're angry, right? And maybe some of their anger is incendiary, and it needs to be channeled. It needs. It's in some ways, it's the the difference between um, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. You know what is mm-hmm. you know what 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 is the path we take with it? So maybe that's a category as well. Right. And okay. uh, and maybe the third category could be there are individuals, maybe some of them who are who are afraid for various reasons, who come up with this this idea of cancel culture as a way, and even the the, the name, the definition, is a way to delegitimize the the movements that we're seeing that are you know the Me Too movements and the growing of society in ways right. that are that are necessary. And. Um, and maybe there's a, a category uh, to to quote uh, 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 the Dark Knight who just want to see things burn. There's a, we see mm-hmm. this troll culture. So there mm-hmm. are folks who just see a fire and want to throw yes. things on it just to get it to burn brighter. Right. So maybe and there may be more categories than just yeah. those. Yeah. But it, there's a complexity here. And what I think we're trying to demonstrate in in this moment is the opposite of what Beyond talks about when we don't think how to think this. How to be okay. Let's look at the complexity of this. Try to find as many vertices as we can. Okay. Try to be able to allow ourselves to be discomfort, to be to suffer in not rushing to any certainty. And then right. if we can stay in that state. Now, that's the parallel, I think, with therapy. Part of what happens when we generate the right holding space in therapy is the individual can suffer just enough to be able to think they're suffering. There's no too quick movement to to get rid of this through action, mm-hmm. to get mm-hmm. rid of it by just some sort of black and white thinking. Quick it is this something, yeah. to be able to think about it. If someone sure. I, someone came into the other day to my office and they were taught, the first thing they said is, you know, I've got ADHD. Not does, it doesn't mean that they don't have that, <laughs> but they came in and it's they were in a place of despair. I can't focus and I never will, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, the medication they gave me doesn't work. Nothing seems to work. So our ability to create a space where they could bring this in, we could suffer with it a little, chew on it a little, and then begin to think about it. And as we begin to think about it, it begin to expand. They begin to talk about their marital conflict. They begin to talk about some of the financial concerns they have. They begin to talk about their family history. And suddenly this one thing that seemed, uh, at, for a brief moment, became many things, right. all of them with their own sort of uh, flavor, a color of suffering. And once we expand that, then we can begin to think about it. And then we can begin to say, well, no wonder you can't focus. Look how overwhelmed you are. Look mm-hmm. at every time you pick mm-hmm. up a textbook. It's, it's supposed to be the thing that lifts you out of this pit you're in. It's supposed to be the thing that cuts your chains. It's supposed to be the thing that if you don't make A's in, then, one, then, the, then the family who said you could never do this are going to tell you that, you, you know, that this was pointless. That so it's suddenly you know and, and in doing that we begin to we begin to it, it 
it no longer has the weight or pressure it had before, and the person can move just slightly differently. They can be a little more agile. They can, they can duck and weave just a little as opposed to a weight around their neck that just sort of sinks them. Right. We need to uh, apply this therapy thing to the nation at, at large, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we've said that before. Everybody mm -hmm. might need a little therapy. But what is that? The other line from, um, well, that's actually from uh, the original Batman, Tim Burton. This town needs an enema. That's not. That's not what. Uh, th that's not where we were and where we needed to go. So uh, I don't know. <laughs> part, of, part of my job here. I don't know what my job is. Something to think of it. It's, it's Jack Nicholson made a good Joker. Am I wrong? Yeah. He did. He made a good Joker. Well, yeah, of course yeah. he did. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah, that was great. Well, is this movie coming out, The Joker? Is that the title yeah, of the Yeah, Jack movie? Nicholson's in that. Is he in that? No, no, no. But, uh, not a, but the new one's You know, it's Danny not a DeVito. Not Batman, by the way. I'm trying to... Uh, yes, what? Danny DeVito. He's in that, right? Isn't he the Joker? No. Uh, he, pl he played the penguin in <laughs> oh, one of the movies. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. James. I got to bring you up to speed on some of this. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, no, I think... Uh, what, what was our point? All right, so we talked about the cancel culture. And that's kind of got into some very interesting um, uh, points today. And I appreciate everything we talked about. Any final words on this, uh, yeah, this yeah. idea? What about the people who are in this cancel culture? Culture, what would you say to them? Well, you, 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 what, what, what I would say is it's a time to think. And that, uh, again, I'll quote Zizek again. There's a famous saying by him. He said that, um, he says two things. He says, um, uh, don't act, think, and um, resistance is surrender. And uh, both those mean that huh? there is a way in which we have to allow ourselves the necessary amount of suffering before we do anything. Because it can be painful to think. And yes. so if there is any legitimacy that, there's, that there is such a thing as cancel culture, then it may be that people are acting before they think, that they are discharging the necessary suffering. Um, if this SNL guy was fired because of the racist jokes, and I, I, don't, I haven't heard the jokes, and I, right, I, I'm, right, I'm making yeah, all sorts of assumptions either. here, but if they were, what if before we did anything, we allowed ourselves as individuals and a collective to think about this? And think about what mm -hmm. should be done. And maybe right. it's enough to give this guy a public shaming and then allow him to keep his job. But he's, you know, don't be doing that. Just like the, the child. The mom doesn't, you know, doesn't kill the child. Right. There's and a, there's a shaming. The yeah, and what right. often happens is, and, and Shore makes this point, that shame is that there is both first the shaming and then there's the rescue. The mm -hmm. mom says, shame on you for doing that. And then the child cries, and then the mom picks the child up and sues them. So Shame's point in this is it's a point in the narrative that generates the, uh, the potential for changing behavior rapidly. But there's a second step that we got to think about, and that second step is what do we do next? And maybe that's what I might apply to this. Maybe it's not enough for us to simply excise certain folks, but to say what we need to say, allow the folks in the collective to speak their mind, but then move to be human and kind in some way that all folks concerned might be able to be better for what happened. All right, I like it. That's a great place to end. Thank you, Dan. I also want to thank our producer, Dr. Tom Hackett, at the helm over there. So, mm -hmm. uh, hey, we'll see you mm -hmm. next time. Next time you should wear a shirt, though. Please. And pants. Yes. Saturday. It is. And uh, I'm glad to have you in the studio. So Without uh, the hack. We have, we're not being hacked. The well, hack is not here. We, we are not. Uh, our executive producer is um, on location um, <laughs> somewhere <laughs> else. Not this location, turns out. So... Um, I think he's probably in an alleyway somewhere just <laughs> trying to... Just, just, well, he's woke you, up... Uh, 
you you uh, can work that out with him when he comes. It's funny back, when I but, uh, last time I was in New Orleans, I always forgot what it's like when you're walking back and you see. Or we got up in the morning to go oh, to yeah. breakfast, New Orleans, and right. all the people who were drunk on the side of the street, <laughs> and these are not like homeless people. These look like people who. You know, just got drunk and couldn't make it home. <laughs> right, they were they, well dressed, but yeah, they were there laying. Some uh, of them on were the wearing sidewalks. suits. Okay, I just picture Hackett's like you know, like he had a really good time, and but he's not here. He he had a, we went out of town. He's probably like an Opelika. Or, uh, uh, no, it's probably it's probably further out than that. I'm not for sure, but um, he'll be back next week and he'll uh, he'll tell us all about this, it. Produce this show, by the way, that we're he about really, to have uh, here. I like uh, I like the hack. Well, he's he's a pretty cool guy. He's helping us here. Yeah. We're. Uh, I'll tell you what. You know what I don't like about effort. that guy though. He's always undressing me with his eyes. That you know, guy. that is not what you get to say. You don't get to say that. I mean, I'm not you know, sure, I um, you you tell what, him next time. To do. I am not a sex object. I'm okay, not a piece of want, meat over you, here. You want me to tell him? No, I'm not going there. And uh, that's not gonna. You tell happen. him I'm, I'm I'm a married man. This is not. You know, it's yeah. not. And dressing with your eyes, you know that's not a thing. That's not a thing that we can talk about here on this uh, on this podcast. So I have the opposite problem. I'm always dressing people with eyes. I'm like, dressing, you know what? Putting... That person should be really wearing like a wool hat. They should be wearing like you know a burka. A big coat I'm putting. Or something. I'm yes. slapping a burka on most people. Just yeah. kind of. No, so. that, that makes sense. I, I kind of I understand that uh, a little bit. So. Um, Yes. Well, it's glad, I'm glad to have you in the studio. So it's Saturday. It's always a good day. <laughs> yeah, you're trying morning. to find a way to erase what we just said. And I'm just going to try to reframe everything that just happened so that we uh, can talk about our topic today. And I'm wondering, what is our topic today? Toxic masculinity. Remember, we were talking about that. I remember, actually. I just wanted you to say it out loud. Toxic masculinity. masculinity. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. That sounds... You know, to prepare for this show, this is what I did. Okay, good. This morning. My uh, son has got sort of his, his days and nights slightly mixed around. We're trying to fix that. But um, right. when I got up this morning, he was up, and I get up rather early. And so I told him, I said, you know, I'm doing this podcast this morning. I'm doing on toxic masculinity. And, you yeah. know, just I wanted his take on it. Yeah. So, yeah. And my son, he's uh, 47. No, he's, no, he's, he's, he's 12. 12. He's yeah, about to turn 13. Tomorrow is his birthday. Oh, really? He's about to be 13. About to. About well, to, let's do a shout out. That's right. The B man is about to uh, hit yes. the big one three. Oh man! And, and um, change your life, by the way. It's already happening. I rough. think adolescence has already hit us with, uh, <laughs> like, a category five. Uh, it's taking you out. Yeah, There's it's, it's no not doubt a, yeah, about it's it. Already, the it's, thirteens it's are going to rule the world. So there you go. But, Good um, luck with that. But I was asking him like this. You know, what, what I asked him, I just sort of get a sense from him. So he's he's someone who is in the process of of um, of having to deal with his gender. He is having to uh, to to begin that dance of what it is to be a man and what you know what what right. he would. And so I asked him about Ty, and I, he, and I said, what is your definition of toxic masculinity? I okay. said, what, what did he say? And he said, well, it's usually, he said, somebody who is um, very aggressive, um, they, okay. Um, okay. They, uh, if they have conflict, they want to fight. And he said, they're basically jerks, you know? And then I said, well, what, what are the tropes? And he said, well, you know, they, can, they like guns, and um, they're, you know, big trucks, and um, what did he say? He said... Um, and they want to fight a lot. That's what he said. Okay, okay. And so I asked him, I said, well, so what is you, what do you think, of what is being masculine? Because he identifies as, you know, um, um, funny story on that. Isn't okay, it? You know, there you go. That was a, yeah, that's a cliffhanger. Because, you know, because yeah. you're supposed to start in talking about your kids about the birds and the bees and all that sort of stuff pretty early on. And so, right. you know, talking with my, my kid, this was like a couple of years ago. And okay, I'm like, you know, okay. As you know, one of these days you may find someone you really love, and I always keep it gender neutral and whatnot, because you know he may—I don't know—he's straight gay. I don't know. I don't. My, my yeah. son, he could, there could be a lot of things. Whatever. But I always keep it gender neutral. You know, right. you may find someone and whatnot. And then about the third or fourth time of me doing this, he turned to me and he said, "Dad," he said, "I know what you're doing." And um, he is I'm not gay. Than you. <laughs> <laughs> he said, he said he's "I'm not. not gay." Okay. It's okay to be gay, and that's nothing wrong with being gay and all that. But I'm not gay, and okay. so you can drop that part. <laughs> okay. All right. That, so I know, said, "Okay, okay, we got, we got this." I, and, I knew from the beginning that your son was smarter than you, and he <laughs> well, was but the bar is already out. set pretty and, low, uh, and it's honest. already pretty low, so he can jump <laughs> right really now. High there, there are thing. loaves of bread out there smarter <laughs> than me. I'm not saying you know. So that's all not right, a, but I mean, you know, that's a very, I mean, at 20 Twelve. He's he's drawing those conclusions. He was already saying it's not you know. Work, we yeah. also this is you know we, we've we've 
we keep them away from like R-rated movies and whatnot. So um, we went to see this. Ever seen this? This the Hellboys? The, one of them Hellboys? Oh yeah, yes, yes, yes. Fantasy. From, yeah, it's that uh, comic book Mac, series. Mac, Mag, Mag, Magnolia, I think, is a guy. Mac Magnolia. I used to read these things when. Um, wonderful comic books, by the way. If you ever get a chance. Books, first, uh, first couple of movies were by um, uh, Gilmore del Toro. Yes. Who is a wonderful director, but they re- they remade the movie with a different director and whatnot, and so we went to see it. Now it was rated R, but I was thinking, okay, it's because there's going to be violence. We show up, and there are things on there. You know, there are right. there are things going on, and at one point, I have to, you know, I turn to my son and I said, you know, I'm not sure if you should this, be seeing this, right. seeing this. And he said, he said, no, I don't worry, I know all about this sort of stuff. My your mommy gave me a pamphlet. <laughs> okay. And I said, all right. Okay, so no. So she gave you a pamphlet. Got a pamphlet. What's in that well, pamphlet? I, I want to see know. the pamphlet. You need that pamphlet. Mm, I think I'm I probably, I, she probably should have, you know, I wanted to say, you, you know, your in mom. That pamphlet with an X across the When thing, we started dating, your it? mom should have gave me this pamphlet. Where was this pamphlet when I needed it? Because it could have come in handy. Man, that's a powerful <laughs> yeah. pamphlet. And I picture the say. pamphlet's probably like a, it's like a, it's got pop out, like you open up, doo, oh, you know, whoa, like, what is what this? Kind of a, but, okay, yeah. no, no, that's not but, right. Um, so I was asking my kid about this. He's it, got it covered. Most of the time when you're kind of a little concerned about um, yeah. bringing the subject up, he says, hey, relax, Dad. I got this, I, I you, got know, this been, you know, I've been, you know, I've right, been, you know, I've been listening to some Andrew Dice Clay. But, <laughs> oh, uh, there we go. But yeah, but a uh, bing. But, um, <laughs> For real. So, uh, but but I'm asking about this, this you know, mask and stuff. And so he, I ask him, he says, well, you know what? Uh, I like guns too. I think they're cool. So, okay, so that that's okay. not necessary. He says, yeah, so... What is you know? And I asked him, so, so what kind of guy do you think you want to be? And he said, Well, you know, wow, uh, yeah, I, the, the, the jury's kind of out on this, but you know, I, I don't want to be a jerk. Okay, so I thought okay. that was that's a pretty good thing. Oh yeah, it's a pretty good answer uh, to a very tough mm, question. What is that, yeah. uh, that you're asking a twelve year old your son? So yeah, hey, this hold is off where on my, my, <laughs> my mind went on this because it's my son. I wanted to say so. What I wanted to ask him: What sort of picture am I giving you of masculinity? Like, what what am I? Um, is okay, this, a, this sounds a lot. This this really <laughs> does sound like a question uh, you want to answer for you, for yourself. Yeah, I want to tell like, you're it? asking a twelve year old to I'm help like, you what, out here somehow. Like, well, I don't well, know. You know, he and I are talking about manhood, and I'm I'm supposed to be in some way sort of an, an example of what that would be. And you know, uh, and I'm hoping, like you know, what I'm trying not know. to roll my eyes over here. Go ahead. Yeah, well. that's what you know. What 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 what, what is that supposed to look like? And uh, you know, I didn't outright ask him, but I, I wonder, like, what, like you know, like yeah. like if you think about like like your dad or or yeah. um, men in your life who presented some sort of um, oh yeah, uh, we would say psychodynamic or psychologically that there's a difference between what's known as the ideal ego and the ego ideal. Okay. And the difference is that. You know, both of those are, are in some ways um, internalized. They are, um, they're like um, stars in the sky that we we aim towards or compass points. And um, the the ego, the ideal ego, is um, is is much more fixed. It is something that we have to be and that we always fall short of. It is tyrannical in a sense. Okay. And the ego ideal is more like. Okay, this is something that I think I might want to be, and it it provides guidance. And you can think of it like I think I've used an example before when we did a podcast back like three hundred years ago. Right. But um, yeah, we've done a few. We have we've done a few, and uh, like if if somebody came in and I, I was talking about this with with a seminar I was teaching, and I was like, one of my ego ideals and a picture of masculinity for me, okay. Mister Rogers. Right. Okay. I like that guy. You know. Okay. So um, if it were an ego ideal, then I you know this guy he's nice. I like the way he talks to people. I think he has a legacy that's pretty cool. I think I'll try to walk this a little and see if I can't bring things in. Okay. The ideal ego would be every day you wake up and you say, God, I'm not going to be like this. Or you at the end of the day, you go, I really fell short of all right. this. God, right, I'm, right. A, I'm a piece of crap. So I think there's a connection between this ideal ego and toxic masculinity. Okay. I think that there is nothing about masculinity or anything that would fall under the trope of masculinity. Maybe it's something I talk about if there's such a thing. But if there is such a thing as masculinity, right. you know, trucks and guns are cool. That's why people have them. But whenever they fall under the shadow of, of something that is that is tyrannical, they become potentially toxic. 
Does that make sense? Right. Well, it's, mm-hmm. it's um, kind of reactive to the environment or something mm-hmm. in the situation. They fall back. They're always short of it. Mm-hmm. So they may just overreact to that. I'm going to be more macho and fight and mm-hmm. do all the other things. Well, you don't, you don't hear about, about, about this concept much, but in the old days, you may, you're, if you're reading about this, they used to call it homosexual panic. Okay. Have you heard that before? Yeah. It's been a while back. I mean, yeah, I one of my mean. favorite bands, by the way. Last time I saw Homosexual Panic, say, you know, it's back in the '90s. There, there are a lot, a lot of Favorite, bands yeah. that uh, you bring in that I've never heard of, yeah. and uh, but yeah, they're out there evidently. It was so the best heavy metal disco band that ever. You know, it's, okay. it was just uh, those guys. You know, sometimes they <laughs> might need to research their name and title. Yeah, their their bit, symbol but. was a um, was was one of those uh, one of those disco balls. What do you call it? Uh, mirror balls. Yeah, the mirror balls with thing, spikes. Yeah. With spikes, okay. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that was, so that's combining a couple of things. <laughs> that there, is, that, it uh, like that. It's, I like what they were doing, but the old idea of homosexual panic was that um, that um, if you stirred in another man feelings of it could be any feeling of intimacy, really, it would become rapidly sexualized, and they would become angry, and they would often act out. Right. Often becoming violent, right? Like you know, like um, um, you're questioning their masculinity. Right. What are you talking about? You calling yeah. me gay? You, you talking to me? You know Boom. that sort of thing. That's that sort of thing happens, and I, I think that we don't talk about this notion of homosexual panic uh, anymore because you know we've become to, we're, we've been able to embrace and become more balanced in terms of sexuality and and sure. and whatnot. But I still think that in some ways what we refer to as toxic masculinity or would be a, a version of that homosexual panic, an attempt to be able to embrace a masculine trope in such a way that it it keeps you from having to think or feel things that the environment is inducing in you. Maybe right, right, and it, mm-hmm. and it, and then comes out uh, mm-hmm. in the interactions with others, mm-hmm. and you're kind of proving something that you can't prove necessarily. Mm-hmm. So you're you're sort of fighting the tide a little bit with mm-hmm. that. Well, I find that I find that whole thing kind of kind of interesting. I mean, are we? Uh, are, is this just we're just defining terms better now? We're trying to figure out what's going on with. Them. I mean, if it's an ideal that we can never reach, well, we'll, we'll think of you know, like we have uh, to settle on some of that, right? We'll think of one of the earliest pictures of masculinity in a way was, and I think about this, um, the Marlboro Man. Yes. Now, a lot of people may not remember who that is, but for the longest time, this was you know the lone cowboy. You know, smoking by himself. You know, right? Uh, rugged, masculine rugged guy out on the frontier. He's yeah, got he's the very, cattle drive and all of those. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah a, you know, that's right. and um, that was sort of, in a way, an ideal ego. It was uh, the notion that you know you don't cry. You have right. to be this. Um, uh, to, you have to be an army of one. You have to be solitary. You have to to maintain a control. Um, you have to be. Um, capable of violent action mm. if the uh, situation requires it, you know, quick with the gun, you know. Yeah. And um, I think... That's a legacy that lives on, does it not? <laughs> I guess there's, well, there's so much of, of that in, in these days. And, and, and just one side a piece of that is that people... Uh, you can encounter very violent people mm-hmm. who can cause, want to cause you harm, mm-hmm. and so there's some... Mm-hmm. There's some need for well, that well, in some times, in some ways. Think about some of the um, some of what his um, the the, uh, the the incel community. You remember, you know the incels, right? Sure. Yeah. Again, uh, not we mentioned them on the show before. Yeah. So, not yeah, one of my know. favorite bands, the incels. But yeah, uh, that's right. Not a good name uh, these days. Right? And, uh, well, a small audience of mainly men. <laughs> it is <laughs> all men. Yes. Yeah, right. Uh, the involuntary celibates, and that, again, this is a, a subculture that, that gets a lot of flack maybe for the wrong reasons, but there's this notion somehow that that um, to be a dude, um, to be worthwhile of, of, of being a member of your gender, you have to be, you have to have a girlfriend, you have to have these things, you have to have, and that also carries that weight of the ideal ego. And I've encountered a number of patients I've worked with who, uh, we we call um, in the shrink biz causing the cause when the very thing that you are afraid of happening the things that you do to keep it from happening cause it to happen. Right. I mean, literally, it's a and so the idea of um, um, I can think of a uh, patient I worked with a, few, a while back who desperately wanted a girlfriend and would talk about all the ways in which you know 
you know, there are all these men that seem less attractive than he was, had less, didn't have the success he had, but they always had girlfriends and he didn't. But when you begin to talk about how he would approach a woman, uh -oh. he would approach them with an air of either um, truly remarkable desperation okay. uh, or uh, the opposite. Um, and approach them in such a way that he was signaling to them that they were a thing he needed, sort of like he were buying rims for his car. Right. right, right, and right. either one of those send a message to the individual you're approaching that, man, this is probably not somebody this I should is, be. Yeah, I yeah should that's be. A immediate turnoff for a lot of people, <laughs> and he needs something in the middle between those two. Maybe needs, we can you know, find another approach. You know, I mean, he, you know, he, he, we, we would say in the in my end of the biz that if he were to approach them as a whole object. With some right. genuine interest in maybe this is someone who I might want to just hang out with for at least an hour and find out who they are. Right. Maybe that would uh, that would be that would be nice, <laughs> you know, as opposed to you know either one of those uh, had uh, and and I think I think to a degree he was he was trapped by this this ideal ego this notion that there's a thing that he has to be, and he is constantly falling short of it, and I think to a degree that that is the the mixture of. You know, if you think of um, um, part of the incel manifestos that are that are would be considered toxic, there's this notion that women, and they'll often recur, they'll use the word females, they'll say females are. And okay. so they make these broad generalizations about the opposite sex using a term that already carries weight as if they're, or you've already right. part objectified someone and it's made them the a... the way you say the yeah, word. It's in, in, female. In the it's yes, like, oh, right. yeah. it's already got a, it's already got, there's already sort of a, it's like you've rang the misogynistic bell already. Ding! It's, it's there. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> with the way they say it. And um, uh, their approach is, has such a mixture of envy and anger and uh, underneath that is disowned shame. It's being driven, I think, by this, by somehow that there are people out there in, in the world, m other men less than them who have more than them, and these women choose them, and so it, it creates this this toxin, this swirl of of of, and it's driven by envy and jealousy and you well, know, all and, the wrong reasons. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's um. Yeah. Which is yeah. an aside, I, I, I was listening to a, a podcast and they were talking about the difference between envy and jealousy. And I, and I often find that it's difficult to tease those two apart. But right. uh, I think jealousy is wanting the thing that someone has and envy is not wanting the person to have the fun that you're not having. Okay. And there's a difference between those two points. And right. one of them is more toxic. Like with sure. jealousy, you could say, man, I wish I had that boat. Right. You know, and right. then maybe you you know you get an extra job at you know the Cracker Barrel, okay. <laughs> and you save up money, and then you, you get a dinghy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, that's uh, right. I'm Morris. In the world of boats, I'm a dinghy. Okay, but um, could say a joke there, but I'm leaving alone. Right <laughs> yeah, this there. is that's good. That was okay. good. <laughs> but uh, um, Indy, however, is has has a touch. Uh, Melanie Klein says that the 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 um, uh, the main root of evil is envy. It is knowing that someone has the good and as opposed to trying to give the good to yourself or maybe even some admiration and gratitude that good exists, you simply want it destroyed. Wow. All right. Wow, you don't want to own it. You just want to take it out. I want the, right. you know, I, the world. I am not happy and you have this thing, so I will take it from your hand and I will destroy it. And in some right. ways, when we see some of the manifesto of some of the school shooters we've seen, there's an element of that in it. Right. To go mm -hmm. in and uh, to um, to kill the chads and uh, what do they call the the women? The men were called chads. That hmm. was uh, one of the one of the school shooters. Um, there's the guy who shot up the sorority. I can't think of his name. And his in some of the videos that he has online that you right. can watch, he talks about that. And there's this this um, it's. Uh, narcissistic wounds, a feeling of entitlement, and just a, a, a string of toxic envy. Right. Yeah. Wow. This is uh, this is pretty heavy stuff, but it seems like it's in our culture now. Is this all cultural? Is this, is, I mean, I know we're talking psychoanalytic. We're talking the individual. And the, By the way, I'm giving a paper at Psychoanalysis and Culture in a couple of weeks. Oh, come on. Yeah. And you know what well, the title of that paper is? Uh, no. I'm, I'm <laughs> it is, uh, wondering um, a little bit now. It's, um, 
Feed the rich or eat the rich? Has psychoanalysis betrayed the middle class? Uh, How about that? Sorry. Wow. I wow. I wonder. Yeah. <laughs> we uh, we How need about to that, hear, uh? hear more about that. And hopefully. Well, I've uh, got to write it because right now it's just a title. Okay. That, that's a thought. <laughs> and we got to get that thing in I paper. Yeah. And then you got to come in and help us understand what this, where, you, where you're well, going we'll with that paper. For but sure. we, we talk about the culture in this. Like, yeah. I was also thinking in my own journey in terms of being able to get a handle on what masculinity means. And as you know, I'm probably one of the most masculine people you know, right? Uh, hold, on like, for, hold on for this. <laughs> okay, go. <laughs> okay, maybe, maybe, maybe. Just want to get Actually, that Actually, the hack, he might be... Uh, <laughs> the hack is a good thing he's that guy is come across the table right now. And that guy is a chunk of man. That guy is a chunk of man. Am I wrong? I mean, Listen, that guy is... Uh, the nice. hack is out cutting trees off the property <laughs> and saying, yeah. dragging them you off. Know, the, yeah, he's doing all of that. So, you know, yeah. just shaking his hand, you get such a shot of testosterone, you're like, body hair, like, grows. <laughs> like, you know. Now, I, I shook his hand once, and I got hair in places I didn't know I even had. Oh. That's <laughs> I mean, a, we need to hear that. All right. That's how so, uh, that I'm so, glad, <laughs> glad he's not here to hear all of this. So he could defend himself, I'm sure, at least. No, no, but, no. Uh, he's, so, okay. so... Um, uh, I was thinking about this this my own journey in masculinity. Maybe you can sure. think about f for you, like what, like how you yep. began to, you know. And I remember as a kid, I was um, I was probably close close to my son's age, and we had um, I come from a rural area in Tennessee, and cable had just happened. Okay, we'd heard about cable in some other cities, right? And we'd heard that it exists, yeah. <laughs> but up until about the age of thirteen or fourteen, I, um, you know, we had three channels, right? And one of those came in. Sometimes, if it rained, right. did you have to go out and hold the antenna or move <laughs> the antenna? It. Yeah, it was, it was all, and they yeah, went off that. at like ten o'clock at night, and all you got was that D. <laughs> That's it. That's right. <laughs> That's what you got, and then uh, just or, pattern, and you're out. And, and then, then the was, snow, right? That's yeah, all you got. You go. And if you woke up in the middle of the night and couldn't sleep, you know, you you know you. You looked at the dog. That's really all. <laughs> that's, that's about it. You had nothing <laughs> yeah. else going. Yeah, the dog was like, we why are you We need to go back and, and just hear more about that uh, in your childhood because it might explain a number of things that we're working on here. <laughs> it could, so, it could. But, there uh, were a lot of other but things. But we don't too. have time for yeah, that right, now, yes. so bring yourself back to that so, question. So, so, right. 13 and 14, I remember watching this, this show came on called Night Flight. And this was actually before MTV, I think. MTV, it maybe it just started, but, and I, but Night Flight was a show that you could watch videos. Okay. And it was on to like one in the morning. Okay. Late. So if it's Friday night and you've you know you're sitting around and as you might want to do as an adolescent or uh, early adolescent, and videos would come on, and I remember yeah. watching the videos. And at that time, I you know my my musical interest had had gone from um, um, Kiss in the uh, third and fourth grade to um, oddly enough ABBA somewhere around the age of nine or ten. Right. And then uh, I think I had. Um, uh, my that sister. disco that explains a lot, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah. All right, here we go. And then my uh, my my sister had left some albums, and one of them was the Moody Blues in Search of the Lost Chord. Yep. And then there was a Styx Classics. album. So both these sort of you know, or that. So I, I was, and, but then yeah. I began to go into a heavy metal phase, and I, I think that in some ways, um, metal was a way to define yourself. Um, growing up in a pretty uh, strict religious uh, uh, community, um, it was a way to sort of to begin to integrate parts of yourself that couldn't be reflected and mirrored back in the culture you were in, you okay. know? And um, I was big into uh, Iron Maiden and Judas Priest, especially Iron Maiden. Okay. You ever go through a Maiden? Did you go through a Maiden phase? Never been there. <laughs> okay. No, no. no. That's, uh, I was more with the progressive English rock stuff. That <laughs> that's you right, that's mentioned right. before. I never yeah. moved off that phase. Well, I, I, I kind of no, no. went to Prague had a, you know, after, after my metal phase, ELP and Yes and... King Crimson and and uh, you know Van de Graaff Generator. If you remember those guys, <laughs> early Genesis. Okay, all right, early <laughs> Genesis, but pre, pre Genesis. Okay, okay. Yeah, well, early time. Genesis will be when when Phil Collins was just the drummer and the yeah, lead singer was no, Peter I Gabriel. I actually saw him in person when he was the drummer in Genesis at one point. Really? Yeah, you, so back in the day. Yeah. You saw, Sorry to admit was, all was, that. Was, that gives you too much about me. But all right, was come Peter back Gabriel to singing at the time? Yeah. Boy, you, that is old. Yeah. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm not saying it's old. Um, that's like, yeah, that's. I'm not. I'm not. I'm gonna let that go. But it was at the Fox Theater in Atlanta, and it was a wonderful concert. Yeah, so boy, that would have been. Boy, I would have killed to see oh, that. Oh yeah, it was, it was fantastic. Was but. Peter Gabriel wearing the the flower yes, pot? Um, hat? Uh, yes, the big box that would rotate around his head and and things like that. See, so yeah, there was a lot of that days. going on. So, but but I think to some degree, music is how we sort of begin. And for my for my son, I think it's it's uh, often video games at this point have been sort of so. But um, 
So um, I remember watching these videos, and um, um, the Talking Heads came on. That's once in a lifetime. And I remember seeing David Byrne, Bar- 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 David Byrne. Yeah, David Byrne. And um, I was like, wow, look at that guy. He's sort of weird. He's odd, mm-hmm. geeky guy. Talented. Yeah, he is. And I was like, you know, I like the song. And then a Van Halen song came on, and there's David Lee Roth. And I was like, God, I am definitely more David Byrne than David Lee Roth. Okay. And really right. struggling with that. Like, okay. you know, yeah, this yeah. is not... Like I gotta this find is this model role this, model out there for and me, I, and, and I, I, I get, you know, I, I think I am, and, and really struggling with, you know, what, just on some level, cognizant of the fact that some of the ideal ego, some of the the um, the pictures of masculinity that were being presented to me, that I, I was not going to be able to fit that, and what did it mean, you know, right. and I think that um, when you mention, like, for me at least, music. And art in general, I've often grabbed. So I will find a a a someone there that I would um, that I would have an interest in that could help define that okay. and help. So and I, I think that that's a journey that that most of us are on. Right. And, and but what about with you? Like, did, did, are you conscious of, of figures well, of masculinity? I, you know, when, that when when you were talking about the, the earlier days when you were a teenager and those kind of things, and um, <laughs> I'm not sure that I had to test any of that out. It mm-hmm. was for me. I was real active and playing ball and doing mm-hmm. all the little team sports and all of the other stuff, riding bikes and doing those mm-hmm. kind of things. And I'm afraid to say it, but I don't think I had a clue about what was going on in that in that process. I can only look back now and try to recall some of it. But, um, well, maybe that's a difference because um, I mean, I can I can list out mm-hmm. some of you know the ones mm-hmm. that we the, the movie stars and other people that we that mm-hmm. we saw, and but I never really like uh, at least consciously I tried to project myself and say who was I. In who am mm-hmm. I in this particular picture or movie mm-hmm. or those kind of things? So, uh, but I know it was happening. But, mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. Really but maybe sure that's the thing happened. because I think that you know that that was not my. I mean, I I rode rode bikes, and uh, hung out with friends and whatnot. But sure. uh, team sports, I was not. That's not a. That's not a world I could move in. Like I was aware that, you know, there was something too aggressive about that. There was something too, um, you know, that that didn't fit. And it couldn't fit, and so um, it it generated a. Um, and maybe that's good. Maybe that, you know, if um, there's a, certainly a lot less angst in the needing to find yourself if there's already sort of a predefined role that you can fit yourself in. Right. Right. I think that you know those were not. Um, well, I think I think one of my struggles it, it, when I was playing little league baseball, and I didn't play football, I played baseball and mm-hmm. those kind of things. But I had to take piano lessons at the same time. So the piano teacher was across the road from the baseball field. And I remember reluctantly, as I entered the piano lessons, looking at the baseball field, thinking, <laughs> wow, I'd rather be there. So there was, a, there was, a, there was all kind of little struggles, yeah, yeah. minor struggles that mm-hmm. were going on during that time. But, um, but it's easy to, because yeah. for you, the baseball field, I can see that, for me, I would see it as a place of dread when I was a kid. Okay, that is a place of humiliation. Oh yeah, you're gonna drop the ball. You're not yeah. gonna catch the fly ball. It's gonna, gonna hit me. Blah, blah, blah. I mean, I remember. I remember a friend of mine, Ian. He was a couple <laughs> years younger than me, but I remember he got. He was playing baseball, and he took it right in the face. Oh and he had come to on! Have like, oh, actually, it was Russ Farmer, and he was in my grade, and he had to have like, like oh, six stitches all over his lip, terrible. and it looked. I mean, he, his whole face was misshapen, <laughs> and I remember thinking to myself. I don't want to get on that that's field. A, that's a dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> what do you, right, you know? Right. And so there was humiliation, danger. <laughs> it was not an area that I could, you know, I could I could excel. So, but the areas I could excel is I was always, you know, I was the smartest kid in class. I was the one that, you know, always got things. And so there was, there was, that was an area that I could feel some comfort in. Like I could, right? I could be in that space and say, okay, this is. This is comfortable. Yeah, well, now to, in to, algebra to, class, I was like, I'm, 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 I'm in my own. I'm, I'm, okay, there you go. <laughs> you okay. were that kid that solved the problem, and then the rest of us looked like, okay, yeah, we're not really sure what, what just happened. Um, but yeah, it's sort of. Uh, there's two things. One, one is that this notion of sort of going back and analyzing that, mm. you 
know, mm-hmm. that's a recall. We've got to go back and kind of project mm-hmm. into that time frame um, to, to make sense out of it. But also doing that in the moment. You know, at that time, you were saying, hey, this is not for me and, mm-hmm. and those kind of things, making those, those choices. Um, does seem like um, our, our culture and our society, what we were talking about a moment ago, mm-hmm. is sort of really begin – we're beginning to look at the nuance of of things now and trying to sort well, these out. I think, I think it's there's an, an element of this that, 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 that's that's interesting because my uh, my son he um, I remember uh, we were playing this. Uh, ever played that, that that game Diablo? This was Diablo two, I think, or three, whatever it is. Video game. Yeah, so we're playing it. A lot of fighting. And you know, and between you and me, I'm not a fan of video games. They make me nervous. But my kid wanted to play video games, so we're going to play the video games. And so, there you go, good dad. And we moving spent, on, moving we along spent hours, like I'm like 12 hours later. My, oh I literally, my goodness! I got we played okay. so much that my thumb got a got a blister on it. Right. And it like I'm and like you couldn't I'm, move it the oh next day. God. What happened? Yeah. It was horrible. My son, he's like. Yeah, yeah, he's got you. Yeah, house, houses. A A B slide, yeah, click. Yeah, he's knowing all these things. All that. So, um, uh, he's like, man, you got to see my new character in Diablo. I'm like, oh, this this character is so cool. This character is wonderful. Boy, tell me, I'll create this cool. Yeah. And so he puts it up, and it's a female character. Okay. And I'm like, okay, this is interesting because when I was his age, that's not what you would. You couldn't possibly, even if you no thought the way. female character was cool, Your you couldn't. You were like. Would just go- <laughs> <laughs> that would be the end of that. <laughs> He'd be like, so as I'm sitting there thinking, <laughs> you know, like it's in, and, and I imagine that if he had other dads, may not be directly, but they would have given him subtle hints. Okay, you know, you can, you can secretly think that's cool, yes, that's right, but yes, don't, right. you know, don't, you know. He goes, yeah, he's talking about the add-ons and the features yeah, and the it armor kind of, here. Yeah, it probably comes out of some worry, too, about how he'll be treated out, and, and that's what parents sure, do. Sure, sure, it's like, you so, know. Yeah, um, but as an aside, my, my my son has like he has like really long hair. It's all the way down to it's all the way down to here. He's okay, got really long hair. And I keep telling him it's cool because right now it's cool to have a transgender kid. So I think right now. Okay, <laughs> you're setting. Him. I'm like okay, you just, you just have he, but he's, <laughs> he's he's not he's not transgender. Yeah. Um, Again, well, that, that's, 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 that other conversation. He said, look, I'm a dude. I'm not. Uh, but I, uh, I really think you need to ask him more questions. He <laughs> seems to have a lot more answers than, uh, than. But but I thought there's something about the culture that shifted. That, that And with every shift, because he can be comfortable identifying with and being interested in um, um, female characters. Sure. He can. He can be sure. interested in um, non-binary characters. He can be interested in, uh, in, in ambiguously gendered characters with, with no – it doesn't seem that there's any tension in him about this. It's not right. a – and right. – so I think there's something about the cultural shift, right. and with any shift, it generates other things. And I think part of what we begin to – I don't think there was the concept of toxic masculinity 20, 30 years ago. No. That's what a dude was. And as it shifted – you know, you, you were playing earlier. What's that guy we were listening to? Uh, Chris D'Elia. Chris uh, D'Elia. Comedian, uh, mm-hmm. has a podcast and a uh, very funny guy. Um, and he was talking about cancel culture. He was talking culture. about cancel culture, and that, that and, was a topic not long ago But, but us, part so, of yeah. what I think drives that, he was talking about, like, why did suddenly Johnny Depp become somebody we hate? Yes. And I yes. think it has what a lot to, to do with, with, with our, our notion of masculinity, of identity, have shifted. And in some ways, at one point, he was riding the wave of that because he represented sort of the, the male who was, who was, um, who was comfortable playing all these, you know, adventurous am- uh, characters. But also, and like he played pirates. ambiguous, uh, the Mad Hatter, um, the uh, Ed Wood, you know, the guy who dressed in drag. Um, he played. Um, he played Edward Scissor's hand. Edward Scissor's yeah, hand. Right there, he yeah. played. Uh, what was the other one where he did um, um, in the remake of Charlie and Chocolate Factory? He played the 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 um, sort of a Michael Jackson as um, the guy who. Uh, um, did you see the remake of Charlie? I, I guess I did, and I'm okay. I'm, st- I'm straining to try to get keep up with that. But, <laughs> but, yeah, but he did so. So at one point, I think he was he was he was right there in the mark of how we were beginning to rethink masculinity, and as a result of that, he, he may no longer be on that mark. There was some domestic violence, or at least uh, um, some uh, um, assertion mm. by his spouse of domestic violence and okay. and whatnot. And um, so, I think there's a point at which we can now begin to label certain elements of masculinity problematic, 
and we mm-hmm. can call them toxic in ways that we couldn't before. Yeah. There's a, a I've never actually seen this show, but there's a podcast um, I like it a lot called uh, Why Theory. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you were looking for Lacanian podcasts, okay, <laughs> it's uh, they were talking about Mad Men and how. Uh, I don't know if you've seen that show, Mad well, Men. Well, the advertising agency back in the 50s, yeah. 60s, maybe. And how, like, you know, like, uh, they, they're talking about there's a scene, I didn't see it, but where they're, he and his family are picnicking. And he gets up, and he just takes his pic, the, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, plate? No, the, 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 the thing he laid the out. tablecloth. Tablecloth. Yes, okay, well, they yeah. were lay, But it wasn't table, they were laying on the ground. I okay. think it maybe it was a tablecloth. He just wraps it up and then goes into the woods and throws all the trash. Okay. Because that was a common thing for people to That's do. what people did. <laughs> you know? You yeah, know just put it in the dump or just put it out and no one will see and it. And they're you know, they ride in the car, everybody's the window, the, right? the, yeah, both yeah. he and his wife are smoking and the kids are in the back and the windows are rolled up. Oh yeah. And nobody that, knows uh, all these sort of things. So as culture shifts, I think now we can begin to label things a prop there are problematic areas of masculinity that we can now begin to think about. It, we may go overboard sometimes and over label those things. Maybe Johnny Depp is a victim of that. But there is something good, I think, in the in the fact that I think the world that my kid in, inherits, at least in this sense, he has the ability to express himself and own parts of himself that he couldn't before. Right. There ain't nothing wrong with that. No, it's a, a little a little more freedom, uh, 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 and and the restrictions are, and we're defining things, mm-hmm. and the idea of cancel culture. Wow, mm-hmm. that's that was a that was a great topic. I know I'm glad we talked about it, but it seems like there's some real problems there when you happen now to find someone's opinion you don't like mm-hmm. and, and you how do you and find all the your balance? group uh, tries to take them out i mean what's how do we create that? a space where where that um uh I, if my kid were to see david byrne and david lee roth i don't think he would feel anywhere near the tension that I might have felt at that time. Mm-hmm. I think he now mm-hmm. has the option of thinking about himself slightly differently, and that's a good thing. It's certainly possible that, though, there's still room for David Lee Roth in that equation. Sure. There's still room for all sorts of visions of masculinity. Yeah, masculinity is not necessarily bad. Right? Okay. Let's and and maybe there, there are, there's a way to be able to, like you said with the cancel culture stuff, to be able to create a space where there can be different ideas and whatnot without them, you know, like... Um, uh, we didn't talk about this in the cancel culture thing, but it's re- related in a way. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, okay, do we do we allow a space for people who think Nazis are cool? Right. Because, you know, and who think that certain elements of masculinity that define role, gender roles, women stay at home, uh, women aren't a lot allowed to, to, you know, they have a minimal agency. Mm-hmm. Um, if all these things are, you know, if if it is... Do those folks have a place at the table? Do right. um, there's a pastor that um, I can't think of his name, but he has a church uh, and he has a fairly large YouTube following that uh, quotes Leviticus and thinks gay people should be killed and the government should be executing them. Right. He he has a fairly large following. Does do we cancel him, or do we create a space at the table and and tolerate him in a way? I don't know. Well, it it does seem like we've got a long way to go uh, as a as a culture, as a society, as uh, people on planet Earth. Uh, we're but we're learning about these things and mm-hmm. we're trying to make. I sense do of think it. though that um, we probably should um, volunteer involuntarily sterilize everybody who goes to a kid rock concert. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, kid rock seems to be your nemesis or something. I don't know why. We're going to have to talk about it. Well, see, that just canceled, quote, uh, the uh, what we've been talking about here and reinforced the bad idea of that. But, yeah, should they have a voice at the table? Well, um, Maybe they yeah. have a, a I mean, voice at the kitty table. It, it's, it's like freedom of speech. I mean, it's all those sort of basic concepts that we have in our society that uh, if you open it up for one... Well, what about this guy, though? All, and, if, uh, if he has a following... Everybody counts, as someone said. Or no one counts, I think, is the phrase. But if this guy has a following who wants gay people executed by the, by the state, um, what if his speech gets a couple of folks really angry and upset and they go shoot up another gay club and yeah. they say hey this yeah. is so th- th- there's there's some there's some necessary tension around this well and, it's, a, it's realistic as well 
Um, and I know if we go a little further in this conversation and, and you're going to say something to the effect of, um, I know we're not supposed to talk about politics. And then <laughs> it opens up. So uh, hopefully we can uh, refrain from that in this time. But so Dog if, whistles. If we give, <laughs> all right, that's all. But if we give, um, yeah, so everyone counts or no one counts. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have to open it up. We have to have a sense of tolerance about that and understanding. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think? Is that, will that kind of thing self-correct over time? Uh, like your son different from you as you mm -hmm. were coming up? And the well, it's funny because I've been, I've been, kind of move. I've been reading um, uh, the, the Zizek guy. He's got a new book out. Oh, really? He's got a new book out. I've been reading can, it. Is it, can we... Can we read that? I mean, is it possible for the it's normal human one. being to read? <laughs> this one's this one's I'm chewy. Little, I want to go there, but I, I, mean, I haven't said. gotten through the first paragraph. Uh, don't it's understand. It's chewy. What happened. It really is. It, there's some things on there, but um, you know, uh, I, I think he would have a criticism of this notion of progress. That um, that, and he would. He's a real critic of Pinker, for instance. Oh, really? Okay. That um, I need that. That's that, coming up on a, another podcast. And it's a pink, talk about the latest book. That uh, this notion of progressive enlightenment, he would say, you have to be careful because this could be an ideological um, uh, cover up for something that we're not seeing, and that there is that any time that we get tricked into thinking that we have some handle on the narrative, that there's something we've repressed, there's something missing. That will find its way. That will, you know. So, so I think that um, there is um, saying that it's getting better. That I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with that per se, mm -hmm. but to be able to understand that, um, um, to to in any way kid ourselves that this isn't a continual process, a continual dialectic and movement that doesn't have an end. Maybe that's what he might say. Right. But we have to be careful that you know that. Um, um, uh, not to talk about politics, but uh, you know, uh, I, those on the know, left. I'm sorry, I just <laughs> predicted that coming up. So uh, one point for me over here. <laughs> All right, go but ahead. <laughs> the idea that, like, you know, the role of of uh, Zizek's criticism of of the American left is the goal is to impeach Trump or get rid of him. Right. And um, that's not to in any way address the reason he's there. Exactly. The, the, yeah. The <laughs> or, underlying issue or it's not like, you know, and so there there out. is there's the problem of, you know, why is he there? What does it mean? What not to you know, not to be troubled enough to be you can be lured away from by his outrageous tweets and what appear to be just, you know, uncivilized behavior on lots of levels. Um without thinking about what he means and mm -hmm. that, that that i think is 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 the difficult if if we are tricked into thinking that it is first off if we if we were tricked into thinking that somehow things are getting better and there's this progress that's moving uh, inevitably forward he's already a uh, a problem cuz that, I mean, that's, not, I'm that's, not sure if that's progress. That's, yes, that's questionable about that. <laughs> that's uh, not, not so many levels. But well, Pinker Pinker makes that argument in his uh, Better Angels books, but also his Enlightenment Now, the newest, the latest mm. book by him, and the charts and the mm. science that say, mm. hey, we've had less less violence mm. and so forth. But um, it's a complicated question, mm. so mm. it can't be answered just like this is getting better. And yeah, I, I think I'm going to write a, a, sli a, a slightly more. A cynical and um, um, dark take on this whole thing, and the title of my book is called "Do Not Resuscitate." <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I look forward to reading that. <laughs> I'm not sure, but uh, that's that's kind of interesting. So, this idea of um, toxic masculinity—I mean, how prevalent is it? Is it is, this is this is a small number of people who are there and. Or is it the cancel culture sort of pointing to it and well, blowing a, it about it? There's a higher number of uh, folks like? with toxic masculine traits at Kid Rock concerts. <laughs> okay. All right. but, uh, Here we go. <laughs> no, but, I mean, how big of a problem is this? Um, well, I, I, I would uh, like to, if, if it were up to me, what I would keep is, as you know, I'm a, as a psychologist, I would keep the elements of it um, that let's say that what is toxically masculine are the things that gender us in a damaging way. 
And we can all agree that the notion that boys don't cry is a toxic masculine trope. Right. And it is not good. It leads to all sorts of things. So maybe what we can say is that it is prevalent that all of us, to a degree, are uh, wounded in our gendering. The minute we accept and to begin to move in culture within a certain uh, gendered parameter, there are things that are done to us that are potentially toxic. Sure. And I think that is still maybe less prevalent in some ways, but still prevalent, right. and that we need right. to address that. That. Yeah, that I guess our politics and our culture has really brought that out. And I'm yeah. talking about civil war and things like that. I mean, come on, are we really yeah, going yeah. backwards? Have we lost that uh, control of these kind of things? The idea that anybody would so, take a bullet for Trump, I find uh, remarkable. But that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's just you know, <laughs> to each his own. Or well, as my as, as my son would say, you do you. <laughs> you do you. I yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah that's uh, that's pr pretty straightforward there. Uh, maybe there's a message in there for you. I'm not sure what he's talking about. <laughs> I think he's talking directly to you he now could, that could. I think about it. So. We do have this co constant conflict over music because he says he hates music. Oh and wait, it, now that's that. You know, I, I can tell you right now what he's doing with that. But uh, <laughs> right, right. maybe I should share. Maybe I should share this. He's ready. He's My defining. What, what do you think he's doing? What do you think he's doing with it? I think he's rattling your chains over there, and uh, he wants a response. This is a way to engage you into the conversation, and uh, you are an easy mark. So I'm thinking he's pulling you in every he time. Yes. Here we go. He I mean, it's a way to both engage but also define himself. Like, like I, I think he, you know, like one of the reasons why I think that um, I, dis I don't dislike it so much anymore, but I just loathed football was right. because my father liked it. Okay. And I think that right, there, there was, we go. That was, that was I think, that's what I was thinking. There had to be some way, right? So it's uh, it's to engage, here. but also to, to, to you know, okay, look, I am I know you like this, and it's really important to you. But for me to be me, I'm gonna be the opposite. I, I got to get out of your shadow somehow, so I'm going this way. There you so, go. You know. So. Yeah, I, I mean that's uh, the way the world works. That's father sons, uh, which might be a good show at some point. Maybe we need to bring that in. Although I think we've been doing that lately. Yeah, now you bring my kid in here, see what happens. <laughs> Oh, See, really? Like, okay, yeah. yeah. Well, first of all, um, you may be on your way out if we bring him in. Okay, <laughs> Actually, so this might Remember not... in the old days when we were over at, uh, at the college? Right. Uh, he, was, he showed up a couple times. Uh, he, he did. <laughs> now, I, I, was, I kept wondering about him because, um, you know, he's got, he had his iPad and he's, everything's going on around him, a lot of things moving, and, and uh, he's kind of calm over there. And I'm thinking, <laughs> wow, he's absorbing this. What's he going to yeah, do with it? Saying, what, you know, what's going to happen next? He but was, uh, he was taking it in. Yeah. So, yeah, well, I'd love to get him in uh, um, in the studio. That would be that would be fantastic. And um, it, he would uh, it, it would pro a short conversation with him um, would probably explain a lot of things could, about could, what we're having to put up with well, here. Well, it's interesting in because when my as my friends, their sons, we have we have several friends whose son are the same age. As I watch their son's age, I begin to understand their dads better. Like I begin to see. Right. Like, like, yeah. th they are an unadulterated version or versions of their dad are suddenly presented to you, and so you can literally see the developmental um, uh, concerns that their fathers had to navigate. And I can see it. I'm like, wow. And I'm sure right. you see the same with my son. Like, you could see, you know, how I, I would, I would imagine that, you know, that. I, my, I, if you saw it, you probably could say, "Okay, I can understand where, right, what, right. where, why, why this Dan guy is the way he is." It well, that's yeah, that's, that, that's, yeah. Uh, that's, pro that's interesting that you can sort of see, uh, you can see the father through the son, and mm -hmm. uh, just uh, that connection. Um, on the other hand, though, I, we'll I, say that my son looks a lot more like the, uh, the guy who uh, does our yard. He looks like one of the yard guys. Yeah. Okay. I mean, like a dead ringer, so yeah, I don't know. I don't know either. Um, we'll have to find out. We'll have to investigate that a little. Or maybe we don't. We do not yeah. investigate that anymore because uh, that might get us into some kind of trouble here. And then we're doing marriage counseling afterwards. Yeah, so, yeah. no, we won't do it. Mm -hmm. All right, so final thoughts on this uh, this idea of to toxic masculinity. Mm -hmm. So are we saying to the, the masculine out there, tone it down, get in touch with your feelings? What are we, well, you, you, what's the I message think the way here? through this, the way through this is, is um, greater complexity. Anything that limits the scope of a system, I think, is potentially symptomatic. 
So the goal is subjective complexity. So the goal is, if I could go back in time and talk to my younger self when he was seeing the David Lee Roth and the David Byrne, to be able to say there are elements of you in both of these folks. I mean, David Roth, right. Roth is a right. funny guy, highly intelligent, sure. in some ways was a parody of the very things that you felt were oppressive. You know, mm -hmm. he's not. And if you look even closer, so the Marlboro Man, I, I don't know the Marlboro Man, but um, his equivalent would be Clint Eastwood or John Wayne. And, uh, you know, Eastwood's a, is a director capable of um, some very sophisticated understanding of himself and the world complexity. Mm -hmm. So I think the goal would be is it's 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 OK to label something as p potentially problematic. And that is a sign that you then need to engage with it. Right. That's when the dance begins. So it's not a matter of canceling or cutting away, but engage. What does it mean to be this? Why would it? Why is it there? How does it reflect parts of you? How might it inform you in some ways? Parts of it you might want to own. But I, I think the goal is. That's a great question. Yeah. You know, move toward complexity. A system should become richer. Um, the place at the table, as we have, you know non-binary, if we, we have uh, folks who identify as transgendered, it should make us m better, to better understand who and what we are as a culture, as individuals, we should, it, the, that complexity is coming. It is, it's like a tidal right. wave. Right. So I, I mean, we, we need to be able to own more and more of it. I like it. I, I, I mean, I like the idea that the, the recommendation is that first recognize that there is much more complexity in our relationships, as our, mm -hmm. with our inner selves, with other people, and all those things that, that uh, in, in our culture and our society, and we need to do something to better understand that. And those questions that you just um, ask, I, I'm wondering if people are there. And so I guess I'm. Uh, this is, brings out the pessimist a little bit. I'm generally optimist, uh, so to speak. But uh, people have to get educated. They have to have some insight. Mm -hmm. They have to start thinking about these tough questions that counter their beliefs mm -hmm. that they held on. And well, that, and that's, th those are the interesting, uh, I guess, challenges yeah. ahead. And I think that's why this 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 notion of of engagement that whatever destabilizes you is um, uh, in a cyclic sense you you can you can spit it out um, you can evacuate it into someone else and that's where that homosexual panic comes in or you can get better at your suffering you can dance and engage with the things that destabilize because they make you richer and um, I do think that there that is a hard road and a number of people, maybe even Johnny Depp, might get uh, trampled in the uh, process. But uh, yeah, was, we, we keep general. walking it. We, we keep walking it. Yeah, we keep walking, keep living life. All right. So um, enjoy it. Make sense out of it. Start mm -hmm. to think about um, mm -hmm. these tough questions and uh, ask yourself those tough questions and work through it. It may help out. You might be enlightened a little bit. Mm -hmm. Maybe in a, it's a better world. All right. So. All right, I like it so far. That was uh, that was good. I, I'm not sure exactly where we were going with toxic masculinity, but uh, I thought you would be talking about gonna, yourself a lot during this. Whole I'm going to go and get know. some smokeless tobacco. That's how I. I'm okay, gonna, you're going to start spitting. Okay, no, please. Um, we have a no smoking or spitting sign here in the studio, so uh, not not appreciated. All right, my friend, I'm glad to have you in the studio. Let's uh, let's stop there and we'll talk. Boom. way through this is, is um, greater complexity. Anything that limits the scope of a system, I think, is potentially symptomatic. So the goal is subjective complexity. So the goal is, if I could go back in time and talk to my younger self when he was seeing the David Lee Roth and the David Byrne, to be able to say there are elements of you in both of these folks. I mean, David Roth, right, Roth is a right. funny guy, highly intelligent, sure. in some ways was a parody of the very things that you felt were oppressive. You know, mm -hmm. he's not. And if you look even closer, so the Marlboro Man, I, I don't know the Marlboro Man, but um, his equivalent would be Clint Eastwood or John Wayne. And, uh, you know, 
Eastwood's a is a director capable of um, some very sophisticated understanding of himself and the world complexity. Mm-hmm. So I think the goal would be is it's 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 okay to label something as p- potentially problematic, and that is a sign that you then need to engage with it. Right. That's when the dance begins. So it's not a matter of canceling or cutting away, but engage. What does it mean to be this? Why would it? Why is it there? How does it reflect parts of you? How might it inform you in some ways? Parts of it you might want to own. But I, I think the goal is... Those are great questions. You know, move toward complexity. A system should become richer. Um, the place at the table, as we have, you know, non-binary, if we, as we have... Uh, folks who identify as transgendered, it should make us better to better understand who and what we are as a culture, as individuals. We should, it, the, that complexity is coming. It is, it's like a tidal right. wave. Right. So I, I mean, we, we need to be able to own more and more of it. I like it. I, I, I mean, I like the idea that the, the recommendation is that first recognize that the is much more complexity in our relationships, as our, mm-hmm. with our inner selves, with other people, and all those things that, that uh, in in our culture and our society, and we need to do something to better understand that. And those questions that you just um, ask, I, I'm wondering if people are there. And so I guess I'm. Uh, this is, brings out the pessimist a little bit. I'm generally optimist, uh, so to speak, but. Uh, People have to get educated. They have to have some insight. Mm-hmm. They have to start thinking about these tough questions that counter their beliefs mm-hmm. that they held on. Mm-hmm. And well, that, and that's, th- those are the interesting, uh, I guess, challenges yeah. ahead. And I think that's why this 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 notion of of engagement that whatever destabilizes you is, um, uh, in a cyclic sense, you you can you can spit it out. Um, you can evacuate it into someone else, and that's where that homosexual panic comes in. Or you can get better at your suffering. You can dance and engage with the things that destabilize because they make you richer. And um, I do think that there that is a hard road and a number of people, maybe even Johnny Depp, might get uh, trampled in the uh, process. But uh, yeah, we, we keep walking it. We, we keep walking it. Nothing like starting a podcast on Saturday morning. Dan, you're in the studio. What's going on, my friend? Well, I got a. Took gotta, four yeah, hours I'm, to park because there's like some sure. sort of battle of the marching bands outside. Yes, all right. We have a. a and this game and this chicken place today. next door. I don't know what it is with that thing, but there's like, it's got to be. It's it, it, it got to be violating some sort of code. There's 700 people in there. You know, they're all crammed into that thing eating eating their waffles yeah, and chicken. Got, there's not enough room in the place, and uh, they sell. Chicken biscuits. Where well, I come from, reason, you don't you don't they're... combine waffles and chicken. Where I'm, you might feed waffles to a chicken, but you don't combine those things. You don't you don't, you don't a... do that where you're from. All right, that's we'll right. Talk yeah, about that. Uh, I think you're <laughs> I... from here, right? Is that no, no, no. Saying? I'm from Tennessee. All right, so it's good to be in the studio, and I'd like to announce it. The producer's back on the scene. He's back from a retreat. We don't yes. we don't ask him about that. Hi guys. But uh, <laughs> so here we go. He's there, back. Yeah, as I was saying early. He's uh, not Dr. the sort Tom of guy Hatt. that I would think would retreat. This guy's a charge ahead kind of guy, you know. He like if a, there's, he's he he's charge ahead yeah, he ain't putting a reverse. He's going forward. This is the new millennium, Tom Hackett. 
it All is. Right. There we go. And there was the sound of the studio. And uh, we was, yeah. silence. That Every time you hear that silence. sound, uh, I don't know, when Android gets its wings. I don't know. It's something. <laughs> something. <laughs> Speaking of, right, I was thinking it. about going to see that, that Joker movie. You guys seen that, the Joker? Okay. You know, that thing has got extreme views on it. Yeah, everybody yeah, either yeah, hates no it or, I mean, like, loads it. So right. I'm going to go in thinking we'll see what happens, you I'm know. I'm going to be right in the middle you know? to go see that. But I, I, I hope, you know, hope there's a batarang. I'm just whatever. Anytime I go to see him, you know, I want to see a batarang. Well, let me let me just say this to you. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, Batman is not in this really? movie. Really? Yeah. So well, don't he get is. your hopes up. He is, well, but he isn't. Yes, and, that, but there well, are that's no better batarangs. explained. That's better. Well, explained. Here's what I'm going to do then. I'm going to stand up at some point and and, and I, I can make Batman with my fingers. You know, do one of them them uh, shadow things, and he's going to be there. So during key moments, I'm gonna <laughs> I'm going to introduce the Batman. That <laughs> he's going to the be movie. there, and everybody's going to like it. They're going to be like, okay. you know, <laughs> we, we may have to re we may have to review uh, that movie yeah. coming up. But it looks like it's a lot about a person disintegrating. It's a mental really? health. You know what movie. I call that? I call that a money. Day. I don't know if I need to see that. That's a that's a mirror. That's not a movie. What am I? I don't need that. You will find yourself in this movie. I am sure, my friend. So uh, I will. I will. Good luck to you. At least it's not three hours long. Thank goodness. Okay. So yeah, remember not. the last movie you tried to get me to watch. I, yeah, it was. I started it. Uh, I don't know. Three days ago. I'm still looking at it. It's so. good. It's good. Where you got to wear diapers when you see those sorts of movies. You can't. Well, you don't want to get up. You know, not always the thing I want to do for I mean, entertainment. To be honest, but, I saw it myself often anyway, so it could be a 20 minute movie. I'm still going to need yeah, diapers. Here we but go. too much information, <laughs> and we're going to move yeah. on to a topic. So, I asked you last time, I made the mistake of asking you what's on your mind and what's our topic, and you straightened me out on that. So, I want to make sure I, I, well, I got some my ideas. Correctly. Here's the thing we should talk about today, and there's it's a concept that you see, um, it, it, it is um, beginning to pop up a bit more, and it's this notion of it's called post-traumatic growth. Okay, wait. Post-traumatic stress. Mm -hmm. right? There's that, yeah. Uh, uh, well, you're saying... I call that my wedding night. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Did I? Sometimes I just set these things up, and I should uh -uh. know better because I've been around long enough. But I, I still make that same mistake every mm -hmm. time. Okay, but you're saying post-traumatic growth. 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 Right, that is the big mm -hmm. uh, issue you're talking about here. Well, it, 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 in one way, it reflects sort of a a uh, a change in the way we think about PTSD right. and trauma in general and also the way we think about growth i mean all of those things are are that there's a there's a shift in the zeitgeist about what we should shouldn't do and what not in the therapy and i have an example okay. which may be a bit of a stretch okay. i thought i'd bring it in i want to make sure you talk a little bit about uh, post traumatic stress and the definition of that for our well we'll our, do a little bit right. but i want to make we want to sure be able that we to get to that trauma right. we got to define trauma before okay. we can die what define so we, thank you but you guys you guys heard of uh, this guy with the name of nick cave ever heard of nick cave in the bad seeds okay he has a new album out called Ghostine. Well, about two years ago, his 12-year-old son was killed. Oh, it was oh. Um, pretty tragic. And so uh, this is his first album after his son's passing away. And um, in a way, it's him attempting to grapple with that loss. Right. Right? Right. And I recommend anybody go out and give it a listen. It is, um, it is phenomenal. But however, um, you know some albums are wonderful, but you're not sure you want to hear them more than once? Yes. So this could be that sort of album. Could be that. So yes. let me just say that you, you, the, your eyes will not be dry. And it's not like he ever directly addresses. He never mentions. There are all these, these sort of uh, f allusions to his son. Uh, um, a, a small white ghost dancing. He mentions that several times at the end of the world. Uh, and then one of the songs, he, the lyric is, um, um, I'm here where I am. And you are there where you are, um, and just moments like that, sort of, sort of, right. you know, give you a, an example of some of what goes on there. But I think that's an example of um, of the potential for doing something, of being forced to either grow or diminish in the face of some sort of traumatic event. And maybe that's what's asked of us in every moment of trauma. Maybe that's, a, we'll, that's a very interesting mm, concept. That mm. that moment. In there, when you're dealing with trauma, uh, you can go either way. You can, you know, you can make that move toward uh, depression and mm. you know uh, that path, or you can work your way through it. So There's a, one of my favorite uh, Dylan quotes. Uh, um, 
pass me the salt. No, that, that he's, I'm sure he said that a couple of times. Uh, yeah, but <laughs> one of my favorite Dylan quotes was... One of mine, was, too, by the way. Thank see, you. Uh, well, he said, the, the emptiness is endless, cold as the clay. You can always come back, but you can't come back all the way. So uh, okay. so yeah. we, when we talk about this notion of growth and diminishment, we may have to sort of... There's a caveat there that your uh, scar tissue may ensue. So, right, mm-hmm. right. Never fully recover from mm-hmm. those kinds of situations. Again, think about my wedding night. Yes, I'm sure. I know. It's uh, it's trauma for now for all of us. It's, <laughs> it's not, it used to well, just be for you. And, I, I've, and I've, wife, where do you see the but, video? That's all I got to say. <laughs> <laughs> really poor production on that. All right, no. But <laughs> So the idea then is growth after this stress, mm-hmm. when this moment of stress mm-hmm. happens. And how do you do that? How, do, how does one sort of... Mm-hmm. You know, grieve appropriately and then pull themselves back out and never fully, but pull themselves well, back but out. Maybe what we could do is we can sort of define the terms because, you know, I, I like a definition of trauma that comes from the psychoanalytic literature. And it's uh, that trauma is anything that arrives before you have a chance to create it. Right. So there is a way in which all perception is actually apperception. All perception is uh, we dance with the things that we encounter even at the most passive level, right? The light that's bouncing off the things in this room, we filter it out due to the limitations of what we're able to perceive in our sense organs. And so at the most passive level, there is a there is an, an active shaping of the world around us. And what happens when something arrives that we can't shape, that we're not prepared for, that the templates or the heuristics that we have in place to be able to allow us that sort of dance? What if it's too big for those? Boom, right. shatters. And we talk right. about how it, it shatters the texture of the reality we've constructed. So there are two things to think about. There is trauma and the idea that reality as we know it is is not a given. It's a constructed thing. Not only is it constructed, but it has to be maintained. Right. Uh-huh. So there is, there is an active need for generating the sort of homeostasis that gives us the possibility for a reality that we can exist in. So you're saying maintain the trauma in a, in a certain way. That you know, when we talk about post-traumatic stress, we talk about these ideas of re- reoccurring events that mm. trigger the trauma for mm. the person, and it's almost a maintenance. It does kind of continue over well, time. Well, an individual who is um, who has um, um, undigested trauma, because part of inherent in that definition of trauma is, at some point, the traumatic things we have to find a way to create. So often, something arrives, we can't create it. But later on, we have to. And part of what happens in flashbacks, part of what happens in, in, in being triggered is there is something that we've yet to be able to dance with in the right way to weave it into the reality that we're in. Uh, there's a, a par- They're not the same, but there's a parallel between dissociation and flashbacks and psychosis. Hmm. They're both a nervous system attempting to be able to make the best of a bad job, to do, do something with, what, with something that's occurred. Hmm. Okay. And part of what happens in therapy with folks with, with trauma is, uh, you know, there's a saying that you got to name it to tame it. You have to be able to begin to trace the outlines of the trauma that you've had and to be able to do something with it. Hmm. There's a, a friend of mine who's a really good clinician was talking about this in a talk we were having a couple of days ago. And the idea that it is, it is fingering the wound that... Um, there is something about the sense that we have to make a sense that before uh, that there is there is the cut, and then there is the suturing, but there may need to be something in the middle in between. And with a trauma, often there isn't even a suturing. There's simply a cut, and there's the potential for either some sort of um, pretty heavy scar tissue or the fact that it's something that continues to bleed. And, but the uh, the thing in between may have to happen before you can begin to do the the, the suturing part. Wow. It does. It does sound like a lot of people have gone through traumas in their lives. I guess we all have, to a certain extent, uh, things that arrive before well, we th- created it. So, well, think about uh, if you auto rank with this notion of birth trauma, and that um, that we are initiated into some that there some sort of trauma has to occur for us to be able to uh, to to leave the womb, and then um, then we can take it a step further with Freud. And Freud thought that. Um, that desire is triggered by trauma and that, um, you know, when we're in the womb, we don't have to worry about hunger or maintaining um, uh, warmth. Um, Most of our basic physiological functions are being taken care of as we're, you know, floating in the amniotic sac. 
when that's burst and we suddenly come into a world where um, he talks a lot about that the breast never arrives quite on time that and he imagined that um, sort of placing himself in the in the uh, in the place of a baby that what um, what sort of horrible thing to suddenly feel hunger for the first time to feel that there's something in your core something with teeth arising inside of you and what do you do mm-hmm. how does a mm-hmm. how does a newborn infant how does it name this state that it suddenly feels for the first time and then to suddenly feel dependent on something to arrive to be able to um to 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 to, to put this to rest and so for freud that's the literally the birth of birth of thought the first thought is a way to be able to deal with the delayed breast then it's and um, if you fast forward to contern- contemporary sort of um, neuropsychological models, um, thought is a way to generate homeostasis. Whenever there is hunger, or any sort of desire, or drive, whatnot, we have to think. And our thoughts and then the subsequent act- actions allow us some way to maintain that equilibrium. Trauma is something that arrives, it boom, generates a disequilibrium. And it remains with us because um, until it is processed, we are sort of, uh, it, we are stuck with it. Right. And that's the very beginning then at that <clears throat> point, uh, mm-hmm. as you uh, talked about at birth. So then there's the rest of life that mm-hmm. these traumas are continually kind of mm-hmm. coming up for us to deal with. And then there are the major traumas that really shake the system like nothing else. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. you have to be able to, to manage that somehow, you have to deal with it. Well, I do, uh, in my private practice, I do a lot of work with soldiers. Certainly, well, I was doing a lot of work with soldiers after um, the Iraq War and, and and whatnot, and so they would often be deployed and they'd come back, and they would have a host. You know, there's, there is um, physical trauma, emotional trauma. Even There's even a concept called moral injury that, um, that uh, um, uh, the idea that... Uh, the way you think about the world, you uh, as as a as an adolescent, most of these individuals join the military around that time, with this this sort of patriotic notion of love of country, and that you know there's such a thing as justice and this and this and this, and suddenly to be in a situation that's far more morally ambiguous, and that in of itself generates a trauma. So they're physical, emotional, moral traumas. There's yeah. a host. This is this is like a continual thing. It's, mm-hmm. this is life is trauma. Mm. I don't know. Just said well, that, but th- that, that's where that sure notion of post-traumatic like growth comes from. You know, we've talked in here a lot before about the different difference between accommodation and assimilation, and that that often the we have to have the maps we have of our world have to be torn in some way for us to grow. If not, we're sort of stuck with them. We sort of are right. trapped with this way of thinking about the world and being in the world, and it may require something to cut us. You know, mm-hmm. so maybe. Uh, uh, all trauma, all growth requires at least a minimal amount of trauma, major trauma. Maybe that's a different thing. And I always have this, mm-hmm. like, uh, when I think of, when I talk about this in, in teaching and whatnot, I always think of a continuum of trauma. Right. And think about, the, like, the most, um, um, from the most sort of minimal to the most major. You know, major ones we know, that's, you know, that, that can be sexual trauma, that can be physical uh, assault, these sorts of things, um, um, uh, lots of things can generate this, but let's move the scale back to its most minimal. And um, you, 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 you got like the kids, right? Kids? Yes. Okay, yes. kids. Yeah, yeah. They're they're much bigger now. They're well, my sides are taller. <laughs> that's a major trauma. They were minor trauma when they were smaller. But yeah, no, yeah, that, <laughs> I'm totally on board with the. <laughs> but uh, but that, that's a lifelong trauma. It does seem. And I ever can had? Give you ideas did about. they ever play with them Legos? Yes, of course. Okay, so have you ever stepped on one? Yes. Okay, so I have sort of a scale for this. Like, there's something about waking up in the morning, going downstairs to pour yourself a bowl of like I don't know. I, I like them Kashi cereals. Ever eat them Kashi cereals? They're good for you. Uh, I, I'm put some Count soy milk. Chocula, I think we brought up before on this. You put some of... soy milk in your Kashi cereal, you know, and by, by basically all Kashi cereals. Somebody got the bright idea to go out and like take some bark off a tree and there's a couple some, of twigs. There, yeah, there's some put it in a box and some other things there. Yeah, <laughs> you, just, they, you put your soy milk in, some, you know. Some people. Okay, so yeah. uh, so if you start your day like that, then it, it's uh, it's all up uphill from then. You know what I'm saying? Like, yes. have your breakfast yes. be horrible. Okay, you're so saying from that's now, trauma. That breakfast set, sounds like a lot of trauma. That, that's some trauma. Okay, so but you're walking okay. downstairs to pour your kashi milk. You step on the uh, the um, the Lego. Boom, oh, yeah. hurts, right? Oh, the, yes. That's a 
minimal example of something arrives before you have a chance to create it. And okay. it, even though it may not, quote, sh sh shred your reality, I'm trying not to say P words, shred, is S words work? Uh, today. <laughs> okay. Shred your reality. And so when that happens... Th <laughs> we'll have to come back to that reference. No one knows what you were just said, but... Yeah, it's, okay, it's, go ahead. it's, it's yeah. an in-joke. Yeah, S words are... Yeah, it's okay, okay, S words, okay. So... So when that happens, what is demanded of you? For a brief moment, there's this, there is this, um, your nervous system is in a state of disequilibrium. Yes. Pain shoots up, right? right? You got that pain. So suddenly you go outside your euthymic window, and you're in this place of, like, of, of tension and yes. demand of some sort of yes. discharge. Now, mm -hmm. most of us in that moment, we step on that Lego. What do we do? We make a noise. We scream. We might we say go, a curse word. We say a curse word. We do right. lots of things. And yes. like what? That's, you know, that's what most people do, right? Right. Sure. Like, yeah. Okay, okay. so that, we'll that is a that. discharge of said tension, right? And so then you go about your day. Right? But what if in that moment, so th this is the minimal example of potential post-traumatic growth. What okay. if in that moment there's you, you do something else with it? Instead of just simply discharging it, what if you were to say, okay, this is the upteenth time I've stepped on a Lego I've, this is a 17th Lego. Maybe um, I need to talk to my son about generating, you know, helping him develop responsibility. Think about, you know, I mean, he's, he's already 32. He shouldn't be leaving these <laughs> things laying around here. That's, that's, you know? the, uh, that's an issue. No. <laughs> that is. But, yeah, so you're going to talk to him about, hey, can you put those Legos back in the box? Right. So, <laughs> so we talk about post. So there is the potential for, as opposed to simply discharging the tension, there's the possibility of opening up a thought and a, and a feeling in between the experience and the discharge. And therein lies the potential for growth, right? Okay. So anything that okay. happens to us, it's like a letter that we've received in the mail. If you most of the time we simply throw it in the junk bunk, junk pile and throw yeah. it away. Yeah, sure. What if we open it? Oh, and then we do go. something with it, right? We have Boom. an offer for you kind right. of thing. Yeah. And then it's there. junk mail and the next thing you know you got a time chair and you're, <laughs> and exactly. you're hanging you're out in Opelika. the time chair <laughs> then you got to go down a long list of things yeah. there that uh, By the way, I bought an I bought a time share for Opelika. You know, <laughs> come on. I mean, what like the? you know, get. To, <laughs> you, we should have consulted with some people before uh, that, yeah, but uh, didn't. I'm sure they're fine. We don't want to well, take you know, anything away from. They got, they got, Opelika. they got some chicken and waffles. At, uh, okay. Actually, they don't even have chicken and waffles in Opelika. Uh, yeah. Don't? Well, so you're saying that the trauma <laughs> happens. We have that immediate reaction, but mm. listen, we had that opportunity right after that. Mm. Right? Well, th th there's actually an experience that, um, and this would be the goal of sort of a psychoanalytic way of thinking about things. Sure. Opening up a space so that one has a chance to be able to generate a curiosity a curiosity about the things that you experience. Right. A minimal amount of self-reflective function to be able to dance for at least a moment with a thing that you're experiencing and to open the letter and to have some potential appreciation for why this happened, what happened, and then the possibility of doing something with it, i.e. growing from it, right? Okay. Wow, this okay. happens. So the, the the idea is that we're going to take that trauma and mm -hmm. we're going to work on it to get us to a better it place. Could, it could do something. And in this case, right. if this is okay, the 17th it. time you stepped on a Lego, yes, then you, there's the potential. Got to do something with this. What do we got to do? You know? Yeah. And since infanticide is frowned on. Am I right? I think I mean, it is more than that. Yes. It's, it's <laughs> yes. slightly but frowned on. You can't have that thought. You yeah. just can't act on it. I think. You can't, that's you know, you may th to think that. to yourself, you know, be still small. The, I don't have to, the hole I have to dig is not going to be, you know. I'm going to try to it. bring this back real quick here and talk <laughs> do it about the opportunity. When he's taller and he's no, six see, feet, that's, that's a whole lot you bigger you hole you got to dig. Continue to go, and I'm trying to reel us back in. But you have to come up with some sort of solution. You have to come mm. up with some sort of response. Well, most of our solutions are you don't simply want to step discharge. For the 18th time. So, yeah. yeah. But most of us would simply discharge that. Or, and another solution would be it could be, you know, we just yell at the kid, you know, right. you little whatever, whatever, That's you know. That's right. That's right. That's probably one of the first things that happened, <laughs> uh, given, <laughs> given yeah, what we Yeah, why do you? But, uh, <laughs> but even that is not necessarily because, because part of our, our job, right, is, is to grow a responsible adult who will go out and make good choices and make the world a better place. We you wouldn't know, often I would, think. I would like to stop, pause just for a second and underline that thought. I'm not sure everybody's on board with that, but I really think it's a great It would be, yeah, be a good idea, just, yeah. Let's yeah. just try to get that 
to leave. Actually, that what out I've been there. doing is I've been just sort of I've, my kid just turned thirteen, so I've been I'm, I've been figuring out how much he costs me, oh, and so at some okay. point Don't I'm going to start turning numbers. a profit. No, no but at no. some point this is going to turn around and I'm going to start have, getting money. Do I have news for you? <laughs> my friend. Uh, yeah, uh, that's not going to happen. I'm thinking eighteen. Get older, the things cost more. <laughs> really? Because I'm thinking like and the the house, Oh, you no, got to no, pay up and put down a. You know, that's <laughs> what it is. Okay, well he's getting a he's getting a pogo stick. That's what he's getting. You know, that's all that's <laughs> you can you can bounce to work. Yeah. But um But yeah, so we we do something with it and, we, and it'll help us grow. And does it help us um perhaps in the next time? Because we so we start using these um events that occur before we create them. Uh we're reacting, then we're looking for some a moment of growth in there mm -hmm. what we could do, make a decision, be in the moment. Is that helping us with the next trauma? If well, we're not sure when that's going to happen and what happens when you, with that. When so. you're able to take that that stepping on the Lego and you're able to process yourself, it becomes a way for you to grow, for the, your son, whoever the case may be. It, 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 there is the potential for a, a broadening, a, a, a deepening, and um, that's and part of the reason I use this as an example is it, it, that's difficult. Most of us step on the Lego and scream and then yell right. at our kid. Right, sure. And that's it. That's on the f the lowest. That that's on the smallest part of the continuum. It's 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 here. As sure. we begin to move up, it becomes more difficult, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I think of like, and I, I may be wrong in sort of placing this in the middle, but I think um, if the Lego is 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 on on this end, maybe yeah. in the middle, heartbreak. Okay. Maybe that's maybe that is sort of uh, the next level of trauma. And what do we do with it? You know. Okay. Uh, you're, uh, you know, you, you've been, okay, you, you, you know, if you've been, I don't know where, we're, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're, you, about, you, you, you're you, about to invent, uh, this, well, it's this funny. event. funny. Normally when I pause, through, but here's I'm, what's I'm happening. Here's what I, okay. I'm editing because I'm like, I can't say that. Yes. I'm like, well, so it's there's, about time. There, no, no, trust it, me. There are a lot no, of things no, I don't no, say. No. <laughs> I'm like, it was funny, but that's really inappropriate. Please start the editing and move, we'll move forward with that. It was funny, but it was wildly inappropriate. Yes. Yes. Okay. So far we haven't seen censored you too much but uh it's okay it's just, you know, i can't i can't I'm, go I'm that good. way I, i've also with these kind of long-ended things i lose the uh the thought the thing <laughs> the moment that we were talking about what was yeah, the well, topic again so i think it was you know it's okay. it's, uh, it's about uh theremins we're talking about theremins no but, that, um, that was before the con the, the start all right uh, so heartbreak in the middle boom right yes, okay that's where we are. so think about it so in some ways a breakup is a little like stepping on a really large Le a Lego. It's yeah. a, like a Lego that you step on and then gets a large that's lodged in your chest cavity, right? right. <laughs> okay. But you know, but no, we, we, were, we were talking about Nick Cave. Uh, there's the yeah. way in which the ability to be able to finger that wound, the ability to be able to stay in that space, generates art, right? Think right. of all the great right. songs sure. that have come Absolutely. out of heartbreak, right? Makes sense. It um, does make sense. And, and every ACDC song I can think of. Um, I'm I wasn't going there, but uh, <laughs> it's not no, really. But, but I, I see what you're saying. So some some would use art as a way of getting to that growth that you're talking mm -hmm. about. Post Maybe it's it's it, it, so it, 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 um, releasing understanding. It's still a form growing. of discharge, but it's discharge in a way that may um, that may um, uh, as the Lacanians say it it in, it in increases the texture of the symbolic order, right? It grows culture. It, it okay. all of us have to right. swim in culture and the symbolic and with words and whatnot. And any time a really good artist, even a so-so artist, when they create something, that grows. the The ocean of culture that we swim in expands, right? I like and it. so, um, yeah, I like and and we are all the better for it, right? Even if you never have never heard that song before, it enters someone else's ears. And their movement within this symbolic cultural structure, you get the ripples from it, right? Sure. So it goes, Poof. Sure. That, that's a. Uh, yeah, and for and for the artists themselves, what uh, it's some relief? It's it's some, could be you yeah. know, uh, some way to kind of help heal the wound and uh, mm -hmm. understand it better and do something mm -hmm. about it. Do something. Though, about if you've it. ever uh, ever listened to that band, ever that band called the Cure. Yeah. You know, if you notice it, not happy stuff, right? No. Tends to be a little, uh, so, you know, it's not a, it's not bouncy. It's not, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. We, uh, yeah. I don't know if it's, uh, what, whatever happened to the happy 
Happy Go Lucky song uh, that no we're we're working through our trauma. No, we'll say there there stuff. is a there is a Happy Cure song. Friday I'm in love. Ever heard that Cure song? No. Okay, not a not a huge not a huge Cure fan. No, so no, that's not, not that I much. I think no, so. No. Sorry, they, uh, sorry that, that reference is. Uh, we we could pull uh, our ex- executive producer in. Maybe he would know. Uh, but uh, I'm not. I'm not so sure that. Not really. They right, said. Well, well, go ahead with your point, though. <laughs> My point is, like is that, that, that there is something about some art that um, that it, it creates a space for us all to suffer together. Okay. When I think of like you know like sad songs. Sure. You know, and, and we've talked about this before. This notion of the euthymic window. Um, the window has a, a an upper level and a bottom level, and there's something about staying within that. Sadness, sad movies, sad songs. It pulls us right. just at the bottom of that euthymic window, you know, so we're able to experience it. But again, things grow. And so I think in some ways, yeah. those are all the trauma grew. The, am I wrong? Would I be safe to say? Is there ever been a song that was written that didn't have some sort of trauma as a kernel? Maybe, you know, a little like, a, like the irritant that forms the pearl in an oyster. Am I wrong? Um, uh, th- we're gonna have to think on this one uh, mm. just a little while to just to see. Maybe some pop song that, uh, that from the monkeys or something. Uh, I know, maybe well, not. I don't ne- know. Neil uh, Diamond some, wrote some, some of the best song. monkey tunes. You know. Um, yeah, that's true. So uh, he had his share of, uh, so I didn't even at least a couple. Uh, I think even there, like like for instance, if um, if there's a need to create a fake sun, it's because the real one's missing. So even I think the happiest songs are probably some attempt to keep something at bay, right? right. To walk into okay. a dark room and turn a light on. That's what there the song go. is. Yeah, and and <clears> also <throat> the the I I think I was just thinking about movies do the same thing. You know, they have that mm-hmm. moment of tension and they're working through a plot point and mm-hmm. everything looks uh, terrible and then they come out. And of course, a lot of the movies we see, maybe the it's changing a little bit now, but a lot of the movies from the past. Ends in this wonderful, happy, right off right. into the sun, and that's it. It's right? the euthymic window. Uh, well, we call those um, they call the uh, um, vitality states. That's what uh, they're often referred to. So a movie has really, real excitement, and almost gets you to the point of anxiety, and then it moves you down for a while, and then it may get sad, and then more excitement. So it literally finds a way to sort of play your emotions. Right. Well, we may have to go back, and we may have to look at. Uh, this movie that's out now called The Joker. And we the Joker. about that. That you know, sounds I, like we're on the downhill slide. Well, uh, you, right haven't, you haven't seen it yet. With no happy moments. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe. So I haven't seen it. But that, so maybe that's something it. we talk about next. But maybe we can, maybe you'll have a chance yeah, to maybe, watch it. Uh, yeah, maybe you can <clears> find the, um, you know, the moment in there where it's uh, it's uplifting and mm-hmm. uh, there's a battering. Before then it goes downhill. It sounds like a deterioration into mental illness. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, that's without having seen. You can do that on the internet. You can talk about things you've never seen, and it's accepted. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have no expertise in. As a matter mm-hmm. of fact, I think Tom uh, and on talk with Mike and Tom, we said that last week. You talked about what? There's no, talk about no. things you have no expertise in. So, uh, like, uh, I don't know how that works, but anything, yeah. just yeah. about everything. Like, like I was, I, <clears throat> I was thinking about doing a series on sex therapy, sex tips. There you go. Sex tips. <laughs> All right. Here's here's one of All my right. <clears throat> here's here's, here's my th- this is my my best sex tip I ever came up with. Here it is. Okay. H- here, here's you, you want to have hot sex? Turn off the air conditioning. How about that? All right. All right. I, I was thinking <laughs> there was going in another direction, but thank you uh, for that. Uh, let's just leave it at that moment right there. Turn off the uh, AC. Turn off. <laughs> Wow. Well, you see, I was expecting some <laughs> sort of trauma there for a moment. I was prepared. Well, it's, I was prepared for the trauma. Trust but, me, uh, it's a, it is a trauma for my wife. But, um, <laughs> Go boom, boom. Okay, you so. know, if we get a trap set in here, we're going to have a guy in the corner. Uh, he's going to have the drum. Ta, 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 <laughs> boom. You know, but we we talked about that a lot. But, uh, okay, yeah, it's, it's, it, it would it'd, be it'd playing be a, a lot every day. It'd be a trap, all right. <laughs> but, okay, so we got the middle. We get to the, the far end. It becomes far more difficult when we talk about the, the, any sort of assault. Folks who survived, um, I was talking to somebody who had survived a hurricane, and they were talking about, you know, even, even, even with some idea of what they, they thought they knew what they could expect, yeah. but what arrived was, again, something they really hadn't, didn't have a chance to create. And so when we get to someone who's been mugged, someone who's experienced sexual trauma, all these are events that if we begin to talk about how to turn those or make those something, how do you finger a wound that's so big? 
you know, one that's open, one that, um, or in these cases, often, particularly when it comes to physical and sexual trauma, a wound that you can't get very close to. It, it is too big. Your, your nervous system automatically shuts it out. It automatically, we talk about that euthymic right. window, right. it narrows to a place to where you are only allowed the most minimal of affect up or down. And right. anytime you move outside of that, you break apart, wow. right? Yeah, that's pretty heavy. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea, too, that uh, traumas reoccur, mm -hmm. and, and in the, uh, in, certainly in the psychotherapy world, we see people mm -hmm. who are working through the issues of early childhood traumas or traumas. Yeah, cumulative, that there's this whole notion of complex cumulative trauma. And right, now, and the idea it has that a, there's, yeah. a, uh, there's this calendar, then that trauma's mm -hmm. coming back up on, because of this date, and it reoccurs, mm -hmm. and those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if it's... Um, where trauma occurs can be really important because um, um, our nervous system is in a different place, you know, between the age when we're born. And what is demanded as often is, is a more mature nervous system or a couple of nervous systems to be able to create a holding space where you can begin to do the growth you need to have. What if they're not there? What if something happens that's too big for that sort of nervous system? And then what happens, you find yourself sort of trapped in it. And it... Um, and um, you're, you, part of what a, you know, our, our, our body is supposed to do is it's supposed to learn pretty quickly what is, um, what is safe and what is not. And some of the messages that we learn very early like that, the whole world becomes some place, something with teeth, right? Right. Um, uh, it's a dangerous world out there, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you something that's uh, kind of on the topic a little bit, but... Because we, we talked about a lot of psychoanalytic is, issues and, and concepts and terms here. How about the unconscious? Are we working, if you're working through this trauma, there are certain psychotherapies out there that mm -hmm. was so, would really kind of stay in the conscious talk uh, uh, level or surface on that, if you will. But um, these traumas are so deep within us and they recur and they're, and they're so upsetting to the system. What's uh, what do you think about dealing with these traumas? How do you get at that unconscious trauma? Those ones that are just sort of out of our awareness. How would how would you? Well, here's the thing, if, and this this may be a little too technical, but technically, trauma can't be unconscious.